Uh, and now I will dive into the program and explain you how this uh, conference will work, what, what will be the structure. So uh, we will have uh, the morning session and the morning session will feature research. In the presentations, we will try to define the current situation of the modernism housing built after the World War II, the main challenges, opportunities, and the possible ways of approaching the topic. So we will have the presentations from Baltic states, Lithuania and Latvia, Ukraine, Italy, and two keynote, keynote lectures by the laureates of 2017 and 2019 European Prize for Contemporary Architecture, Mies van der Rohe Prize Award. In the afternoon session, we will present a good practice. So we will see great examples from Ireland, Finland, De uh, Denmark, Greece, Slovakia, and France. And a research article on the situation in Estonia will follow. Each presentation will last approximately 30 minutes. I will look at the watch, and if I see that there's a couple of minutes left, we could make some questions to the lecturer. And after the conference, the resume will be presented to the Madrid Forum as the part of the report on the affordable housing from the region too. And also the projects you will hear about will be presented in the exhibition that will be open on 16th of May, right before the Madrid Forum 2022 in Madrid. And all the research, the projects, and even more articles will be laid in a book. So we will announce about it at the beginning of summer. And if you miss some presentation or want to listen to it again, the record of the conference will be available at the Facebook page of Architects Association of Lithuania. So now we will start our presentation. So I will be the first lecturer. I can see that uh, we are a little bit late. So I will try to be uh, very quick with my presentation. Um, let me share my screen again with some different content. So I will talk to you uh, more or less about uh, how we are dealing with the housing renovation in Lithuania uh, regarding the housing that was built after the World War II. So here locally, we call it Soviet blocks. Uh, it's not applicable to all the Europe because in all the Europe, we have uh, similar projects, but they were not always, you know, built by Soviets. But in our part of, of Europe, they are called Soviet blocks. Uh, why we decided that this, this topic is important? Because of the uh, new European Bauhaus. Uh, the new European Bauhaus is interlinked with two other crucial programs of European Union, the Green Deal and the Renovation Wave. So naturally, when thinking about the improvement of the built stock and its more efficient, just and socially enhancing use, the housing topic comes to the front line. And quoting the uh, parliament member Marcos Rosenberg, the new European Bauhaus should not become an elitist project and end up with a nice exhibition or a book. It should bring some real tangible changes in the life of all the society. And also the new European Bauhaus initiative should correspond to the renovation of WAVE program and contribute to regeneration and improvement of real buildings and spaces. And finally, the motivation for the Architects Association in Lithuania to step into the new European Bauhaus program with this initiative lies in the statement that the new European Bauhaus, the renovation wave and the Green Deal emphasizes culture as a core and not only decorative force in the formation of the environment. So we are very happy to have our Baltic colleagues, Latvian and Estonian unions of architects to join us in our endeavor. So in Lithuania, we have several governmental renovation programs, but something is wrong with them. Those programs run for more than a decade, but the results are far from satisfactory. Apparently, the restitution of private property after 1991, because you know, in Soviet Union, there was no private property, so every housing belonged to the state after the, after the independence, everyone had got a right to buy some real estate. So after 1991, there was a solid foundation laid to many problems related with the transformations of modernist housing as every apartment now has its owner and every decision must be taken with a consensus. That is being said not only about the poor activity and interest by the inhabitants, but also about the content and scope of renovation. Until now, the renovation of modernist housing usually with some exceptions ends with insulation and energy efficiency. However, 
the European Bauhaus is based on three values, sustainability, aesthetics, and inclusivity. And the latter two are so far missing in our renovation endeavor. So the, mo the main problems that after the renovation, the houses and the whole uh, micro rayons, so-called districts, lose their architectural identity. No added value to the individual flats nor public spaces is being created and nor the communities, nor culture of living together are improved. Can we do it better? What's the idea of holistic renovation? So with this initiative, we are trying to rise a movement to create a model methodology and probably to implement a pilot project of something more with improvement of each flat, common indoor and outdoor spaces, at the same time, keeping the visual quality and architectural unity of the whole quarter. And of course, the renovation process should include the inhabitants. Additionally, we search for chances for new financial and legal tools that will allow participation of different stakeholders in renovation. And also, we feel that although this housing stock is quite old, it's already 50 years old, we think that it's a perfect ground for technological innovations to apply. So this initiative aims to gather an interdisciplinary think tank, as Angela mentioned, to create a methodology and toolkit for a holistic renovation and to test it in a pilot project. What we've done so far in Lithuania. Last year in 2021, with partnership of the Ministry of Environment and the Ministry of Culture of Lithuania, the Architects Association of Lithuania had organized two discussions and a workshop with more than 60 participants. The discussion was moderated by me and aiming to highlight the multifaceted nature of the topic and to gather a variety of ideas and interdisciplinary panel was selected, featuring architects, historians, designers, geographers, city planners, activists, politicians, lawyers, construction materi materials producers, communities representatives, writers, designers, and representatives from relevant institutions such as universities, ministries, heritage protection department, Vilnius mayor, etc. So we wanted everyone to get on board and to say what they think on the topic and what would be the main challenges in, in their field and what could be the opportunities. Uh, when we were aiming at the topic, a holistic renovation of modernism housing, uh, we saw that there are many different topics to address. Uh, so in the discussion, uh, some questions addressed by the panelists were, and among the others, artistic and historical value, identification of the artistic, historic, and cultural value of the housing built in Soviet period, second half of 20th century. How can we preserve those values during the renovation? Then uh, we were talking about the potential of urban architectural transformation. How can renovation improve private and common spaces inside and outside the building? Then we were talking about innovative, sustainable, and communal way of the life through design. How can we lead more sustainable and quality way of living in a renovated housing? That is not only to fix our environment, but also to change the way of living of the inhabitants. Also, we, are, we were analyzing how to empower the communities, how to create social justice, social heterogeneity, and accessibility how to engage inhabitants to ensure social equity, availability, accessibility, and social variety in renovated housing. Also, we were talking about sustainability, ecology, and nature. How can we implement innovative and sustainable technological solutions during renovation? And probably the most challenging is uh, the topic of new models of economy. How can we rise the financial value of the renovated housing? How can we attract private businesses into the process? And what are the new innovative models of renovation in terms of organizing and financing? So as you see, the topics are many, and I will just uh, describe you uh, more in brief one of them, uh, just to illustrate how those discussions in Lithuania are going. So I chose just the first topic, which is artistic uh, value of, of the uh, modernist housing. And uh, uh, we were talking about the biggest challenges. What are the biggest challenges relating, related with the housing built after the Second World War? So first is a negative image. Everyone thinks that these houses are dull, they are gray, they are not interesting, and uh, they are not attractive. Another problem is that we have no research on those housing and no data. So how can we plan any reconstruction or renovation if we don't have 
including drawings of those buildings, nor we have the evaluation of their physical state. Then we have a really bad physical condition of these housing. Although they are not that old, only 50 years old, but you have to have in mind that in Soviet times, they were built with a lack of technology skills. Uh, the construction technology was not the best. And also the construction materials were not the best quality. And another one important thing that, you know, in that system, people used to use uh, their position of being on site. So there was uh, a lot of theft. So it was, you know, the composition of, uh, of concrete was not always according to the standards. So right now those houses are really in bad physical condition. Uh, also, the, one of the challenges is that today some investors want to densify those quarters, but without seeing the whole. So we have new additions that disrupt architectural composition, visual relations and traditions of culture and common activities. For example, if we have one common courtyard, and you build some new addition inside that courtyard. So there's no more courtyard, no more traditional events uh, and, and no more traditional activities over there. Then we have a problem of insufficient expertise of planning specialists. So when we go to the municipality, there are no uh, competent people to talk about and, and no competent people that could be, you know, good, give you some really good advices about that and make some reasonable solutions. And there are no legal tools, no resource for making the overall urban vision for the whole micro -rayon. This is related with a legal system that every flat has its own owner. And the municipality has no money nor legal uh, tools to create some urban vision for the whole quarter. And the last one is the ideological conflict. Because it's very hard to convince people that the, the quality of life in such a district can be not worse than living in the old town. It can be as much attractive as, as it is uh, in the city center. Uh, then we were talking about the vision. How can we perceive the reconstruction of this uh, modernist housing? So at first we have to shift our mindset and to think that beautiful is not only about beauty. Beautiful is sustainable and functional. We cannot separate those three values. Then we have to strengthen the architectural identity of those districts. So it creates identification and love by inhabitants. And then we have to create a renovation vision that would suggest an attractive environment as, a, as an alternative to the charm of the old town and suburb. And here in my presentation, you can see the pictures that, that are pictures of some uh, districts that were built in 50s, 60s, and 70s in Lithuania. And this one in particular had one one of the highest urban and architectural prizes in Soviet Union those times. Uh, what are the tools to aim for that vision that we want? So we think that a holistic research should be implemented before innovation. And with holistic, we mean uh, technological, aesthetical. We have to analyze the cultural relationship. We have to talk with the community and so on. So this holistic research should be done before any project. Then uh, we propose that architectural competitions could be a tool to achieve the, the highest quality of the renovation. And of course, uh, any renovation should result with some added public functions because we feel that the problem of this housing is that people live like in match boxes and they don't meet. Uh, when these uh, kind of districts were built in Soviet times, you know, they were carrying the ideology that uh, you are living in your flat, but you know you are just sleeping and eating over there, but you meet in those public spaces, but nobody did that. So it was just a formalism that is not working today. Uh, regarding uh, the aesthetics and the architectural values of the of these districts, we thought that urban integrity is the priority. So we should start from the design from the whole to the detail. Start with the urban structure and then go to the windows and balconies. Uh, architectural morphotype is the most important regarding the renovation, so we should keep the original morphotype. Then a preserved system of public spaces should be uh, there in the renovation projects because public spaces sometimes they have really nice traditions of local communities and they are working, so we should keep them. And it's very important to balance public and private spaces. Uh, I mean, uh, in some courtyards, you have those small gated plots where only one family can use and no other 
So we should cr somehow create a balance between that. Architectural identity should be uh, designed through the details. Of course, we cannot preserve the whole image if we want a serious renovation of the building, but sometimes the details are the, the ones that create some uh, spiciness and, and taste of, of the architecture. Then inclusiveness and education of inhabitants is very important. Of course, demolition is the last choice. And I think that uh, the, the lecturers of today will also agree with that. And the, the last detail is uh, that we propose not making new posts inside the micro rayons inside those districts in order not to disrupt the original urban structure. And finally, our, uh, our idea for a pilot project, we suggested to take one of, of those uh, districts built in Soviet time, the one that I've mentioned before that won the, the prize, it's called Les Dine, it's located in Vilnius, and to implement those principles of holistic renovation in, in, in that pilot project that could be called a, a laboratory of holistic renovation. Of course, it's, it's you know, an, an utopian <laughs> solution because of the, of the private, uh, in a private property that we have. And also we propose some guidelines for the renovation, some general guidelines. So uh, a research, as I mentioned, that should be, uh, we should make a research on artistic historical value, expectations of the inhabitants, technical and economical potential. We should work on pilot projects that could be in situ participation and collaboration labs, sustainability, experimental solutions, and architectural experiments in real situation. Uh, then we suggest that our government should create a renovation competence center that would take care of communication, education, competence improvement for specialists, institutions, communities, inhabitants, and citizens. And then we suggest to do project mapping with scope, stakeholders, steps, and responsibilities. And of course, to find out new financial mechanisms. So uh, here I just uh, made a presentation of our uh, good intentions. So far, we don't have any pro pilot projects to show you, but I hope step-by-step step with, uh, with all those events that we have, international ones, sharing our experience among ourselves, you know, uh, rising up ideas. I think that in a couple, maybe not in couple, maybe in five years, we, we in Lithuania, we have to show you something maybe equally to what we have in Amsterdam or in, in Bordeaux. So now I will stop sharing my screen. Uh, thank you very much for-, for Thank you, Ruta. Uh, congratulations. It was an excellent presentation. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jose Luis. So I think that uh, we are a, a little bit late. So I will give a floor to a next speaker, which are two speakers. My colleagues from Latvia, Dagnia Smilga and Niklav Stegle from Ether Architects Office, and they will have their own presentation uh, and they will talk about situation in Latvia. So Dagnia, Niklav, the floor is yours and 30 minutes are yours as well. Go ahead. Um. So, uh, hello everyone. Um, thank you for having us. And uh, before we start, uh, perhaps it was not raised enough. Uh, clearly, um, we are totally, totally opposed to the um, war in Ukraine and we are doing everything we can uh, to support Ukraine. And we stand with Ukraine with um, uh, all possible tools that are in our disposal uh, but while we are doing that, uh, we are not uh, being paralyzed and we are carrying on also with our works. Uh, so I hope this is, this is clear. And I, I give the floor to, to Dagny now. Um, okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, now I'm not sure if you see me in the screen or you see the clubs. <laughs> is it? Uh, okay. Um, well, uh, so um, we will talk today um, about the research project called Riga X um, and focus on housing. Uh, Riga X is a unique and innovative research collaboration um, between think tank Certus, that are data analysts, so socio anthropologist Viestor Selminc, Bureau of Riga City Architect, and us, um, Ether Architects. Um, 
So our collective aim is to boost Riga's long-term long competitiveness and sustainability by developing an op optimistic, forward-looking, yet realistic vision for Riga's urban development over the next decade. So it's all about uh, trying to find the Riga uh, kind of strategy for Riga to become uh, a livable city. And in context of housing, uh, we believe that it's uh, more complex than just um, housing issues. Therefore, we are actually looking at, um, at measures in a greater context. And first part of our presentation will be on four economic drivers that we believe would, uh, you know, um, push uh, the city's uh, growth. Um, so they are culture, um, education, ICT sector, and housing. Um, so uh, here you can see in the slide, uh, the last 30 years, Riga actually has changed from a place to live towards a place to work. And um, uh, the inhabitants of the city, uh, the amount of inhabitants has uh, decreased. Um, and it's projected to be increasing, uh, decreasing. So for example, here in the context, you can see uh, Riga is decreasing, whereas uh, we always like to compare with uh, Tallinn and Vilnius, uh, they have a growing population in the capitals. And it's uh, actually the only um, capital in the Baltic Sea region that um, continues, uh, continuously faces population loss. And why so? During the last 20 years, more than a third of the inhabitants have left the city. Uh, so it's around 38.5 uh, thousand um, people, that is 34% of the inhabitants. And with the existing scenario, kind of the prediction is that um, in the next 10 years, um, 25,000 more would leave. And um, the other uh, interesting aspect is that 72% of Riga population lives in multi-story housing blocks, which are all like similar. In, in, um, and between 2000 and 2020, population in Riga suburbs has uh, grown 20%. So basically people from center is just continuously moving out to the suburbs. And uh, why, so basically, why so? Uh, life in suburbs offer larger living space center average, um, in the center average space is something like 56 square meter in suburbia 92. Um, they can have more green space, more safe environment, accessible primary education and social benefits that altogether gives a higher life quality. And compared to Riga, so does this really, um, uh, so basically when we compare with other European cities, um, uh, Copenhagen, Oslo and Vienna, uh, they are actually uh, not only livable, but uh, also compact. So what we're interested in looking at uh, Riga potentially as a compact city, because of course, as we know, as more compact you are, less um, uh, costs on infrastructure. So it, it basically we would need to reduce the costs on infrastructure expenditure. Um, and here you can see, for example, Oslo, how they do and achieve livable cities. Um, working with the waterfront, all these values of the key uh, of for livable city, Copenhagen uh, infrastructure, velo infrastructure, and so on, which is not only as a, treated as infrastructure, but as a great public space. And Vienna as an example for a great housing uh, with a good outdoor spaces. Um, and here's an overview of Riga where we analyzed uh, a kind of a population density uh, in 2019, where you can see the density is kind of a, a very scattered and the characteristics of today is that, um, the, as we, I mentioned before, the population is concentrated in, in multi-story housing blocks and the city center is empty. And you can see outside the multi-story blocks are higher bars in the, in the graphics. And uh, basically it's a kind of a shrinking city. A low density city, far distance to social services and high infrastructure costs per one square meter. Uh, this is what's generated in this um, uh, case. And uh, Riga X Vision uh, is talking about a compact livable city. 
and we identified uh, a space which is closed, uh, which is kind of around the Riga city center. You can see in the images, the yellow bars. And uh, this is kind of, in our opinion, the unused potential in the spatial structure of Riga. It's the railway belt and all the adjacent ter industrial territories. Um, where already now we could, by researching, we could see uh, the main developments already start to happen around this space. So basically it's a space next to the city center with the potential to be densified and um, uh, developed as mixed use neighborhoods. Uh, Riga X vision, uh, so compactness as a rec uh, precondition for livable, livable Riga. In these graphics, you can see the top one is a section, uh, kind of an abstract section of Riga, uh, how it's now, and you can see the yellow parts, the empty parts are the railway belt, and on the outskirts, the uh, uh, Soviet housing blocks, and in the city center, uh, uh, the, uh, and the city center is in the middle. Uh, so what we propose is that the big amount of the um, uh, housing uh, block inhabitants we could host also in the in the yellow part in the railway belt, which uh, out of an abstract uh, calculation, uh, 10, 10 uh, square meter uh, square kilometer territory with 200,000 inhabitants, eighty uh, thousand housing units. And that generates around uh, 200 people uh, per, uh, per hectare population density, which is similar to Vienna uh, city center. And uh, it's not that we are proposing to move the inhabitants entirely from, uh, from the outskirts to, uh, to the, uh, from the blocks to the center. However, um, due to the necessity of renovation of the housing blocks, people will need to go somewhere. And also because these housing blocks has much smaller space per inhabitant. So anyway, we need to find more space. And uh, here you can see the, the main four components of our research, which is uh, these four development drivers uh, that, ha that has the potential to foster ter territory development. So the first one is higher education and innovation. The second one is ICT, information communication technologies. The third, culture economy. And the fourth is housing. And an overview of the uh, map of the city in the middle is the river Daugava and Riga on the both sides. And you can see the uh, cluster, uh, you can see the yellow belt, where we kind of uh, say that all these drivers has a potential when they're clustered smartly together in the territory. So for example, ranging from um, territory that has a potential in housing, recreation and culture, up to business, housing and sports, um, as well as uh, territory for innovation, testing, living, much more diversified culture program, activating public open space, uh, digitalization of the events, and in general, making uh, the big culture more accessible and activating the outside public space of the city center. Then the culture in the railway belt um, offers kind of a, uh, could offer a new, uh, new places. Uh, for example, Black Box Theater, where we could invite um, international theater groups, which is currently not uh, possible in Riga and so on. And uh, culture in multi-story housing blocks is more related to pop-up culture events, schools, libraries, and small cu culture centers and activating those. And um, regarding the research and development, uh, so, unfortunately, again, uh, a graph where Latvia has that shows that uh, our percentage of the investment, uh, our percentage of the GDP in the investment of research and development is one of the lowest in European Union. And of course, therefore, um, uh, our innovation index is one of the lowest. 
So this poor um, investment uh, leads to a kind of a low um, innovation level, which should be uh, increased. And looking at it spatially, uh, we kind of actually think that the education sector um, and technology sector should be combined and created in a kind of one uh, technolo technology ecosystem. And for example, um, just a couple of uh, uh, spatial things that Riga City Railway Connection um, uh, has a kind of a potential uh, uh, between the airport and the central station, then a 5G network between Knowledge Mile, which is the uh, on the left side of the city center is the knowledge cluster of, uh, of Riga, um, and satellites of biomedicine network, and potentially a kind of a drone corridor that creates innovative uh, basis for testing future technologies, including important material and substance, uh, for example, organs delivery. So one side of Riga on the right side of the map above a bit, you see the technological cluster on the left side is more the education cluster and it all combined um, uh, in one smart network uh, could have um, exchange um, of knowledge. Um, and again, um, to conclude the it's all about the smart clustering of um, and strategic location of uh, right programs combined with housing, culture, innovation, and education. So I will go a little bit more into housing. Um, housing stock in Riga is actually in a critical condition uh, because most of it is um, built uh, more than half a century ago and out of uh, around 6,000 multi-story buildings uh, only very few are renovated. Uh, in terms of uh, ownership you also see that very small uh, part is a rental housing sector. Uh, it's mainly privately owned also uh, dur during the privatization uh, process. But we have also an issue uh, that uh, approximately 20% um, of housing, and that uh, amounts to 64,300 uh, um, uh, housing units, uh, they have this split property condition, which means that um, uh, in some areas like uh, Purtiems, uh, Mikro Rayon, this multi-story district, uh, you see that some of the large buildings are actually cut uh, by land ownership below. So they are forced to um, pay rent to the historical owners. And this is a kind of locked in situation where uh, development uh, is, is really difficult of those buildings. Um, in terms of uh, living space, Riga has uh, 32 square meters per person, but uh, these uh, micro districts uh, have only 20 0.6 square meters, which is very low, uh, while there's a big um, potential of, of green space, actually 42 square meters per uh, resident in Riga. Uh, so we have this uh, kind of contrast situation with very congested uh, apartments, but a lot of uh, untapped potential around. Um, who lives in Riga? Um, we see that also the inhabitant structure uh, is changing a lot and uh, that requires a, a, a bigger diversity of housing uh, that is also uh, um, <clears throat> better suited for people who are living without children, which is predominantly the 75.5 majority percent majority of the people. This is perhaps one of the most striking graphs while we were uh, analyzing the, the housing data, which shows that 38% um, uh, of uh, Riga's inhabitants uh, are a kind of missing middle class, which is um, too poor uh, to afford the mortgage. Uh, but at the same time, they do not qualify for social housing support. So these 38% uh, of inhabitants uh, do not have um, uh, access to a, a decent quality housing. And this is the reason why we, we believe that there needs to be uh, also institutional change 
and we call this uh, abstractly uh, the housing competence center who could deal with exactly the topic of uh, affordable housing, um, both as, as rental and private property, uh, property owned. Uh, and this would address uh, really young families uh, with children, police, nurses, uh, etc. people who, who need, uh, urgently need access uh, to uh, high quality housing. And the functions of this uh, housing competence center would be a kind of um, audit of uh, current housing stock. Um, uh, they need to uh, develop strategy, uh, competitions, uh, innovative um, pilot projects, uh, and be involved with urban planning, but at the same time, uh, work with the uh, uh, residents of, of the neighborhoods. It's a lot of social work that needs to be done, and they need to bring the residents together with economic instruments that are available for uh, development of housing. And uh, RIGX, uh, in RIGX project, we very clearly identify three uh, zones of, of the city uh, with three different strategies. That is RIGA center, the railway belt, and the micro uh, districts. Um, the, the issue is that uh, so far uh, we have been only having one financial uh, instrument and that is to do with increasing the uh, energy efficiency. And we think this is absolutely wrong because polystyrene, um, it reduces uh, energy bills, but it doesn't uh, improve uh, the living environment in those districts. Uh, and, and we believe uh, that there needs to be a new set of values for improvement of Riga housing stock. And all of these values should be new financial instruments. We, we classify them under three categories. It's architecture, environment, and social resilience. In architecture, we um, are talking about spatial flexibility, that the plans uh, and sizes need to be uh, really different and uh, adaptable. There needs to be living, um, livable outdoor space, terraces, balconies, verandas, live and work options with studios, ateliers, and workshops, uh, collective co communal spaces, very important uh, in these uh, neighborhoods, um, like babysitting rooms, collective kitchens, uh, apartments for guests, workshops, saunas, all of these spaces are extremely important. And uh, as well, we are thinking about uh, innovative uh, technological approach. Uh, there are some cases where, for example, uh, contemporary timber construction materials uh, that we have um, could be provided by the local uh, economy and that could work really well together with the new uh, development of housing. And energy, of course, is part of it, but it's definitely not the number one point in architecture uh, here. Uh, environment. Again, uh, playgrounds, uh, green courtyards, bicycle sheds, picnic tables, places for sport and recycling, mobility, um, shared mobility, uh, proximity to regular um, public transport, uh, and cultural vibrancy, access to public services, uh, culture, education, and well being, extremely important as well as digital environment, energy, um, uh, community management, uh, and other functions, uh, contemporary art, especially in public space, community involvement and, and identity building of the neighborhoods, and social resilience. So social mixing, um, uh, creating inclusive communities in the context of um, economic pressure and ethnic diversity, uh, neighborhood involvement, participation in all uh, of uh, all inhabitants, uh, especially socially weak and low income groups in neighborhood processes, and uh, the building culture or, or Baukultur. It's uh, really about educating people about uh, quality um, that architecture can bring, environmental sustainability, and, and resident participation in the process of creating and maintaining the environment. So this is our proposal for new, new values. Um, then the strategy is uh, focused on um, uh, three parts. And uh, in, in one sentence, it's complex renovation of housing in micro rayons, 
uh, I will explain what we mean by complex. Uh, housing uh, and courtyard regeneration in Riga city center and new housing clusters in the railway belt. So for the city center, uh, we ask um, how to re reanimate the housing stock, which is here in the historical uh, area, avoiding its gentrification. And uh, we believe that uh, uh, it's to do with uh, uh, such architectural uh, approaches as uh, special rules for ground floor public use of buildings, uh, roof transformations and, and gardens, uh, as well as freeing uh, courtyards from the cars and giving them back to the residents. Uh, the environment um, is the green courtyards with all the uh, functions that I mentioned before, uh, shared mobility options, uh, activation of streets and squares, uh, as well as educational aspects of the, of the building culture. Uh, and social resilience is extremely important in uh, the Riga city center because that is key to avoid gentrification and it's the provision of um, affordable and social housing in the city center and not uh, really far in the outskirts. We also have some uh, examples uh, from, from Helsinki and from Oslo, uh, which are related to our ideas. Uh, now, if you go to the, to the micro rayons and what we mean by complex uh, housing. So I would say that all of this uh, research project, uh, you, could, you could define it as holistic, but the approach of of uh, housing uh, renovation in the micro uh, districts uh, is really, we, we think it needs to be complex because it needs to answer the question how uh, the housing structure that is introduced 70 years ago could deliver technological, ecological and social innovation. Uh, and uh, to answer that, uh, of course, uh, it's, it's one uh, part uh, in, in architecture to really create these uh, unique pilot projects because actually there are not that many in the world that we are, are seeing as the good examples, but it's a, a very big part of it is uh, how they come to be organized and how they come uh, to, to be realized because it requires uh, uh, involvement of, of, of the city, it, it requires involvement of, of the state with some financial tools and it requires, uh, we think, this additional uh, institution like this center that brings together uh, the residents, giving them the uh, ex explaining what is possible and organizing these uh, um, new pilot projects. And we believe that the architecture wise, uh, we definitely need to increase um, uh, square meters uh, of living space per one, one resident in these uh, neighborhoods. Uh, in terms of uh, environment, uh, again, it's about uh, access uh, to transport, mobility, gradual uh, regeneration of the, the uh, common spaces. Uh, and um, very important is also construction of buildings while maintaining uh, environmental qualities. So we believe that uh, the micro districts need to have a, a mix of, of, of buildings, also new ones, which uh, offer uh, a different kind of uh, apartments and that could create uh, um, actually this social resilience more. That there is more social uh, mixing of, of people with different income levels and um, there's um, also higher quality housing uh, to rent and buy available in these areas. Uh, there are uh, some examples which I'm sure you are familiar with already. Um, and uh, if we if we uh, go to the final part, it's the uh, clusters in the railway belt and the railway be belt needs to uh, answer the question how many new homes can become part of the city with high livability and create a new identity for neighborhoods. Notice also that the, the, green, uh, the uh, yellow belt is between the city center and the micro district. So it also works as a uh, activator uh, in between that, that is stimulating uh, the entire city. Uh, so we think that this is uh, actually a, a huge potential to combine uh, living and working functions. 
uh, innovative technologies uh, and uh, energy uh, approaches. Um, we believe that uh, uh, there is uh, a possibility to also reanimate some of the industrial ensembles which are on these uh, brownfield uh, post-industrial sites. And uh, we think that, that this is really a possibility for um, a kind of uh, light uh, production to come back, light industry to come back into the city. Uh, and uh, so we, we think that this, these areas could be active uh, all, all um, year, year round, all 24, seven hours a day, uh, that uh, they are never just sleeping districts and uh, they have a high cultural vibrancy. So uh, there is the, the culture uh, in here, uh, cultural aspects, and there are uh, uh, aspects of these uh, economical, um, economic drivers uh, like IT uh, uh, and education sectors, uh, which are already um, very active in Riga and showing a, a big potential. This also allows to create some test beds, uh, even tech uh, sandboxes for, for uh, testing different uh, technologies and here would be really innovative uh, uh, place to um, um, pilot some housing uh, cooperatives so or as we know in um, um, Germany they're called Baugruppe or uh, uh, collective uh, uh, co cooperatives in um, Switzerland or Austria uh, so we think that this is a, a perfect place uh, to do that. Uh, we, yeah, we, as I mentioned, the, the, the timber is local driver um, of economy. Uh, we have some examples from Berlin um, and that are, are these Baugruppe um, buildings developed by communities. Uh, so to conclude, uh, this is uh, our uh, drawing of, uh, of Riga uh, with three very clear uh, strategies for three uh, parts. We are not uh, kind of ignoring uh, other parts. We are just mm, highlighting those parts that we think are key and, and more important and have more potential than others to, uh, to make really this uh, um, image and, and uh, kind of uh, make that image of a livable city a reality one day. <laughs> Thank you for the for the attention. Congratulations, excellent presentation. Thank you, Dagny and Niklas. I am very happy to see and to hear that Lithuania and Latvia are on the same page regarding, of course, the, the current situation that is not uh, very optimistic, but still uh, with the ideas, we are really on the same page. And I really hope that, uh, that this conference is the start of our maybe future collaboration. I would be very happy to continue sharing the ideas and, uh, and, and, and to share the expertise. Uh, thank you. And uh, we will move to the, uh, to the next presentation. I will ask you to stop to share the screen and I will share mine. So the next presentation is, I would say, is also one of the keynote presentations of today. Of course, when we were starting to organize this conference and uh, we were discussing with Olena that she would make a presentation, the world was different. And right now, I think that, that this presentation will change the, the whole discourse of this conference and, 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 and the view on, on the topic. So, uh, and I am really, really happy and thankful to Olena and Arkady that they agreed to, to participate in our conference, knowing that they are probably busy emotionally and, uh, and mentally with the many other issues that are happening right now in Ukraine. So thank you very much for, for being here, dear Olena and dear Arkady. And I am sure that this is not the end of our collaboration and, and sharing the ideas, but today we really are eager to know uh, what is happening in Ukraine, what are probably, I know that Ukrainians, they are sure that the, the the war will end with a victory of Ukraine. We are sure of that as well. And it's a high time to start thinking about how will we deal with the, 
of a legacy of war and how can we create an opportunity of quality living for Ukrainians after the war. So Olena and Arkady, the floor is yours. I am stopping sharing my screen and my colleague will share your presentation. Go ahead. Thank you, dear Ruta. Uh, thank you, dear colleagues. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you, Marius, for helping uh, uh, to show presentation. And uh, thank you, UIA, for your support and uh, uh, help in our struggle against uh, Russia. Uh, please correct uh, the view because, uh, do you hear me? Yes, okay, that's good. Next, please. Do you know uh, that on February 24, Russia launched a brutal war against Ukraine? The Russian army uh, is waging war against civilians, destroying uh, homes and killing children. Uh, uh, 25,000 uh, uh, families lost their homes, uh, 6,080 and 800 houses were destroyed or damaged, and more than 2 million uh, persons were internally displayed. Only in Kharkiv, uh, almost uh, uh, 1,300 multi-story uh, residential buildings, 70 schools, 54 kindergartens, and 16 hospitals were destroyed. In Mariupol, uh, 90% of housing was damaged and half of which cannot be restored. Next, please. And uh, next, please. And uh, the enemy is destroying uh, residential neighborhoods, hospitals, schools, architectural monuments, entire cities. Such cities as Chernigiv, Volnovakha, Irpin, Bucha have almost completely destroyed buildings. Next, please. Uh, next, please. Uh, and uh, uh, do you know that the war is uh, continuing? So how to rebuild so many destroyed houses? Ukraine already has a bitter experience of post-war reconstruction and housing construction for migrants. Next. The first large-scale restoration began immediately after World War II, uh, when uh, only in Kyiv uh, uh, were only Kyiv were destroyed on seventy percent. Next, please. Uh, until the end of eighties, uh, Ukraine completed and rebuilt cities destroyed in World War II. Prefabricated houses, which allowed the construction of economic buildings at a rapid pace, then came to the aid. Next, please. Later, in 1986, the Chernobyl disaster forced thousands of people to become displaced. Then, in short time, the task to relocate a large number of people from uh, the affected area, area was solved. Next. Next, please. Then, a lot of work was done, uh, not prefer, pre before, please. Mm, uh, uh, then, a lot of work was done in a very short time. The basic uh, principles were as uh, follows. Construction of new settlements on the basis uh, of uh, uh, urban concept for each one, with the formation of all necessary functional zones. Then creation of complex project groups that work on uh, uh, the construction sites until uh, their completion, carrying uh, out constant outdoor supervision. Then simplification of technology and sequence of urban planning schemes, control over social content, uh, use of standard projects of housing, schools, uh, kindergartens, shops, communal constructions, engineering objects, 
uh, with binding on construction site according to the um, uh, simplified schematic master plans. Uh, thank you, next. But now the destruction of our cities is much more brutal and powerful. Uh, therefore, after this war, we will not only talk about the reconstruction of affordable housing, housing, but again about the new accelerated construction of cheap mass housing to resettle people who have lost their homes. In our opinion, post-war construction will consist of uh, several stages and directions. At first, detailed inspection of the damaged housing, load-bearing structures, engineering networks in terms of their uh, suitability for their operation. This work uh, should be carried out in short time under the guidance of experienced engineers uh, of uh, architects. If the house has uh, minor damage, it is possible to reconstruct it with the obligatory replacement of engineering equipment, windows, insulation of facades, creation of public spaces, superstructure of extension balconies. This should be a comprehensive reconstruction with the surrounding area. Uh, <clears throat> next, please. If the house is damaged in such a way that it cannot be restored, then the question is uh, of its alternative replacement arises. Hundreds of thousands uh, of families will need new houses after the victory. The rapid provision of housing for those in dire need, uh, in dire need will obviously be addressed through the technology of prefabricated modular construction of temporary structures from blocks, containers, or from linear and flat prefabricated elements, or from a combination of both. But at the same time, we need to address the problems of building uh, more long-term and comfortable house. Uh, next, please. Let us see some examples of reconstruction of existing uh, objects from foreign practice. Next, please. <clears throat> this is uh, a reconstruction of former soup factory in Brussels. Social housing, seven year Heymans, includes uh, studios, one to six bedroom apartments, loft, duplexes, and mezzanine. Next. Next, please. Next is a label housing uh, renovation was a label housing renovation. It was uh, the reconstruction of existing residential complex, which received additional public spaces, green technologies, and new balconies. This uh, picture you uh, see in a square bedroom in Paris. Uh, Atelier du, du uh, Pont suggested adding balconies and completely remodeling uh, the architecture of the facades. The balconies are suspended uh, uh, from the roof. Uh, interesting that this new skin was installed without using no cranes or pads. Next. Uh, various uh, methods of reconstruction is of prefabricated houses are used in Germany. Expansion due to the completion of balconies, lowering the height with roof terraces, dividing along blocks into parts. Next. So the methods of reconstruction of residential buildings can include changing the constructive scheme or not, changing the construction volume by extension, changing the plan dimensions, changing the appearance of facades by balcony of facade uh, system. Next. Next, please. We have now uh, some uh, specific proposals from Ukrainian engineers uh, for the rapid repair of destroyed panel of frame monolithic housing. Next, please. It is only idea, but uh, it can be uh, uh, made just on the place. Uh, such kind of repair uh, building uh, in situ. Next, please. 
Uh, prefabricated temporary modular construction can be made from block containers or small panels. Then it matters only the presence of modules, the speed of assembly and disassembly, and the possibility of reusability. Ukrainian architects propose various types of temporary housing. Please. Here is proposal of uh, by architect Slava Belbek called Dignity No Matter What, which creates usual and healthy lifestyle and decent conditions even in the temporary residence. Main constructive principles are modularity, scaling possibility and flexibility. Social principles are dignity at first, the socialization and comfort. Next, please. Next, please. <clears throat> Speed, budget, and resources uh, are the main points for realization. Next, please. Modification of residential uh, modules are shown on this picture. Uh, you can see residential, public, kitchen, and uh, sanitary, and uh, its combination. Next. This modification allows to combine five uh, types of sections. Section one is uh, family type section. Next. Section three and five have common sanitary blocks. Next, please. Next, please. And these perspectives uh, give an idea of appearance of this uh, temporary housing. Next, please. Different combinations uh, of uh, sections allow to quickly build a temporary settlement up to uh, 8,000 uh, uh, people. The structure scheme is a wooden frame. Next. Another offer from loft office is to level sleeping box block. Next, please. Another type of modular uh, folding housing based uh, on triangle uh, offers Descartes studio from Odessa. Their units are simple, made from local available materials, partial recycling. They do not need to attract special vehicles. Outdoors promise minimum energy consumption and minimum emissions into uh, the environment. And this temporary housing may transform later uh, in five, uh, 10 years into country hotels of holiday village category. Next, please. Uh, Dmitry Aranchi Architects uh, presents uh, uh, universal multifunctional blocks for housing, mobile offices, and public institutions. Uh, such uh, uh, modular uh, can adapt to different functions. Next. There are, uh, so there are uh, three uh, ways to further use uh, uh, modular elements. Further reuse of modules uh, for uh, other function, reuse of component of modules for other needs, and redesign of materials and elements. All these pathways correspond to the concept of cradle to cradle. Next, please. The prefabricated construction industry uh, takes many forms from the production of small sized uh, flat elements of factory production to large scale volumetric blocks of full factory readiness. One of the main requirements for the design of industrial construction is modularity, which in turn requires the use of methods of unification and standardization of design solutions at all stages of design. Repeatability of building elements is a necessary condition for the application of industrial methods in construction, which is uh, especially effective for mass, uh, for mass housing. Next, please. 
Panel construction technologies are widely used uh, throughout the world in this day, especially for the construction of mass housing. Next, please. The simplest uh, uh, well-established uh, technology in the world is uh, large panel housing. The dimensions of cassette or bench products are well suited for the parameters of social apartments. Next, please. Uh, next, please. By creating, uh, uh, but creating project of apartments with, with flexible planning, with stand, uh, standardized areas of social housing is not relevant. Next, please. The location uh, of the construction site is from proximity to existing sites uh, and cities, uh, as well as the availability of infrastructure will have a great importance. Uh, variability uh, and uh, uh, types of elements must be determined by uh, calculation. Next, please. It is possible uh, to erect quickly both volume block uh, buildings and large panels with application of volume blocks and only a large panel. Next, please. Next, please. Constructive and planning system Nove Misto, offered by my co-author Arkady Pecker, propose opinion options for combining different types of block sections, nine and four uh, and five story. Next, please. Next, please. Next. Type of public buildings and housing that can be built from prefabricated units are very uh, different. Uh, uh, next, please. Uh, house building plans will necessary for the construction of such mass housing. Existing high capacity uh, house building plans remained almost only in Kyiv, but the main volumes of, of construction will be the center, south, and east of Ukraine. It seems that today the most efficient uh, uh, low capacity plants from 50 to uh, 100,000 square meter on area per year, which can be located within a few hours of uh, transport accessibility from potential construction area, uh, areas. Next, please. To equip these plants, uh, will need uh, the help of, war of foreign companies specializing in the development, manufacture, and supply of relevant technological equipment. It is also possible to adopt factories of reinforced concrete uh, structures. Next, please. Option of arrangement sections of such panel houses are very different. You can see many uh, versions of uh, facades. Uh, next, please. The cassette principle embedded uh, of the formwork design demonstrates a number of advantages. Technological, technologically simple and labor intensive production process. The quality of the surface of both sides of the products is identical to the quality of the formwork surface, and therefore it is possible to use it for the construction of walls and floors. Compactness of a design in combination with uh, high productivity. Possibility of processing of concrete with various characteristics thanks to use of highly effective system of consolidation. Low energy uh, consumption due to the optimal use of hydration heat in the process of hardening concrete and the possibility of efficient heating of the formwork without excessive heat loss. Next, please. Uh, next, please. Scheme of technological cycle of this uh, plant. Next, please. Scheme of production shop. Next, please. So uh, the requirements for 
implementation of this system are the following. To adopt a state program that will provide financing uh, for design and construction work, allocation of uh, land for Mars uh, construction, determine necessary production capacity and regions of their location, involve foreign companies specializing in the development, manufacturing, and supply uh, of technological equipment, develop a series of residential buildings for reuse uh, with the latest achievements in energy saving. In parallel, to adjust the master plans of cities with the allocation of sites for mass construction, design and build external networks, road infrastructure in areas with uh, mass construction, conduct inspections of uh, damaged buildings to determine uh, the possibility of their construction, develop a construction project based on modern technology, and conduct tutorials and technical supervision. Next, please. Uh, to uh, conclude, uh, I want to say that uh, design decision uh, of affordable housing should be universal, easy change of function of the first floor uh, from housing to public, autonomy of each housing uh, unit, universal urban planning solution uh, uh, for quarter size, which will allow many design bureaus to link their unique development simultaneously in several settlements. Temporary construction should be integrated into city life. In mass housing for migrants should be uh, a mandatory share of hostels, dormitories for students, townhouses, public buildings, and housing for sale. A variety of typologies and a discount when buying with government support. Only the mixing and coexistence of different lawyers of society together produce a sustainable, a sustainable community. The effective population density uh, of the city starts from 1,000, 2,000 people per square kilometer. The lower the density, the lower the likelihood of high quality and sustainable public transport. Mass housing for migrants is first and foremost an opportunity for existing cities, not their problem. And uh, uh, Ukrainian architects are ready to generate uh, uh, brave ideas and many interesting uh, uh, concepts to implementation. We need only financial and managing help uh, in renovation of our cities. And of course, we believe in our victory and uh, we uh, uh, thanks to your uh, support. Uh, thank you very much. Next, please. Thank you, Elena. Congratulations. Very good presentation. Of course, the, ch the challenge is enormous, especially for temporary housing next step in the near future. But uh, I hope the war finished soon and we can start giving a lot of ideas. I'm sure Ukrainian architects have a, a, a very great creativity and talent, you know, to develop very good options. Congratulations, Solina. Thank you, uh, Jose Luis. Thank you, Alina and Arkady from, from our side. That, that's the spirit. I really admire your presentation because you are looking forward to the optimistic future. And, um, you know, while we are talking here in the conference uh, about the existing housing and saying never demolish, you have totally different situation. <laughs> There are some people came that are demolishing everything and you will have to rebuild your cities from the scratch. So somehow you are in the situation of creating a, a new modernism or I'm not sure what's, what would be the name. But uh, as, as a council member of UIA and also Architects Council of Europe, I can promise that you will have the support and collaboration from the global community of architects. And, uh, and I hope that we will contribute to the implementation of your ideas and, and we will empower your uh, teams with, the, with expertise and also hands. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to the near future and, and glory to Ukraine and, and Slava Heroim. Thank you, Ruta. 
Thank you, Ruta. Slava Ukraini. Glory to Ukraini. All the, all the, all the support from the International Union of Architects, Alina, all the support. So thank you very much to our thank Ukrainian, you. Ukrainian you. colleagues. And uh, we will move to the next presentation after, you know, it, it was kind of shocking to see the, <laughs> the presentation of Olina and Arkady, but uh, let's, uh, let's get back to, to the good examples that we have that are not that shocking in a bad sense, but probably we can also use that knowledge for rebuilding cities in Ukraine and also to adapt some principles when talking about the modernist housing renovation in, in other countries. So let me present you the next uh, presentation by an architect, Van der Vermeulen Vincent. And he was uh, part of the team who on 2017 won the Grand Prix of Mies van der Rohe Prize, a European prize for contemporary architecture uh, for the renovation of the flat Kleiburg. Uh, it was a modernism housing block in Amsterdam. And I must say that it was the first time when the Grand Prix of uh, Mies van der Rohe was given to a renovation of a housing block. So we are curious to hear your presentation, Dirk Sander. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very, very, very much. Um, it looks like a bit uh, with, uh, with the words from uh, coming from the Baltic States and from Ukraine, it feels a bit uh, almost a bit decadent to sit in the calm and tranquility of Amsterdam here and give the presentation from here. All my best wishes and uh, support from, uh, from the Netherlands to, to you there. Um, um, I'm, um, I'm going to quickly share with you some thoughts that uh, are coming from our work on, uh, on Kleiberg, but more in general, the, let's say the post-war housing stock we have in Holland and what I'm uh, still working on there. Uh, we worked on Kleiberg in uh, the period of 2011 until 2017. That's the project you see here in the background. And we're still working on the um, improvement in sustainability of uh, housing blocks throughout Holland from the post-war period. Much of them uh, still social housing, much of them still in, in use. Uh, most of them are renovated with people still living in them with very efficient uh, renovation uh, procedure, uh, making ex most specifically the energy efficiency of the building better. Kleiberg was a much more, uh, uh, let's say, uh, 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 serious project in the sense that we, have, we were able to change a lot more um than just some some class but in the same way it was also very modest in in what we did and uh that's a thing that i would like to address in the next half an hour um so uh i'm i'm, I'm giving a i'm not going into this kind of i'm not going into a very technical uh aspects of renovating this post-war housing box i'm also not going really into the heritage uh of uh, these buildings what they and the kind of historic cultural value of them. Um, I would like to more, uh, um, let's say, on the legacy that these buildings uh, gave to the cities uh, in, in, in Holland, but throughout uh, Europe, throughout the world, actually, um, and how we could deal with this legacy, especially in, in, in an optimistic way, in the sense that what they have brought us, what they're still bringing us, and how we can uh, bring this uh, legacy into the future. This is the kind of the, the, the showcase. Uh, this is Kleiber, the 400 meter long block sitting in the Belmer Meer, uh, a post-war uh, urban extension of Amsterdam to the southeast. And um, it was uh, kind of the most extreme uh, big scale uh, development of the Netherlands uh, of modernist housing. Um, 100,000 inhabitants would uh, live in 40,000 housing units built in a couple of years. And uh, when the first residents uh, came to move into the Belmer Meer, you had this, you see from the images, from the people people dressed, the, the architecture of the car bringing those people and the building behind it, there's this kind of mismatch between um, the people living there. They were really brought into what the avant-garde was, the avant-garde architects of the time were thinking was going to be the city of the future. It was ahead of its time. And the interesting thing is that um, I think a general question that could be and questions is, was the effort, the architecture actually ever on time? Um, was it actually has there ever been an architecture that really was it was ambitioned to be uh, an architecture of the new uh, the new city the new ways of living or did the architecture and society grow together into this um, contemporary city that 
we, we see today. And when we're going to renovate it, we're going to make it new again. And uh, I think the ambition is maybe to finally, in a way, make these buildings fit the time and the society and the city that we're, we're living in, which I think is an interesting uh, question. Um, the Bellarmere was a big part of an urban extension from the from the from the 60s, 70s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. Um, most of them, uh, by the way, based on plans that were already made in the 1930s uh, to to extend the city of Amsterdam. And if you see the post-war city of Amsterdam, which was effectively the 19th century city with a couple of small additions, uh, and you see what it was where we were in 1975, then there's this incredible addition to the city. So uh, the modernist housing added to the city and also used the existing historic city as a kind of a, a linking pin. It, it, it really needed the historic city in order to work. It was never really a city on itself. It was always an addition to the city. Um, so instead of Le Corbusier's big plans, which kind of, uh, uh, of course, were the kind of the, the, the most utopian examples maybe of this uh, of this new way of thinking about housing. Uh, the Belmermere was not a replacement of a historic existing fabric, but it was built in the middle of, of nowhere on agricultural land, which was uh, actually a reclaimed former lake. You can see in the bracket, it was just completely disconnected from the city, a kind of convenient tabula rasa, uh, without historic remnants, without ex existing communities, without all the difficulties that make actually working in the city so challenging uh, from an architectural and also social and economic point of view. And this uh, was deemed to, uh, to, was meant to become the city of the future. Um, the kind of most perfect example of all the, let's say, scientific knowledge and scientific is of course very uh, relative in this, uh, the kind of scientific knowledge is about urbanism and architecture would bring this city of, of let's say, the, the, the perfect uh, place to live. And, and most of it, almost all of it, was going to be housing. And I think that's a kind of an interesting thing that in the last half a century, um, urbanism has been about housing of common people. It was not about palaces, about cathedrals. It was not about opera houses or theaters. The, the, let's say that the, the stuff that we make the cities with, the stuff that we make architecture with is housing of common people, affordable housing for common people, which is I think historically quite an exceptional period we've been, been living in. And I think this is something we've gained in the last half a century that we should try to keep as, a, as our focal point as architects. And of course, because it was new, because uh, this new and modern and contemporary, at least what they thought was going to be the contemporary way of living, people didn't know it. So people need to be helped with how to live there. They, there was, this is a, uh, the intervalm system is for the system with which Kleiberg was built. Um, they made show houses not only just as a physical model, just to see how it was built, but also to show with the right furniture, how you should live there, what modern ways of living were. People coming from really cramped uh, living places in the city center of Amsterdam were given a kind of a grand new, um, completely uh, kind of rebuilding of their way of living. Uh, and they should be educated in that. And the architects spent a lot of time getting all the kitchen cabinets in the right place and to have the flow in the house uh, working correctly. Um, everything designed for the people and certainly not with the people. And I think what, what made Kleiberg uh, and, and the Bellarmere in general such an incredible, uh, powerful uh, example is that it's, and I think it's all thing we're striving for in our time uh, today, is that the welfare state as a political idea, uh, modernism as an, let's say, an idea of space and the economics of prefabricated concrete, they all kind of merge together in this perfect mix. Um, and I think uh, it's it's a kind of heroic heritage because of that, because it's such a kind of powerful uh, coming together uh, of all these aspects. And if we're looking at it holistically again, and we look at it, in these estates from the political point of view in which we're now, in which, at least in Holland and in many other places, uh, the housing market, as we call it today, is the dominant force, uh, in which ideas of space are pluriform. There is no singular idea of how space should be anymore. And uh, the economics um, in which, uh, yeah, let's say, uh, how we build stuff um, is, is mostly driven by what sells well. The marketing of architecture is maybe more important than actually what we build. And uh, of course, we, we, we're also coming from a legacy in which architects claimed a lot about how they knew how to live well and how housing should be built and the city should be built. But the, the scientific knowledge on which this was based was very sketchy at best. There was a lot of belief and a lot of ideas and ideals and, and, and I guess also wishful thinking, um, powerful ideas, very tempting ideas, very um, seductive ideas. Uh, 
resulting into fantastic architecture we still think today. Um, but how architecture and urban living might mix together was um, maybe not as self-evident as we would like to think as architects. And a lot of people have blamed um, the kind of the lack of knowledge and also the kind of strange, uh, idea, maybe new ideas of, about urban living for the failings of a lot of these modernist states. And also uh, the Dalmar Mir was kind of a, a, a problem right from the start. This is an image of a demonstration. Clyburg is the building to the left and to the right, you see the parking garage that fed all the, the well, for, for the parking of your car. Um, the city, the neighborhood never really worked and raises of rent were necessary to, to pay for the upkeep, which of course led to protests, which undermined the affordability idea of the uh, state and a uh, uh, lot of uh, degradation, lack of maintenance, uh, criminality, etc. really made the Bauer quickly into one of the, let's say, the ghettos, the, 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 the banlieues, all these negative associations that come with modernist housing today, uh, or maybe at least from the last 20 years, were also uh, projected on the Bauer and these buildings, these projects were never beautiful or never meant to be beautiful in a way. Um, a lot of people say about Kleiber still, it's an ugly building and I can't really blame them for, for saying that um, because Kleiber was never maybe meant to be beautiful. Their, their beauty lies in its purpose of, of, of offering affordable housing, equal opportunity to, to a lot of people and turning this idea, this purpose of this housing into a radical aesthetic. Um, Kleiber, was part of a huge plan, uh, as I said, 40,000 housing units, 90% of them high rise like Kleiberg. This is the entire plan of, Kle of the Belmer Mir and the Kleiberg in brackets, uh, designed not by uh, star architects, men with grandiose egos and grandiose ideas, civil servants uh, in, at, 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 at best in a way, Siegfried Nassou to the top and Fop Ottenhoff, the architect of the Intervon building system with which Kleiberg was built. Um, they were really um, trying to wring the best results uh, on a grand scale for as many people uh, out of this uh, development with, of course, a lot of uh, questionable uh, decisions to be made along the way. But the ambition was there. And I think especially right after its construction, it could be well seen as, as a kind of a fantastic uh, contribution to uh, the living conditions in Amsterdam. Uh, but one of the problems, I think, with a lot of modernized housing, and I also saw this in the plans of Riga, and I think this is happening in a lot of places, um, the, the ideas that led to this modernized housing uh, are coming from a kind of a supersizing of uh, an idea of urban architecture, starting with Unité d'Habitation, um, which was a kind of really solitary building sitting in a kind of lush green landscape, kind of the sculptural volume by Le Corbusier already added on to and knitted together into a fabric by, for instance, the proposal by Park Hill, which had already three times as much units, and then 40 times as much units in the Dalmer Mere. Uh, similar amounts of housing types. It's just a kind of a supersizing of ideas and this economics, economics of this development have chipped away on the quality of a lot of these projects. Um, and uh, we were kind of uh, tempting to only show the, 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 the kind of heroic and, and beautiful examples of this modernist housing. For instance, Alt Erla, Alt Lignon in Geneva, uh, Mirai in Toulouse, and uh, the Belmar Mir, of course, in, in Amsterdam. But I think these exemplary projects are only, maybe say, be the, the, the grade 1% we like to look at. But uh, most of the housing blocks are not as, as good, um, unfortunately, especially moving from the 50s to the 60s to the 70s. I think uh, quantity uh, dominated over quality more and more. And uh, I think it would, be, uh, it would be too simple to just say that these buildings are good just because they have a modernist legacy as their architectural idea. Um, but all of them, despite their architectural and urban quality, they offered high quality affordable housing. With high quality, I mean spacious, light-filled, well-ventilated, uh, affordable housing, large square meters relatively, well-proportioned rooms, uh, an urban architecture without an ego, uh, purpose over aesthetics, the purpose are the aesthetics. And I think this legacy um, uh, is still a very relevant one in which a lot of architecture is maybe about different things than the purpose of the art of the buildings and in which high quality and affordability are very pressing issues in every city in Europe. Um, and the funny thing is that um, today, um, the Belfront Tower, um, the tower which I showed earlier is now turned into very luxurious condos, very uh, popular on the market. And OMA is using the kind of brutalist uh, concrete architecture as an aesthetic um, 
yeah, tool to sell high, uh, 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 high, high priced uh, apartments in Stockholm. So what it comes kind of an aesthetic commodity almost. Um, what what happened uh, strangely enough, um, and this this issue about demolition was already mentioned on. Uh, unfortunately, it was very, it was a very strange, very unfortunate and, and bad situation in Ukraine at the moment. But uh, in the Belmere, um, we have demolished seventy five percent of uh, of the of of the modernist housing stock, not uh, because of a war, but because of ideological and and social interventions that we thought were necessary. And we replaced it by very generic urban infill, uh, row houses, terrace houses. We have a lot in every suburban area in Holland. Um, so the, the way we dealt, uh, at least in Holland, with uh, the modernist housing stock was about demolishing them and replacing it by something else. Instead of, as Oma already uh, tried in the 80s, think about adding on to it, making it more interesting, weaving new and old together, reusing the existing by adding uh, new layers of, 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 of use and of uh, spatial systems to these neighborhoods. Um, and for me, I think that's uh, that's what we also did in Kleiburg and we are still doing in the, the modernist housing stock that we are working on today. Uh, we kind of try to shy away from an evaluation if it's good urban architecture in an aesthetic sense. A lot of it isn't actually, uh, it's, it's, it's not bad, but it's also not particularly good in any way. Um, we still we try to ask ourselves how can it still contribute to the city of today in affordability and the spaciousness, both qualities which are almost impossible to replace uh, if you would take them away and build new and new again. Um, how much do we have to fix in these buildings? And I think we are very tempted to start to fix aesthetic things by adding architecture to a project, but I think we have to be very critical in what we need to have to fix. Uh, everything that we add to the project uh, is, is something we also have to pay for and the residents have to pay for. Um, and issue of beauty, et cetera. It's not, I think, that really relevant. Does the architecture serve the purpose that it's meant to, 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 to have in the city? Uh, don't add stuff just because it's aesthetic. Um, reuse should be a strategy to, of, to offer uh, as much to the city as we can with what we have. It shouldn't be a goal in itself. Um, and something which was thought by Kleiber uh, earlier by Greg Lynn, and the architect, uh, the, the kind of artist architect, made a proposal in the early 2000s for a 70 million plan to add these kind of almost Baroque uh, uh, facades to the, to the building with new uh, elevator and escalators, uh, bringing new, uh, let's say, routes towards the building, but also changing the building quite dramatically into this kind of yeah, very aestheticized object. And this project was, of course, way too expensive to ever be uh, built. And this was actually the reason why our project could go through because 70 million was impossible and nothing else was also not possible in the economic crisis. So uh, what to do was the big question that led to our project. Now, uh, Kleiber, um, at the time, um, I'll just go very quickly into what we actually did, because what we did was try to do as little as possible. We, we offered the, the, the housing stock in the building was for us very well usable still, uh, but open for a lot of different ways of living than the architecture initially envisioned. So we, uh, we, we, we're thinking if we open up the, 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 the houses itself to different ways of living, to different modes, to living styles, to different family types, uh, the diversity that I think is uh, one of the key challenges and, and, and of course, uh, um, qualities also of the contemporary city in a cultural, and ethnic, economic sense, um, but, uh, and, and solve everything, let's say, between the front door and the city, uh, uh, fixing the, the functionist dogmas, which was were about uh, pulling apart uh, traffic flows, cars, pedestrians, cyclists, but for the rest, do as little as possible. Do only thing, only what's necessary. So we renovated the facades. We brought in new, sustainable, more sustainable um, central ventilation, heating, and electricity. But the rest was left open to the new inhabitants to to make their own in their own way, and they did in in quite spectacularly different ways from almost artistic interventions to very modest and down-to-earth interventions to more slick, let's say, generic urban living uh, types, but uh, reflecting the very diverse of economic, economic possibilities and, uh, and ambitions for people. And our main focal points were on the, let's say, the collective parts of the project in the way to reconnect the building, because I think that's, for Kleiberg, if, if you would really have to answer what was really the issue with the project, it's not that it was made from concrete. It's not that it's 500 uh, times the same house in a way. 
it is the fact that uh, the entire plinth was made out of uh, storage spaces. The original piloti of Le Corbusier were taken out of the equation, uh, but it was just sitting on a dead end, dead plinth of storage spaces without any connection to public space. So we took them away. We reopened the underpasses underneath the building, and we took away the elevators that were uh, added to the building late, building later, adding some nice really scar tissue that also didn't work because they were either too cold, too hot, too, fam too damp, too moist. Uh, the machines were almost broken. So that's what we changed. We, we, we opened up and the underpasses. We reprogrammed the ground floor with housing and uh, business units. And for the rest, we did as little as possible. We forged new urban relationships between the building and the city. The city, would, which have had, of course, changed also in the 50 years time, uh, made the entrances with the grandeur that actually fits the, the urban gesture of the block. Um, and um, should I have some? and revisited Siam in a way uh, by, uh, by re reinstating the original ambition in a way. And I think um, our renovation in a way kind of made it finally what it was originally meant to be. I think that was the last slide. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Xander, for your inspiring presentation and inspiring not only because of the result, but also I am always admiring that this approach to architectural profession and, and to what are an architect should and could do. So this kind of a humble approach that instead of making a landmark, you do as little as possible thinking, not about implementing yourself as an artist, but thinking about the, the inhabitants and the so such simple things as the daily economy, for example. So I, I think that this is the, where the architect's profession should, should go further. And I think that the next presentation will also follow this example. Uh, I am very pleased uh, to welcome uh, the next uh, keynote lecturer, uh, Christophe Hutton from Christophe Hutton Architecture from France. And he's, he was the partner at various projects and also at the renovation project in Bordeaux together with uh, Lacaton and Vazal architects. So uh, Christophe, I'm very, very happy to welcome you to our conference and uh, the floor is yours, go ahead. So good morning, thank you for your invitation and thanks for all the, the, the input you gave this morning and uh, the, the project in, um, from um, the previous speaker for Alexander was very interesting. I know, uh, I don't know the, the place, but I know the well, the, the work in Toulouse. So it's, uh, there's a lot of things to say and a lot of analogy between uh, all the context. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm going to propose you a tour in, in Bordeaux. Uh, we did uh, with um, the, the team you mentioned, we, we did uh, the, the renovation of 530 units in Bordeaux. And uh, you can see on the, on, on the back uh, of the, 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 this image. And uh, Bordeaux is a city uh, done a lot. The city center was done in the 18th century. It's a low city. And close to the city now, you are during the 20th century, uh, we, we have done uh, some um, modern uh, urban plan. So um, we did this work with, uh, with a team. It's Anna, Anna Caton, Jean-Philippe Bassal, Frédéric Bruyot, and myself. But first of all, uh, before to, uh, to explain the project, I have to tell you that we, we did, um, uh, before the, this project, we did um, a urban plan. It was called uh, 50,000 units. Because in, uh, in Bordeaux, uh, 15 years ago, we, we start a new line of tramway, of public transport. And uh, the, the municipality wanted to, to find a strategy to provide affordable housing uh, with the, the, public, uh, the new public uh, transport and the, the new public line. So uh, during five years, we did work on this strategy with uh, five other teams. And uh, our proposal was very uh, simple. It was uh, to say that uh, instead of making new neighborhood or new, uh, to build a new world, starting for a white page, we have to consider what is uh, all the situation that, uh, that exists in the city and to see which one uh, they are the most uh, damaged or the more whether you need to put your effort and the, 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 the investment. 
So we did a database with all the collective, um, the collective was in unit. So we've got a lot of cases. And if you zoom into that mapping, you can uh, reach the, you can have the layout of the building, the layout of the apartment, and uh, you can understand each situation. So for us, the goal was to say, instead of making new, new, um, new project, uh, we have to consider that uh, we are, must start from an existing situation uh, with the complexity they've got and to transform it and to add new units uh, with the, the, the existing situation. So all the city can have uh, an update and can have the, the, the benefit of the public investment instead of putting the, all the money in uh, new places. Is what we are doing in urbanism um, usually. So we define uh, the, this, uh, con this um, concept of um, capable urban situation. And we said that we, we've got uh, hundreds of um, situations like this, where you can find something very uh, interesting to, uh, to create a new project and to transform the places. So what I want to say this morning is, um, I'm not using a uh, reuse word or this kind of concept. I propose to you to think about uh, the transformation. Uh, so it's very clear that uh, you take the things like they are and you, you, you work on it to, 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 to go on, on, on another state. So let's go to the point of the, the, the project um, of, of, of Bordeaux. It's, uh, so I show you the, this neighborhood is called uh, Le Grand Parc. It's, uh, it was done at the beginning of the 60s, and uh, it was uh, the first uh, suburbs of Bordeaux in the 60s, and now it's, it's, uh, it's, it's very close to the city center. You can see the 18th century city was going uh, through, uh, it's going, it's very, it's, it touched the, the, the Grand Park um, urban plan. So the Grand Park is very simple. It's a little bit brutal as an organization, but uh, it's very efficient in terms of um, the strategy because they said we can have um, uh, a little bit of footprint to create uh, like a park and uh, to have a green area on the, on the floor. And so we can have a high rise building and that's why it's called the Grand Park. So this is the building we were working on. So there is three building. It's uh, 225 units each, and uh, it's uh, 15, um, 15 level, 15 floor. And on the right, you've got a small building. It's uh, 10, uh, 10 floor, and uh, it's 80 buildings. So, you know, it's, uh, this project is, uh, is dealing with the demolition because these buildings were supposed to be demolished. The, the municipality wanted to demolish because they are ugly, because of a lot of reason. And uh, my, uh, the problem is when you start from this point of view, this picture I'm showing, when you are the mayor of the city, you look at the building far away and you consider, you make, uh, uh, the po your point of view is very uh, simplest because you said that uh, you call it as a, a urban form. You say it's a tower, it's a bar, but you, my point of view, I consider that um, 530 families are living inside for 50 years. So for me, this building, they did the work, uh, they did the job. So uh, it was very efficient for the people. And at the time they, they go in, the problem after is, uh, you know, in the IT, we start to renovate and we just do a, a small painting on the facade, but nothing was done clearly to, uh, to upgrade and to update the, the, the state of this building. So the proposal is very simple. Instead of looking from outside as a urban form, we have to go inside and considering that uh, each family count for one. Uh, you don't have to consider that it's a big system. Uh, it's 530 world, all different, all marvelous. And you have to start to consider that uh, each situation of each apartment must be updated and transformed. So we did visit all the apartment. Huh? I'm showing you some sample of the, the picture. We are working with a photographer, Philippe Rio, to do that. It's a, like an inventory of the, the apartment, but we, we did visit all the apartment. We know all the situation of the apartment. And when you are inside, you deal with the, um, 
the story of the people who are living in this building and they create their own story. They've got um, a link, effective link with the, the building and the apartment. They make it better. The, this building were very functionalist and very systemic uh, in terms of, uh, of industrialization and providing of housing. But the people tried day by day to, to make it better, to make it comfortable and to suit to the project life of the, the people. So you can see different culture. People are coming from Morocco, for example, in this picture. And so when you deal with that, with the, 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 the personal story of the people, I think you cannot demolish again the, the building. It, it changed completely the mindset if you are inside with the people. It's very, it's quite difficult to, to take the decision to demolish. If you are from outside, like uh, on a master plan, it's more easier. That's why we have maybe to stop to work with master plan. To fit, the feet on the ground are always better. So what we have done, it's, it's, it's very precise. We decide to uh, transform uh, one apartment very precisely. And after you do that, you can consider that you continue to transform the 700 more. So we did remove the, the small window and the, the wall facade uh, in red, is drawn in, in red in this document. And uh, after that, we, we bring um, a concrete floor, uh, a prefab concrete floor, five meter large uh, in front of the facade. And after that, you can put a sliding uh, glass window to open the apartment to this space. We call it winter garden. And you've got three meter large of winter garden. And after you have a, a new facade. And after you have one meter of balcony. So if you look at uh, one apartment, uh, this one is, um, is a two bedroom apartment, okay? So you can see the existing state on the, on the left. It's a two bedroom apartment and uh, it's a very functionalist uh, way of uh, thinking uh, housing. So the problem it's you are like, um, you are like lock in, inside the, the apartment. For example, when you are children, if your mother is running after you, you cannot uh, leave the place. So bringing a new space outside linked to, uh, to the, the, the old apartment give you uh, 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 like the space like in a house. I mean that you, you, you have an, ex an exterior space where you can move and you can, uh, yes, you can move in the apartment in another way and you create a new, a new link with the landscape and with the, the climate. So the, from each room, you can go in this winter garden and this winter garden, it's very, uh, as a structure, it's very simple. The goal is to say that um, more the structure is simple, uh, more the people can have the freedom to invent the, the life they want to, to, to have inside this, this housing. It's like a, in, a, in a house when you've got a garden, you can put uh, all the, your staff, your furniture, and you, it's, it's a lot of freedom. We need to bring more freedom in the way we live on the daily life in the apartment. So it's very precise. And at the same time, it is very undeterminated in terms of space. So the people can, yeah, they can choose what to, they can have to do with that. So this is a, after the construction, uh, is the, this is a Jean-Yves apartment and it's just after the delivering of the, the winter garden. Uh, I, I don't think I've got the picture, the recent picture of Jean-Yves apartment, but it's full of plants. It's beautiful now because uh, after five years, they implement the, um, the life is here and the life is uh, taking um, all the space and, and all the project. I think uh, the, this project is dealing between the, the, the skill of the architecture and the performance of the inhabitants, of the people. It's the meeting of the both, which is very important. If you look at, at one of the buildings, uh, you can have the, the, the layout of the ground floor on down. And uh, so this is the common area. We create a new elevator outside uh, because uh, what one thing very important, you have to say that uh, this project was done um, with the people inside the apartment. We don't move the people during the construction time. It was uh, the building were uh, still occupied during the construction work. So the process was very, um, how can I say that? Uh, yes, it was a big challenge to, to be able to make this construction with the people in the apartment. So 
the common area, now you're having a big hole uh, that you can come in, in the both sides of the, the site. You're having a, a, a common level on the layout in the middle, and the last level on the top is the, the rooftop, because we create also new units on the, the rooftop of the building. Uh, we create like a small houses. It's a two bedroom apartment and they are very, very large. So this is the, the process of construction. Um, yeah, so you see the, the, the clay is putting one floor on the left of the, the screen and then the building on the right is uh, already done. This is uh, at the end of the process. So everything changed the, also from the inside, the, it changed completely the, the image of the building and the, the way it's uh, dealing with the city. And this is uh, how we did it. So the, the, the floor are prefab, it's concrete prefab. And um, the fence is already uh, on, the, on the concrete floor. When, when we put it. So that means that uh, when we put the, the floor, the, the worker can walk on it immediately because we don't have to build a scaffolding for security reason because it's already, already very safe to, to be on the, the, the new floor. So the, the extension of the apartment was in fact the, the scaffolding for the construction time. So, and with that also, with that process, we avoid a lot of, um, uh, to disturb the, the, the inhabitants during the, the process. So on this picture, for example, imagine that the people are cooking and watching TV behind the, the wall and the, the window. After putting a floor, we put the pillars like this. They are prefab also. So no machine on the construction site, no noise, uh, no dust, as, as less as you can. And uh, yes, and after you continue. So we were, we were making uh, one level per day for uh, like uh, one um, staircase. And uh, it's uh, five, six or seven um, uh, concrete floor per day. After putting the, the floor, you can cut the, the facade and open the wall of the existing facade uh, to put the window at the sliding uh, glass window. And after you put the facade of the winter garden, So in, in total, it's uh, five work of, um, it's five days of work for, the, for one, uh, one apartment. This is the old facade. This is the very um, gentle machine we are using to cut the, the wall. And um, just on the back, you can see the temporary wall with um, protection to avoid the, the dust to go in the apartment. And you can, yes, this is the, 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 when the wall was taken down. And you can see that this person is watching TV behind the, the construction work. So it's a lot of noise during one hour or two hours. But um, what is very important is um, we did uh, one prototype of uh, one apartment uh, during the study of the project. And uh, it was a, a tool for us to explain uh, to the people what, uh, what is the result. So they can visit it. They can move the curtain, they can move the, the window, they can understand exactly what we did, uh, the benefit of the project. So people were very nice and kind because they understood exactly what, were, what was the goal and uh, what was the project before we start the construction. Here's some example of uh, Winter Garden. And also you, we've got uh, the, um, this Winter Garden is, uh, is done also for in, uh, a process of energy efficiency because um, instead of putting insulation in the facade, you put a three meter of uh, hair and that you can live inside. So the, the concrete floor protect you from the sun uh, in summertime for the summer comfort. And in winter, the, 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 the sun is going into this winter garden to heat the apartment very efficiently. And uh, you, you've got different system to ventilate You've got curtain to protect yourself from the sun if you need. So we strongly believe that the, the inhabitants have got the expertise and the, the skill to, to regulate the comfort and to save the energy. Uh, because instead of an industrial machine, it's better to trust in the people to, 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 to assume the energy efficiency. 
And you can see from this one, we are still in construction in the second building. Also in Bordeaux, the view is fantastic because it's a very low city. So the situation is this building are, I can say, uh, uh, exceptional because you, you're having a very uh, beautiful view. You are facing south and uh, you get the sun. The climate is very cool in Bordeaux and uh, you can have the benefit of the climate and of the view. And the urban regulation today allow uh, us architect to, to build a seven story maximum. So if you demolish this building, you, you lose the, um, the benefit of the, this situation, which is a completely exception. I was saying that uh, the life is coming in the apartment and in the winter garden. So you see, it's very dense. You can have the, the birds, the plants. It's like, in a, it's like a garden and the people are using it very uh, performatively. It's, it's, very, it's very cool. As you can see the situation and the view, you can see it. Maybe it's summertime on this picture. You can see that uh, you are protected from the sun with the, the extinction on the top. And this is the, the, the unit that we, we did create on the rooftop because uh, it was important to say that uh, when you transform, you can add new uh, apartments also. So uh, this building, they've got a lot of capacity, capacity to be extended because they, they were very well, um, well constructed. It was very simple and very efficient, the construction at that time. Um, there is a limit, but they've got the capacity to be transformed and to be updated. And this is the new unit on the rooftop and the situation on the 16th floor is quite amazing. And uh, uh, one thing very important also, you must know that, the, of course, it is a social housing um, building uh, the, owned by a, um, a company, a social housing company. And uh, so we keep the people on the apartment and they keep also the same amount of uh, rental. The rental price is still the same after the project, even in the rooftop. <laughs> and to conclude, just to let you know that um, we, this project, it's, it was a long story for us because it took uh, a lot of time to study and to construct. It took uh, maybe um, two years and a half for the construction. Uh, so we spent a lot of time there on site. And uh, at the end, we get the European Union Miss Award in uh, 19. So yeah, we are very proud of that. And um, of course, we want to share this price with all the people who are living inside because uh, we do it with them and for them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christoph. And I think that your presentation once again proves that the attractiveness of the building lies not in any luxurious architectural details, but in the content and the function that you create over there. And um, I, I think that all of us want to make a lot of questions and to discuss further, but um, uh, we have to hurry. And I think that there will be another opportunities, maybe some workshops that we will organize under the topic. So we will invite you, all of you, to participate once again, and then we will have more time to talk. But right now, let me uh, introduce the, uh, the last participant of the morning session. Who, who will make a presentation, uh, Paolo Mazzoleni uh, from Italy. He's a deputy mayor of urban planning of the city of Turin. So Paolo, the floor is yours. The 30 minutes are yours. Hi, everybody. I will share my presentation. Can you see the presentation? Not yet. No. Sorry, I'm sharing it. I will retry. <laughs> Very sorry about this.
Can you see it now? No, not yet. Can I uh, ask my colleague to share your presentation on screen and you just do yeah. the presentation? Okay. Yeah, okay. Sorry. Okay. Marius, can you share the presentation of Paolo on the screen? Yeah, just a second. Um, yes, now we see the I presentation. Can see now the, the presentation ah, okay, is okay. So yes. perfect. Yes, yeah, it's sorry. <laughs> I just made the same thing two times. <laughs> sorry. Okay. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for inviting me and sh to share with you some ideas and, and things we are trying to, to do. Uh, we have seen incredible presentations. So I will go briefly through some uh, of the themes that I wanted to, to share with you because we're treated very well by other presenters before me and also the moving presentation about the crime that was really uh, let, making us think about the privilege of being here and discussing architecture and city. Um, so uh, in, in personally, I'm, as you said, I'm Paolo Mazzolini, I'm an architect and an urban planner. I work as an architect, uh, been working the last 15 years around the idea of, of city and uh, how to, to plan and, and develop uh, a good city to live in. And we have tried to do this in very different way by designing, by planning. Uh, I also had uh, an experience in our order of architects in, in, in Milan. And, and, and my last adventure, the last thing that happens to me is that I've, I've been called in Turin as a technician uh, to, to try, let's say, uh, uh, to apport some competence in a new govern of, of the city. Uh, we are here since uh, a few months, so I'm not able to, to, to show you things done because they are exactly as I'm saying, they are just the things we are starting to do in this moment. But I will share with you the ideas we are working with and, and the aims that we are we are putting on the ground. Turin is, I don't know if you know Turin, uh, it's uh, the fourth city of Italy. Uh, it will lost in a few weeks uh, the Eurovision, so maybe you know for that. Uh, it, it was an industrial city um, where the main automotive industries of Italy were, uh, or still are, but they are, as in all the industrial cities, they don't have the role they did in the past, and this is very close to the themes that we are discussing today because the city is changing a lot. And the modernist neighborhood were built mainly to host the workers of the automo automotive industry. Um, it's, it's a wonderful city with an, a very sharp and clear urban shape that is the result of its history, but also of a very good quality of planning in the, in the past but it, it has somehow lost its way. Uh, it started to re reinvent itself after the industrial age, uh, but the subprime crisis uh, put a stop in the developing of the, of the city and it and couldn't restart for a lot of reasons. So we are now trying, uh, we had a, let's say we, we proposed a new course for the city and we are trying now to to make, in a way, the city reborn. And, and obviously, uh, the inheritance of the, of the modernist uh, neighborhood is part of this work. Uh, what would we do, we believe? Uh, what, what, uh, what is the, the ground idea where we try to, to, to grow our, our politics for the city? Uh, in, in br briefly, I think it's something that is shared with the other presenters, but maybe it's useful to, in a, way, in a way stated clearly, uh, we do think that city is it's, it's an organism. It's, we can say it's like a tree. Uh, it's a place where every single part live and let live the other parts. So it's very important that uh, any politic, any design, any, anything we do on the city is always taking in account the role of the thing we are managing inside the whole of the city. So, I think this could be a way of saying the holistic approach that is in the title of this meeting of today. Uh, so as a city, if, if, we, if we conceive the city as a tree, 
uh, we have to be very careful, uh, no matter the importance, the wealth or whatever of every single part, we have to be very careful when we manage it because anything we do on a part of the city will affect in a way the city in its own. That's in a way, in a way the philosophy of our action. As we all know, I'm saying very obvious things, but this in a way help us uh, going through the things. Um, in all the history of cities and mainly in, in the history of modern city, the city has grown has grown by growing, as it may seem so obvious, has grown by conquering new space outside. Now this is touring, but I think we can make a map like this on any uh, any European city, you know, from the historical center, then the 18th center growth, and then the 20s, then the industrialization, and then the, the, the spread of the city. And, and this has been the, the growing of the city till the end of, of, the, of the 80s, 90s, no? And, Obviously, the modernist neighborhood were a very important part of this growth. And, and so they have, they have uh, taken away free land from the outskirts of the city and, and is now an heritage that we have to manage. Exactly as all the other, I think, European uh, cities uh, from the 90s, we had to, maybe a little later than other cities, we have to face the, the post 40s, the post industrial paradigm, you know? And so in a way, for the first time, uh, the city started growing from, from the inside and growing on, on its own areas, you no, know? converting industrial, um, industrial places and the, the school brownfields in, in new living or working spaces. And, and this has been an enormous change, you no, know? because after two, maybe maybe uh, 2000 years growing and growing and growing uh, we started reconceiving the city from the inside and and so as you know uh, we started trying to build um, an idea of the city we want you know there are a lot of a lot of um, definition and theories you no know, I like the the Rogers idea of the urban renaissance, but we can use a lot of them. No? And we start fixing uh, some, some aims, some objectives, the sustainability, the workability, uh, the vibrancy of the city. And, and this has started being the, the objective of the politics or, or maybe the narration that depends time to time. We have neighborhoods in, in Italy, just like in France or in Germany, in Spain, in Holland, in all over Europe, we have made very good new uh, neighborhoods and very worse, <laughs> horrible new neighborhoods, depending on how uh, the, the politic, the planning, and, and also the investments and the designers could face or not the, the uh, possibility of, of re really reaching uh, this objective that we, were focus we are focusing on. So let's say that we know what we want to do. Not always we can do it, but we know what we want to do. Uh, and so we start fixing, um, okay. Uh, we start fixing and working in a direction. This is touring, for example, it's a very interesting park on a, on a former industrial area with church, with new neighborhoods. So we have good examples all over our cities is we, we are not, in, I mean, we know that not everything we have done in the last 20, 30 years is, is, is that correct. Uh, we have made mistakes, uh, we have lose occasions, uh, but we know quite clearly uh, what we want to do. So can we apply uh, the same objectives, the same aims, the same, and try to achieve the same uh, results? Also in this very particular part of our city, there are the modernist housing, uh, the modernist housing neighborhood. Uh, we think we can, uh, but it, it's very difficult. Uh, the two presentation we had before mine uh, made by architects doing this work were very clear about what are the problem, what are the difficulties, what are the, uh, the main challenges of doing this, no? moving people or no moving people, the technicality of the building, uh, the 
uh, the way they were, con they were conceived and built that are similar but different in every country, in every situation. For example, in, in the Italian situation, we had less prefabrication than, other, than in other countries, maybe some more urban attention than in other countries, but in other way, uh, we have very poorly built buildings, for example. And so in every situation, we have slightly different problems. And as a matter, I think is much more challenging and difficult than the matter of the reform of the former industrial areas, for example. So it's a very, very complicated issue. There are a lot of architects dealing with that. There are a lot of designers and, and planners dealing with that. Uh, so uh, the first thing I think it's, it's to study, and that's what we have done, to study what's, what is already on, on the table, what is already on the literature, what we do know uh, that could be the, the way of, of transforming it. The first act, maybe also this is obvious. I, I, I feel somehow to say obvious things because maybe between us working on this matter, uh, this could, be, uh, could seem obvious, but I assure you that and maybe you know better than me that when you go outside, you start talking with other, without let's say the, the, uh, the people working on this matter, uh, obvious things are not that obvious. So it's very important to state, state things. No? And one of that, uh, that, that's very important. And that this kind of transformation is an act of creation. It's a design project. It's something that is not a rule, it's not economical, or it's not merely economical, uh, but it, it's designing, it's a creation. It's a creation of a new opportunity, of a new space, of a new place. And as a creation has to be treated in planning and in politics, that's very difficult. And, and absolutely not obvious when you start talking with, let's say, normal people or not professionals. So starting from this idea, uh, we try to give a name to this process of creation. I, I, I hope you will follow us in this little uh, crazy idea. Uh, and that is something that is very important for us to start conceiving a way to put this inside the planning rules of the city. So we ended with the idea of this operation on housing as a kind of bricolage, uh, kind of working. I go, I'll go back on this concept of bricolage, but let's start from the practical. Uh, working with the existing, trying to reach at the end the same results we are trying to reach in the old city. So what we say, the workable city, the comfortable city, the sustainable city, and 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 so on, but on physical objects that are already existing. So we start doing things. Uh, we have uh, focused on a lot of projects. We have analyzed a lot of projects all over Europe dealing with this matter that is, as we say, quite similar. We have some difference uh, around, uh, around Europe and trying to make a kind of catalog of, of action that we can do on these buildings. So assuming that it's a, it's a design, it's a project, and as a project, every time is different. And as we have seen clearly in the, in the, in the last two presentation, if we have good architects, if we have good designers, we had good results. Um, looking the problem in the side of, of uh, let's say, ruling it or, 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 or building poly politics on it, we need to, in a way, make a catalog uh, of, of this kind of operation. Also, we make an extensive work um, about the kind of operation we have observed uh, these design projects are doing, and in, in a way, this focusing on some themes. Uh, for example, the ground level. Uh, maybe the ground level was the, the was one of the bigger mistakes place, uh, the one of bigger place of mistakes in these schemes, uh, in these modern schemes, no? Because, or, or looking at this, let's say theoretical, but not so working idea of piloty, or trying to put a function that didn't survive the market, for example, and so on. Um, a lot of time, the ground floor is the problem, or is one of the problems, or is the problem of this kind of schemes. So the best example we, are, we have analyzed deal a lot 
uh, with the ground level, but also the one you have just viewed that were part of, of our analysis, obviously. On the counterpart, uh, maybe for similar reason, uh, the, the roof level, uh, it's another very critical point. Let's say maybe the, the ground level is the more critical and, and the roof level is the more rich of opportunities. Uh, so another point uh, that is for us very interesting, it's the work on, on the roof level. Both of them uh, cross a lot with the planning rules, for example, because a lot of time the planning rules, uh, or maybe I don't know if also in the other countries, but in Italy it's like that, in our cities like that, the planning rules, they are limiting the volumes also in public buildings. And so maybe the opportunity of working on, on, the, on the roof level, maybe also adding uh, something on the roof level, it's, it's, it, it has problems with the rules. And at the same time, uh, working on the ground floor that a lot of time means working also with function, it has problem with the monofunctional functionality of a lot of our rules that are very uh, obsolete as you can imagine, or uh, maybe it's the same was in other places. A third front of work, a third line of work, uh, it's, it's the facade. We have seen incredible example just now um, because uh, due to the way they were built, but, but also to the way they are changing uh, the way we, we, we use our building nowadays, the facade were really underestimated as a, as a, as a, as a matter in these modernist schemes. And so working on the facade is another point. Uh, it's quite interesting because I don't know how it was in your country, but the pandemic, for example, in Italy, put the, the let's say, private open space on the facade uh, back on the top of the needs of the people. No? We, we were uh, all living inside our, inside our house and, and going on, the, on, on our balcony or whatever we had, or also just sitting on, on the window, on the bench on the window was an action of freedom, no? And the people restarted talking each other from the window or from the balconies. And so the, 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 the facade as a part of the city uh, came back as maybe it was in the past, in Italy was in the past, come back as a very urban place. Uh, and so uh, all these old modern schemes revealed their weakness in, in this part that always was not, or majority of time was not uh, object of, of their project. And then obviously we have the typological issue. Um, most of the, of the modernist neighborhoods were built, of the modernist building were built with a simplified generic idea of, of human and, and of family in particular. No? We have uh, enormous amount of building built with the same typology conceived for a family with two children, no, that's, that was the idea. We are mother, father, and two children that normally are uh, a male and female, no? It's very schematic and we have an enormous amount of building built exactly for that. And now our city is made of very, um, a much complex uh, way of living. The family are changing. We have an enormous amount of people living alone, for example. Uh, there are people coming from other countries, from other culture that maybe use space in a different way. And so it's impossible to think that we can still have thousands and thousands of flats, all identical, all responding, responding, maybe in a good way, but to a very simplified idea of, of Western Italian uh, or Western North Italian, uh, typical family of four people. No? So, uh, a, a pimp of the of the typological asset of the building. It's another strong problem, and it's another strong um, challenge. And also in this case, we have rules uh, that doesn't fit uh, because also our rules in in typology are are obsolete, and they are in a way of the same age of these projects. So they are still describing this kind of theoretical optimal flat made of two uh, room, two sleeping rooms and a kitchen and one bathroom and so on. No? And then maybe we need something more complex, more flexible, more, and it, all these things are very 
obvious to architects. We, we, we are dealing with this in, in, in our competition, in our schools, in our offices since the last 20 or 30 years. But reality is really far from having this as, as normality. And also the, the building themselves, you know, the type, the, the, the morphology of the building themselves, it's it's can be an object of of a lot of operation. Maybe not, you know, the demolition of all the buildings, but maybe an intervention that can change, reshape, add, subtract. And we have a lot of very interesting examples of your of all around Europe of this approach. Uh, but once more, uh, this approach is. Is, is not so fitting with our um, obsolete way of planning and governing the city. So what's the issue? Uh, well, then, sorry, uh, well, 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 last, last of this path of work, uh, also the urban morphology, you know? Uh, as we have seen in the, in the last example, the morphology of the modernist, it's very, of the modernist neighborhood, it's very connected with a very simple, and a straight idea, you know, the Athens idea of uh, of the monofunctional uh, uh, neighborhoods with just housing and a lot of green and, and air. And they are wonderful places in a way, but the, our idea of city, it's much more complicated. And so maybe we have to deal also with the urban morphology, put back the idea of street, for example, of, of vibrant street and, and of workability and so on inside these kind of, of schemes. So what I, I was saying that the point is uh, we do know, and today was very clear, we do know how to do this. Uh, there are very, very good examples uh, in, uh, in uh, all over Europe. Uh, the modern schemes are quite similar or similar enough to learn a lot from other built examples. But uh, at the same time, we are really, or in Italy, we are really uh, far from having this inside our planning. Uh, and in general, in general, we have a very, very obsolete way of dealing with the planning and the growth of the city. Uh, so we have to start back uh, from how we govern and, and plan day by day and with perspective, our city, one of the bigger uh, challenge we have with our new administration in Turin that, that is that we have to rewrite the general plan. Our general plan is from 95 and was conceived at the end of the eighties. So 30 years ago, almost 40 years ago, and maybe three crises ago, it was another city. It was an industrial plan. And, and so we have to rewrite a plan in a completely different way. And one of, and so we are trying to work with some concepts. Uh, we are working with the thematism and layerizing the planning to, to, to focus in any layer, in any theme, focus on a different uh, issue with, with all the technicalities of the tissue, with all the things that are inside the problem of the tissue and it's also to be more, more efficient in, be, in being uh, multidisciplinary, that is something that is completely absent in our actual plan, that is very design, it's very architectural. No? So we are trying to work on different issues, like poli pol politics for different time, so uh, aims for, for months, for years, and for decades, and, and also try to introduce an idea of flexibility. We have a plan conceived 30 years ago, that has a very clear mind of how the city must be. And there was no idea that this mind can change in time. No? And so uh, we are trying to conceive a much more complex, um, a much more complex way of planning the city. And inside this idea, we think we have to put the space also for the uh, renovation of a big part of our city that are the modern schemes. So for this reason, we choose the word bricoleur. So I, I will just lose one minute on this, but it's a word we love and we use a lot to try to describe our approach. It's taken, as you maybe know, uh, by the, the book Savage Mind of uh, Claude Lévi-Strauss. Uh, in a small part of this very difficult book, 
um, that I personally love. Uh, the French anthropologists use the word bricolage, uh, and so the bricoleur, uh, the, the, the guy doing bricolage, as a, a, as a metaphor of a way of using uh, uh, what he calls the concrete logic uh, in, a, in, in a kind of uh, uh, opposition, if we can say, to this classical scientific approach. No? The idea is that uh, differently from an engineer that in front of a problem uh, rationally you know, invent um, a solution for that problem uh, in, a, in a scientific way, uh, the bricoleur uh, has a, a set of tools that are the tools he has in his uh, backyard or his garage, you know? and with that set of tools, try to solve every problem he has. No? And so many times you use uh, uh, something that is not a hammer to hammer, or you use the wrong uh, tool, but you adapt the tool and you make, let's say, uh, you go stage by stage approximating to the solution with the tools you have. Right? And, and, and this, because you can invest in a limited set of tools, you can own any possible tool in the world as, as a, a theoretical engineer. And, and so you invest in a few tools that you believe can help you dealing with the problem you have. You know? And so in a way, if we, we describe uh, the way we face the, the uh, renovation of the modern scheme as uh, urban bricoleur, uh, we can imagine that we can, in a way, build a toolbox of operation that we know we can do and try to put them inside our rules, try put, to put them in our, our plans, try put, put, to put them in our, our, our politi politics, and also our inside the way we fin finance our politics. And so give this toolbox to the designer, to the architect, to the planner, but also to the citizen and, and just adapt them time by time to solve local problems, but having them described as a, as a toolbox. So the very difficult challenge now is to translate that we have, and we will focus on them, on them in the next months and, and year, it's to translate these analysis we have made on all these uh, very good examples. We have not so much, but we have some also in Italy, but taken from France, from, from, from the Netherlands and from many other places, Germany, it's the main, but also others, and, and try to, to build this toolbox and then to convert this toolbox in, in rules and plans and, and, and practical things in south, inside the way we govern the, the city. With a, a very ambitious idea uh, that this um, toolbox could reach even the, the urban path or even the urban level. And so in a way, give us tools also to reintegrate uh, the modernist schemes inside the, leave of the, the, the life of the, the city. And that's very important because a lot of time uh, these schemes host fragile part of the population of the city, uh, the non-wealthy part, uh, the one that, is, that has suffered more the pandemic. And so we really need not just to refurbish and renew and redesign and rethink the place where they do live, but also the way these places are connected inside the city as a network, the city as a tree, as we are called before. No? trying to be fixed on, on, on a city with these values that we have described. We like, and, and uh, we'll end with this a few minutes before the 30 minutes. Um, we believe uh, that the city should be strong. Uh, and we do like a war that is anti-fragile. You maybe know that. Uh, we have used a lot in the last uh, times the idea of the resilient city, you know, the idea of a city that when it's hearted, when it's hit by a problem, can resist the, the, the challenge and, and, and preserve its qualities. No? Uh, well, anti-fragile, it's even better. 
means that every time that I have a shock, I, I come back stronger than before. So an anti-fragile city is a city that can survive a pandemic and come back stronger than before, change itself to prevent the next shock. You know? So that's very ambitious, but it's, the, it's our idea of how we should plan and govern our city to make them not just resilient, but anti-fragile. And I think that this operation, I have very briefly, and uh, <laughs> sorry for that, and also for my English, uh, described in this in these 20 minutes, uh, it's a way uh, to make also our modern schemes stronger, resilient, and maybe if we can, if we will be able, if we were really good in our work, anti fragile. Thanks. Thank you very much, Paolo. I think that you have done half of the work that our initiative was meant to do because we were talking about making a toolkit of the best solutions, and now I can see that the toolkit is almost done. So I really <laughs> hope that in, in the nearest future, you, you will kindly share that toolkit with us and, and we will adapt it, of course, to, to our own context. Uh, yeah, sure. sure. Let, let, let me ask, because we, we still have some 10 minutes. So the ones who are still uh, connected, please uh, put your videos on and we will have a short discussion of 10 minutes because I would like to use my opportunity to make some questions, including the participants of the afternoon session, because maybe you want to tune in and to share your insights. And I want to ask uh, the first question that uh, it's a little bit complicated. It's not so much about the quality of architecture, but more about governance of the projects. Uh, because we had seen a very uh, nice examples how good quality architecture solutions can be implemented. And of course, we can get the impression that uh, renovation in Europe is, you know, it's perfect. But uh, remembering the presentation by Xander, only 2% of modernism architecture is really good quality and the rest is bad quality. So I guess the renovation project, the, the balance is the same. So we have 2% of very good renovation project, but the majority is really a poor one. So let's not be mistaken with, with that optimism and there's a, a lot of work still to be done. So my question would be, uh, what could be the role of an architect in this kind of huge projects that mainly require uh, governmental solutions? And you are lucky if you have a city administration, Paolo Mazzoleni, but that's not always the case. You are lucky if you are an agency and you have Krista Bhutan and Lakaton and Vasal at the steer of the project, but that's not always the case. So maybe you have some insight. What steps and what actions could architects or architect society take to, to make those governmental or local programs to look at the architecture quality, not only at, emer at uh, energy efficiency? So who wants to speak first? Maybe Christoph. Um, you are right to say that uh, maybe the, the project I have shown is maybe is an exception because uh, in France, you know, we are having this uh, crazy culture to demolish. Uh, the, the policy in France to, um, to urban regeneration is to demolish. We have demolished maybe 100,000 units in the last uh, 20 years which is a lot huh? because you put uh, a lot of um, public money and when you demolish one, you create, you build one, but at the end, the result is zero. So you don't create housing, you create, uh, you just uh, change the shape, the form, but you don't create anything. This is the first point. And um, you can say that some buildings have, uh, don't have quality, but uh, maybe it's because we don't spend enough time to understand what are the qualities. And uh, it's very simple to say that there is no quality. Uh, the, 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 the best ecological building is the one which already exists. So this is the first quality of the existing modern building. And uh, also for architects, it's good for creation. I don't know what other architect thinks, but my, on myself, I'm very lazy. So it's very cool to, 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 to transform a building existing. So you don't have to start from a white page. And uh, part of the work is already done. 
and you just have to, you just have to continue the story of the building and of the city and you, you don't create a new world every time you make a project so the policy maybe you have to say uh, we have to um, to say that we don't have to demolish anymore uh, that means that uh, even there is low quality that means we you have to to think more so maybe the rules the, the simple things to say is to say you have to transform and not demolishing this is the only thing that we can propose and after professional and all the people must go around the table and start to think and to make the work thank you christoph paolo do you want to intervene what yeah, we have a, of an architect? <laughs> we, we have a very different uh, situation in Italy. We are not so well, good, but it's not good. We are not so used to demolish. Uh, we are, but not, not because we are better, <laughs> just because uh, we are very conservative. Uh, but at the same time, we are not so clear that if you don't want to demolish, you have to work on that. No, what, what was it's more surprising when you discuss with the, about this with general people, let's say, not technician, is that they really can't understand that this is a design operation. No? Uh, it's not maintenance, it's a design operation. You have to reconceive the spaces to save the, the building. No? And it's, that's very uh, complicated to be explained. And, and so we, have, we are spending an enormous amount of money to increase the, the supposed quality of these places, you know, with physical things like uh, better insulation, better uh, pipes or whatever, but not rethinking the space. And that's crazy. You know, the example we have seen there, they are design example, they rethink the space. No? And so what we are trying to, the, the opportunity we have, uh, uh, and that's what we are trying to do on, on the rules here is that in, 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 it's a big change in the city and those in Italy is not that common. It's to call people that know things to govern the city. <laughs> I don't know how to explain better than this. No? So I'm not a politician, I'm an architect, I'm a designer. And so what I'm trying to do is to bring the things I've seen, the, thing, the things I know, the things that are obvious for me inside the political decision. That's quite an issue. It's not that easy as I thought. The first months have been very frustrating, but we are working hard. And, and, and I hope that this kind of interchange of information that we are doing today found ambassador, I will try to be one of them, uh, to bring this competence that is very strong because you, it's maybe true that we only have a few percent, a two, three percent of things done, but they are incredible projects. And so you can learn a lot from them. And the, the, the big issue is to bring this to normality, to bring this to the rules, to bring things. Some of the things we have seen in Italy, they are just illegal because you can't put something on the top or something on the, on the facade. So the first thing is to make it legal and then to explain to everybody that is the, wrong, the right way to manage the, the issue and, and to disseminate. I think this is which, what we should try to do. I mean, it's an educational role for the architect to take up uh, anyone else wants to step in with some insights? Go ahead. One. Yes, thank, thank you. I, I just wanted to add after Christophe and uh, Paolo that uh, to intervene on existing buildings, it needs time for studies. And most of the clients, mainly private ones, they are tempted to see this uh, time and uh, money uh, for the, 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 oh, the beginning as a waste of time and money. So we, we really need to make them understand that we can't uh, decide that it's more economical at first view and short sight uh, to demolish and uh, rebuild one. Uh, in, indeed, if we have a, a, a global approach uh, in economy uh, and in sustainability, it's always more economical to rehabilitate, to renovate. And the second thing I wanted to add is that we really need to valorize the renovation and rehabilitation projects. And 
that's why it's really important to have this kind of uh, events and conferences and exchanges because for a long time uh, I, i'm still young but i, I i've uh, seen that uh, professional reviews and uh, prestigious prizes and things like that they were mainly dedicated to a project of construction to um, which were seen as maybe more creative, more prestigious, and things like that. So it was really hard to make our clients understand that, in fact, intervening on the existing building, oh, yes, it, it can be seen as a form of laziness, but I think it's mainly a, a, a sign of intelligence and creativity, and because we, you, you, you have a lot of constraints. That's Okay, thank you, Maureen. Uh, now, anyone else wants to step in before the lunch break? With the role, role of an architect on, reno, on enhancing the quality of renovation. Oh, I can see Mona Shalin. Okay, yeah, Mona, hello. go ahead. <laughs> yes, thank you. Well, it's been extremely interesting. I have been listening part-time during this morning. And I think uh, well, most of the projects have, have had to do with this uh, a bit later post-war period. Uh, we started in Finland in the 1990s, uh, inventories of, of modern architecture, maybe because we are, we have so much of that and so little of this ancient architecture before the, <laughs> before the 18th century, there's very little left. So, so the 20th century is really our main building stock is from the 20th century and after the Second World War. And maybe that's the reason why also the city of Helsinki, for instance, has done a lot of inventories. And, and I think it started with that, trying to find out what is there and what are the values and the assessment. And then we started arranging courses of international uh, conservation of modern architecture. And in 2006, we had this, international course, the MARC courses together with ICROM, uh, which uh, we, we mainly focused on the 1960s and 1970s suburban architecture in the Nordic Scandinavian countries and then around the world. And I think this kind of, uh, of, of education for architects is very important because it opens the eyes towards that. It, it, like we heard in the morning, it's not always a question of beauty. We are dealing, like you said, Ruth, I think that, that we are dealing with, with uh, also with environments that are familiar with the people who live there, that they have already uh, founded their own family history, perhaps in these suburban areas, this, this uh, 1960s, 70s buildings. Uh, when you have interviewed people, you find that they, they, don't, they don't consider them as a kind of problem uh, aesthetically and, and socially, but they, they, it's their home. And, and this is also important to, to remember. Of course, we have a lot of green areas around these suburban areas, suburbs, so we don't have this kind of very dense cities, more like you can, you can go out in the forests around your sub suburban areas, which makes that the contrast between the architecture and the surroundings may, may exist, but you still have access to that. I think it's very important to think about how people use the outdoor spaces too, and that we need to, these, these areas were usually planned with quite a lot of outdoor spaces between the houses. And, and that's something that we are losing today in new town planning that is focused on densification and densification of these suburban areas too. But I don't know, I can say something about that later on. Yes, Mona, we will have your presentation later. So uh, I will now announce uh, a lunch break. We will have a lunch until two o'clock uh, Paris time. So we will come back in one hour and we listen to more good examples from Europe. And from the first session, I will take out that uh, sensitivity, ability to listen, making analysis and uh, understanding that it's not only about the image, but also about the content. And the role of an architect is not only being ears, but also being a mouth. So teach and preach, this is the, the role of an architect uh, to do if we want to get the large scale of, uh, of good quality holistic renovation. 
So I will leave you with that. Thank you very much for the morning morning presentations. I will I hope that you come back for the afternoon session. And if not, thank you very much for participation. And we will keep in touch. We will not let you go. So uh, thanks again, and we will see you in one hour. At the second half of the 20th century, and uh, I am very glad to present. Uh, the first the lecturer of the afternoon session, Stefan Lowe, Senior Executive Architect of City Architects Division from Dublin City Council. And he will present a, a project called A Dolphin House. So Stefan, the floor is yours, go ahead. Thanks so much, Rosa, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm delighted to be taking part in this conference. As I was saying to Ruta just minutes ago, it kind of emphasizes the importance of, of the kind of community of Europe, especially in current times and what's happening in Ukraine. And I was very taken with the uh, with Elena's presentation and especially the positivity that's coming out of it. And so what I'd like to describe is a project that I worked on um, a number of years ago, it was completed in, in 2018. It's uh, as part of a regeneration of the housing scheme in the uh, south of uh, Dublin City. And this is an aerial view of uh, the, Dolphin, the Dolphin House Estate. It was an estate built in the, in the 1950s. Um, it made, it's made up of a series of U-shaped blocks and contained 392 apartments and a couple of linear blocks to the north of the site. And then as well, there were 44 senior citizen units as well, uh, located in, in a series of blocks along the north of the site as well. Um, what happened was in, in the Celtic Tiger era, there was, there was a, a development in terms of uh, governmental um, decision to re, uh, do a lot of regeneration and improvements um, of housing schemes using a, a public-private partnership model. And the idea was that basically public land would be sold to developers and in return they would build a number of social units on behalf of the government on behalf of local authorities and the rest of the land would then be used by them for private housing and this was basically the model that was, that was uh, planned for for a lot of our, our larger housing schemes um, in dublin city council now what happened then is, is shortly afterwards in the crash of 2008 um, basically all the developers went into liquidation and so there were a lot of sites that were left either half finished or unfinished or not started. And in terms of Dolphin House, what had happened was nothing, no work had started, which was actually a positive because it meant the whole community um, was still intact. Because what had actually happened on a lot of other sites is because there were proposals um, for complete demolition and new build, the, the existing residents were moved out temporarily. Um, but as you know yourself, once people move into new accommodation, be it temporarily, they never come back. So a lot of communities were actually uh, relocated and destroyed as a result. But the community in Dolphin uh, remained intact and was a very strong and unified uh, community. But what happened was also because of the PPP, what happened was there was a, a kind of a slowing down in terms of upkeep and maintenance of the blocks. Because the idea was, well, these blocks are going to be demolished in a few years, so so we we'll just we would we don't need to do as much maintenance. So as a result, the conditions actually ended up being in some of the flats were really terrible. There were lots of problems with damp and mold that were manifesting themselves, and um, so due to the uh, the fabric, uh, the lack of insulation, and poor ventilation. And um, so as a result of this, the community kind of got together and started talking to the council. And there was a large amount of consultation about the best way forwards. So the proposal was then to set up a complete regeneration of the whole Dolphin estate. Um, and, that's, and that's basically the, the first phase of this is what I'm describing today. And this is the map, uh, site plan of the Dolphin House estate. Um, there's only one uh, entrance point into the estate as quite common with Dublin City Council housing estates which pretty much ends up then developing as a kind of a ghetto. It's like a no-go area. So unless you're from the estate, nobody else goes in there, which can cause a lot of uh, social issues. Um, the second thing was there are a series of, of three-story blocks on the south of the U-shaped blocks here, which are facing onto the canal here on the south and south facing. So it's actually a really wonderful aspect. 
but they were actually turning their back onto the canal. Their entrances were actually facing onto this, which is a car parking area to the north. Furthermore, there were kind of large, there's large green spaces in between the blocks here, which even though they were very generous in size, they were not, they were not used. The actual the ground floors of the existing blocks, even though they had windows looking out, there were no double doors, there was no access onto these green areas, so they were completely underutilized. Um, so as I said, there was consultation between the residents, between Dublin City Council, and between the Department of Housing, who, who fund social housing, in terms of the best way forward. Um, there were a number of proposals we went through. The first one was basically just to do like a minor refurbishment, refurbishing existing flats, doing dry lining and the like, but that was kind of um, thrown out. The second one was then the complete demolition and new build. But given the time um, that it was, it was just after the, um, the 2008 crash, there wasn't much money around. Um, the view of the Department of Housing was that retrofit would actually be more uh, better value for money. So the proposal was to proceed then with a mixture of retrofit and and then adding some new builds um, as well to get a little bit of additionality. The proposal as well in terms of using the new blocks was to actually uh, create green spaces um, to utilise the green spaces between the blocks um, to make them into private courtyards. Uh, finally, the, the proposal was to actually demolish these blocks along the canal and to create new rows of housing which actually face onto the canal and make use of the good orientation. Um, in consultation with the residents and a new master plan was drawn up. Um, it was a mix of retrofit and new build. In the plan here, kind of the beige blocks were the existing blocks which were to be uh, retrofitted. And then to the north, then there were uh, new new buildings to be built, which would then close the previously underutilised green spaces to form private courtyards for the residents. And then on the south side, the existing three-storey blocks would be demolished and a new terrace of houses would be built facing onto the canal to provide more ownership than, and more supervision of the actual canal path. Um, in addition, there was also access, then a new access will be created here to the south as well to, to, uh, to allow people to actually access the, their houses. But the remainder of the site, then there was kind of proposal for new build. These, uh, these, these locations are kind of the open spaces. There wasn't anything built on there. And then with more housing just along the edge to match the existing housing at the edge of the site. It was proposed also then to have more openings to create a new road from the street along here and another opening over here as well to create more permeability through the site to connect the estate much more with the, the wider area, to make it more part of the, of the wider area um, by connecting streets and not so isolated, not so much of a, of, a, of a ghetto. This is kind of the first phase of the master plan. Um, in the proposal, the um, 63 of the existing units were to be retrofitted and then the, and the new bills, then there were 37 new bills to the north and the south of the existing blocks, making 100 in total, made of 91 apartments and nine houses. In terms of design, the existing blocks uh, were done in um, what's called the Sims style. Herbert Sims was a city architect who um, ran Dublin Corporation, now Dublin City Council, in the 1930s and responsible for a large um, new amount of new buildings, especially apartments. He was very much influenced by the English School of Social Housing at the time, which was in, in turn influenced by the, the Dutch School of Architecture. Um, there were some very fine schemes he designed in the 1930s. His style was kind of um, uh, was moved on in the 1950s and 60s, but it was a much more stripped back style where there were less features. However, in coming up with the design, I was conscious that whatever the new build were, that it shouldn't be completely contrasting to the existing blocks. It was kind of just, it felt like there was something just placed there totally out of keeping. So in terms of looking at, at the existing, I wanted in some stage or other to make the, the new blocks and the old blocks blend into to form a whole a kind of a unity. Um, so in looking at that, I looked at some of the, some of the features of the existing blocks in terms of the over, overhanging roofs, some horizontal banding. Um, and also there was a motif in an arch, an arch doorway, which is actually quite common in a lot of the city council uh, housing schemes of this era. So I thought I'd reuse that just as a motif uh, in the new development. Um, in looking at the, some of the design, I was also conscious of some of the um, of previous examples of the in, in Dutch school. Uh, for example, in the entrance, I wanted to kind of 
um, it could make a prominent opening here in the, at the entrance block here, and it was kind of kind of a, a thumb up from the floor back here to Jan Visa's Olympic Stadium in Amsterdam. And in the two-story houses we have in in the new development as well, there's kind of a little bit of a, of a throwback to to some of JPU housing in the, in the Workbund. Um, so these these are the elevations then of the proposed development. The proposal for the existing blocks was in order to improve the their fabric that we would externally insulate them, um, and in order then to match the new and the old the proposal was as a ground floor they would have kind of brick slips on it, similar to the brick of the new build to try and match match it all together. Um, in addition, the by building on the north and the south of the of the of the open green spaces to form a kind of internal courtyard to be very private and very secure for the residents. Um, the, the security was kind of a big issue in consultation with residents because there's a lot of antisocial behaviour kind of occurring within the estate. Um, and the elevation of the of the house towards the canal, I was kind of conscious of maintaining the scale of the existing apartments with four storeys, so proposed three storey houses, but in order to provide a uh, good orientation to single story elements to a good sunlight into the rear gardens. Um, these are then just some cross sections again through the proposed development, uh, showing how the new the new built um, development then encloses courtyards in conjunction with the existing blocks. Uh, this is then just a detail of the of the, the original drawings we had from the existing blocks. The construction was made up of a, a framed concrete um, structure. The walls themselves are actually solid masonry. Now there were, there were issues then in terms of cold bridging both at the overhanging roofs, at intermediate balconies, and also there was a curious situation of a semi-basement here, which was also kind of provided uh, difficulties in terms of how best to, to deal with in, insulating it. In terms of the existing block, there were existing chimneys in place which, we, um, which, which were redundant. And there's also then some water tanks on the roof as well, which, which were actually subject to a lot of antisocial behaviour as well. Children used to climb up on the balconies onto the roof and used to store needles and that there. So there was a lot of issues with those. So the proposal was just to remove all of those, which would then allow for a kind of a clean uh, slate for insulating the roof. In addition to existing walkways and balconies, they would be removed and new walkways inserted to again remove the potential of cold bridging once the walls were, were insulated. Um, this is then a 3D of, of a typical block. Um, the existing blocks have internal staircases. They were open and there was a lot of antisocial behaviour occurring on them. Um, occasionally you'd kind of be walking up and there'd be people drug dealing and whatever on them. So the proposal was to create um, a new staircase and also provide a lift, which would be secure and, um, for the residents. But by introducing a lift, it also meant that if anybody had kind of mobility issues or was in a wheelchair, they could for the first time actually access all of the all of the units on all of the floors. And the existing walkways were replaced with new uh, steel frame uh, walkways, um, which were separate from the uh, structure of the blocks as well as to cut out cold bridging. And then to the rear, for the first time, balconies were introduced to the individual apartments up to, up to now the existing blocks didn't have any balconies so there was no amenity space for the residents within the actual apartments. Um, this is then just a quick cross section just looking at the, the similar details that showed previously to three locations. At the roof level um, the existing chimneys and water tanks were removed and now the roof to be completely insulated. In areas here some of the overhanging uh, sections were, were removed where they kind of clash with walkways Otherwise, the proposal was to, to insulate them. Again, the walkways and balconies, they were separated from the existing structure um, to allow for insulation behind to prevent cold bridging. And at the ground floor level, again, insulation was brought up on the outside, and we actually insulated on the ground floor here at the floor level, um, again, to, to improve the thermal comfort. Uh, in addition, the walls were, uh, were externally insulated. Uh, we inserted triple plate windows and, and provided new balconies and walkways. And then there was uh, PV panels were provided as well to generate some electricity for the residents as well, which they get benefit of. Um, here are just some typical details of how we actually dealt with some of the existing features. In, in questions with the residents, the one thing that, that was always at the back of their minds and one major concern was to do with coal bridging and, um, and mold growth. So in order to make sure that whatever work we did wouldn't actually uh, result in any kind of uh, new mold appearing in the blocks, we did thermal analysis of the new junctions to make sure that 
that for on the internal side it would always be warm, so there wouldn't be any issues of mold. Load. This was done then both in, in two dimensions and also in three dimensions. This here in the right kind of shows where the balconies, proposed balconies are shown, showing that there's no, there's no case of cold bridging occurring. The photograph was beginning um, on site. As you can see, the, the elevation of the existing blocks, they were, they were quite simple, um, simple elevations. Some of the earlier sims had much more features in terms of, um, but, but in terms of the existing blocks, the brickwork was actually quite, uh, was quite badly deteriorated. It was part of the problem for the mould growing inside as well. It was quite it allowed a lot of moisture ingression as well. Um, so the existing balconies as well, which would cause a lot of cold bridging. And you can see the chimneys and the water tanks on the roof. Um, so the first thing that was done was the existing stairs were removed and space that was generated by the removal of the stairs was then incorporated into some of the apartments, so adding a little bit of extra space uh, for the residents. Next, an, uh, a new structure was brought to the outside, a new steel frame um, separated from the, from the structure of the buildings uh, for the new walkways. And then uh, care was taken in all the detail to prevent any potential uh, cold bridging uh, for the new balconies where they were inserted. Um, new triple glaze windows were inserted. They were, they were um, made completely airtight as well to improve the, the thermal values. External insulation was applied and then at ground floor level, uh, security um, in terms of not being damaged, but also in terms of uh, tying in with the new build, uh, brick slips were applied as well. And these were actual uh, uh, sections of the actual brick that was used in the new build to try and uh, kind of harmonize between the uh, existing blocks and the new blocks that were inserted. Um, in terms of the consultation we had with residents, one of the major thing that came over and over again um, was their concern with security. Um, so the internal courtyards, basically, these were the existing green open spaces that were underutilised there. They were now enclosed now with, um, by the new build buildings as well. So this now provides a landscape courtyard where the children can come out and play safely away from the cars. Um, previously, basically, the play spaces were in amongst the car parking spaces. In terms of actual access as well, each, each uh, staircase has its own kind of secure, secure system. Previously, there were just open staircases, so this provides much greater security for the residents, which was a major concern for them. In terms of the, in terms of the public realm, then as well, it was extensively landscaped. What we what we did for the entrance is what rather than just having having a traditional situation of having railings and that, which can be quite kind of um, kind of not necessarily get the right impression and kind of be quite aggressive. We introduced planting bays here, which do provide kind of uh, security for the residents, but a much more pleasant um, environment and, and visually much more pleasant. Um, um, in terms of security as well, then we also provided uh, steel doors for the residents as well, because there's quite a lot of antisocial behaviour, unfortunately, in the, in the areas to give that sense of security as well. In terms of materials as well, we they were very robust. Brick is a very common material in, in Dublin, and especially for social housing, so we utilise brick as well. Um, the entrance is so secure. As part of the, the development um, for the existing blocks, we kind of did a proposal that for the larger units, for the three bed units, where, the, where there would be quite a lot of children, that they would all be located at the ground floor, so they'd have direct access for the children out into the courtyard. Um, in terms of other sustainability, in terms of renewables, we were used uh, GGBS concrete for the foundations. Um, there was additional permeability, we used permeable bailing as well to kind of um, to improve the actual rainwater runoff. And then we worked closely with a local artist as well, and she was very much involved um, with indigenous uh, trees, Irish trees, and particularly fruit trees. So in terms of the landscaping, we introduced some of these, the idea being that in future years when they develop, that the residents themselves be able to pick some fruit um, from those trees. And finally, in terms of biodiversity, there's quite a lot of bat activity along the canal. So we, as in, in some of the roof areas, we introduced bat boxes and swift boxes um, for, for endangered species. And this is just an image then of the, of the two-story housing. Um, the 
The new terrace has overlooked the uh, Dugan Canal. Because they have windows now overlooking the canal and the, and the pathway in the canal provides much more passive supervision. Um, and the new, new roadway as well provides much more activity as well. We're hoping in the future that the actual railings between the development and the canal will be taken down so it'll be much more of an amenity um, for the residents along the canal. Um, here as well, we have the lower scale development, the uh, single story, uh, because the, this facade is south facing, actually allows sunshine to go into the rear. Uh, this is a plan of one of the existing blocks. What we did on the ground floor units, we knocked uh, two of the units into one to make a much larger kind of family, family unit, choking directly out into the courtyard. On the upper floors as well, three bedroom units, we removed one bedroom to make them larger. And again, two bedroom units, we removed one bedroom to make them uh, larger for the residents. Um, the location of the stairs was then moved out. This was the location for the stairs, and that was then allowed for uh, extra space to be introduced into the existing apartments as well to make, to make them that bit more generous. Um, as a request for residents as well, in, in the larger units, we separated living and dining areas. And this was a request that if, say, children were doing homework and that, that they would have a separate room than, say, if the family were watching television, um, just to kind of give that extra separation as well. Um, this is a photograph then of, of, uh, of some uh, bricks that were inscribed by the residents themselves. Basically, uh, as part of the work, the existing residents temporarily had to move out. And the idea was that, that each of the families in the existing blocks would have their name inscribed on a brick. And they came to me and kind of said, where, where could these bricks be inserted? So I had to think and I thought that well, one of the nice ideas might be to have them inserted in some of the external walls. Um, so, so now, basically, the families, whether they could it actually come back, or if you, even if they weren't, uh, if they haven't come back, their name would be forever uh, kind of enshrined within the walls of the development. Um, throughout the whole process, I think the, it was very important that we kind of kept um, discussing issues with the, with the local community and the new residents. Finally, as on the completion of phase one, there was a debate then between for the future phase of whether we'd carry on with retrofitting or go with new build. Um, and it is, this is a discussion that is actually going on because there are a lot of housing estates across the city. Um, and there's a debate, um, especially in terms of intensification, because of the, the scale of the, um, the existing blocks, many of them are three or four stories, there's kind of a pressure to demolish and build much higher density, much higher blocks. Um, so, so as part of the um, a study on the phase one, we did a life cycle analysis, just comparing the, the carbon footprint, if we had, had actually gone ahead and demolished the whole block and, and done it all new build. And what we actually found was that by actually retaining the existing blocks and not demolishing, we actually saved uh, just under 600 tons of, of carbon. Um, yeah, this debate, I think, is, is something that's going to be that's very much to the forefront in terms of how we view the future. In terms of Dublin City Council, we have a, our housing stock is approximately 26,000 units. The larger those units, the majority of them, about 16,000 would be houses. But in terms of the blocks, most of our apartment blocks are from the 60s, uh, 50s and 60s. So this discussion about whether to demolish or whether to retrofit is, is one that's very much to the forefront. Um, and also how, if we are retaining them, how to actually in, intensify the use by, by adding extra kind of new build, maybe a bit like maybe in phase one here, to actually maybe providing courtyards to actually enhance the existing blocks as well and the quality for the residents. Um, and then this is just a view down along the canal. As I said, what we're hopeful is um, there are proposals that this canal walkway would be in, enhanced in form of cycle tracks, so there should be a lot more activity going on. And long term, we do hope that the railings will be removed and be much more access to the canal for the, for the residents. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stefan. I am uh, really curious to ask you one question. We have a couple of minutes left. Uh, during your presentation, you've mentioned a lot of uh, architectural solutions and details related with the safety and uh, against the vandalism. So how did it change after the reconstruction? Have you done any research whether it helped, whether the social behavior of the community changed? Well, very much so. One thing that was very interesting is in terms of the, um, the block, which is now enclosed, um, um, 
I mean, the residence was the first time I've seen in spaces. Um, like when you go and visit there, you, you always see children out playing in the courtyards there and the swings, they're playing with the, with the equipment. And residents were sitting out. You can see it has actually generated a, uh, a much greater sense of community within each block. Um, there's, uh, there's a great spirit, like all the residents, they, they're taking great pride in the in the spaces, even the common in the spaces are well looked after, they're washed regularly and, and whatever. Um, so it does seem to be, um, whereas previously there were much more just individual blocks, so people were kind of much more to themselves. But the actual the architecture by creating those courtyards, it has created more of a kind of in, uh, of a community atmosphere um, within within those those blocks. But the actual security things, um, definitely the, the residents feel a lot more, lot lot more secure in, in those blocks than in, on the other ones. Um, but there were much more open st uh, staircases. It is sad sadly a feature of the of the estate that there were quite severe problems in terms of antisocial behaviour. We are hopeful that as the regeneration um, moves on, that, that those issues will be um, resolved. It is important, though, I think, also to emphasise that in terms of regeneration, it's, physical regeneration is only just one part of it. It's very much to do with regeneration of the whole community as well, in terms of making sure um, that issues such as unemployment and health and health and well-being is, are also addressed at the same time. Because in terms of architecture, you can only go so far in terms of uh, of actually physically kind of improving in, um, the environment in someone lives. There, there are other aspects as well that improve the quality of life, which are equally important for the community as well. I think that was really a nice wrap up of your presentation to mark those uh, important values. So thank you very much, Stefan. Yes, much. And and I will move to our next speaker. Uh, Christopher Ketel Den Kalsen, sorry if I pronounce your name in the wrong way. Uh, he's an architect, a co founder, partner uh, at Tegnestuen uh, Lokal uh, from Denmark, and he will present uh, the project Orsted Gardens. So, Christopher, go ahead, the floor is yours. Uh, can people hear me? Yes, we can hear you. All right, that's perfect. And we see your presentation. That's wonderful. Okay, thanks for inviting us to uh, speak at this uh, very interesting conference. Um, like uh, Ruta said, I, my name is uh, Christopher and I'm the co-founder of uh, Tynes Dune Local. And we um, did uh, this project called uh, Erste Gardens which is a facade transformation of, uh, of a 60s uh, building in Fredericksburg in Copenhagen. Um, our firm um, uh, are interested in a holistic approach to architecture, of course, and we've uh, tried to develop our own way of thinking about sustainability in, uh, in architecture, which means that Besides thinking about uh, social and environmental um, sustainability, we also th uh, think a lot about the building culture that we are surrounded with uh, in, in our environment. Um, and that's kind of the way that we, we look at all our projects. We think that sometimes uh, new developments become too detached from their context and they seem foreign, um, which is something that we're trying to integrate into our projects. Um, this is the project that we are um, talking about today. It's um, it's a residential building in Fredericksburg, which was built in '68, I think. Um, and Fredericksburg is a is a, a really beautiful um, municipality inside uh, Copenhagen that has a lot of uh, classical architecture. And the residents of this building they um, they contacted us. Um, and said that they they kind of felt ashamed by living in the most ugly building in Fredericksburg. And um, we went out and had a look at it. And obviously it's it's not really uh, harmonious with its neighboring uh, buildings, but also it's pretty difficult to imagine that it could ever be. Um, it's built in 68 and designed by a Danish architect called Ole Hain. And um, he was, um, he was famous in, in Denmark for, for this uh, almost uh, late modernist uh, industrialized building techniques. Um, 
it's a residential building and it actually is uh, privately owned. Um, a lot of people have, you know, uh, contacted us and said congratulations on not tearing down this building, which, which really never was a possibility because people actually live in it and they're not renting, they own it. But it is really something else in Fredericksburg. Uh, <clears throat> it's, uh, it's, it's built on a, a modernist ideal, um, which is um, super rational. And it has these, uh, this open ground floor where there used to be a gas station. And as, uh, as people in Copenhagen uh, stop buying cars and start using bicycles, the, the gas station really didn't, didn't have an income. Uh, it wasn't enough to, to support that location anymore. So they, they wanted to move out and um, conveniently um, a grocery store, a big chain, um, wanted to buy the ground floor and convert it into a, a, a supermarket. And, uh, and to do this, um, they had to redistribute some of the common areas of the, of the people in, uh, of, the, of the residents in the building which meant that because they had to move some from the ground floor to the uh, to a roof terrace, it had to be a, a unanimous vote to, to agree to let them move into the building. And that gave the, uh, the residents some leverage against this uh, corporation that wanted to move into the ground floor. And it was discussed how they could um, sort of contribute to the building as, uh, as a whole. Um, the, the, the building was, I don't know if it was the ugliest in Fredericksburg, but uh, it's, it has the, the common late modern um, signs that, that it doesn't really work in a, in a Scandinavian climate. Uh, it has this access way where people access their, their apartments and it's um, it's concrete, and when the rain pours uh, and it freezes, the the concrete starts to to break down, and that was one of the things that they wanted us to look at. Um, also, they had a lot of issues with the noise from the street, and they wanted a new design. Basically, they wanted a facelift, and they had already gotten. Uh, um, an offer from a contractor who wanted to do a very uh, simple glazing of the structure, which would take care of the sound issue and the rainwater issue and the damage of the concrete. Um, but they wanted to make us think, you know, a step more as, as to what could be done with this building. Uh, uh, we see these buildings all over uh, Copenhagen, where you take care of the tectonic issues, um, uh, but you don't really address the, the social issues of the house. Uh, basically, there was no common space where the residents could meet. So we sat down and then we made a list of um, uh, things that we would hope to improve on the building. Uh, we talked about visual comfort, uh, acoustic comfort, uh, better air quality, um, social and spatial diversity, uh, water handling, biodiversity, um, heat loss from the apartments, and of course, um, the value of the apartments themselves. And these are some things that we wanted to integrate into the project. And so we started our design, um, looking at these things. Um, and this is the building as it was when we came. Uh, it's tilted uh, from an angle. Uh, it's almost faced, facing east uh, by a few degrees. Um, basically, we wanted to take down these concrete um, guardrails that were there already. Um, and then instead have an aesthetic that uh, communicated the function of the building. It had uh, corporate feel to it with the long, sleek, cold design. And we wanted to have some individual balconies so that you could see that each of these actually represented um, a family or, or a homeowner in the building. And as we talked about, we wanted to integrate some greenery in some form, um, which became these gardens that are both on the outside and the inside of the building. 
And then we wanted the, the rain that falls on the facade to be naturally um, uh, delayed as it moves towards the sewer system. And of course, glazing for sound and, and weathering. And even though it um, looks like a, a pretty interesting uh, geometry, uh, we were uh, keen on making something that was actually quite simple in its structure. So you have these columns that go all the way from the top to the bottom, uh, except for the ground floor. So it is actually quite rational with 45 identical glass triangles, uh, if you will. And then also to make some private space around each balcony, we added these wooden slats on the ends of these. And basically we, we, we wanted to introduce some rhythm to the streets rather than this long inhuman uh, block, uh, which is why we shifted the, these uh, glass base for each uh, different story. And then it also gave us the opportunity to put um, greenery and plants on top. And this is the, the result uh, from our renovation. And in the ground floor, you see the, the grocery store that moved in. Um, they are quite happy. Um, they, um, they told us that it is the most uh, expensive uh, of that kind of store in, uh, in Copenhagen. But I think that the location can support it um, in this place. And um, each of these uh, glass bays, um, it's part of a common space, but it has a private, uh, private usage. Uh, and these glass bays can then open completely or be completely uh, closed off, uh, depending on the weather. And um, this is uh, a photograph from the street uh, where you see all these green roofs that are automatically irrigated. Uh, so you never have a water shortage, which is also the technique that, technique that we use to have uh, such a small depth of, uh, of soil in there. Um, we wanted to, to have the, the architecture communicate the difference between the, the public space and the private. And that's uh, why we introduced this um, steel bracket that then carries the entire load of the new uh, architectural um, transformation. So the, the ground floor is a plain brickwork where there's a supermarket and then the more interesting and more personal architecture is on the, on the top floors. As we did this, um, one of the things we had to consider when when working uh, on, a, on a building with the residents in it was how to actually make the transformation without having people to move out of their apartments. So we built this uh, temporary wall that, um, and the facade was then constructed on top of that. And then when they were done with the facade, they could just take down the wall from the inside and people wouldn't have been bothered by the building, except maybe from the noise. And uh, these are some uh, detailed shots of uh, how we, we saw the, uh, the meeting between the ground floor and the top floors, and how we see these um, wooden slats that kind of um, break or soften the, the steel character of this renovation. Um, the, the balconies themselves, they are on the outside of the access way. So this is still a completely public uh, and shared space. And then people have private use over their small triangle here. Um, and what, what this does is that um, there was a lot of um, doubt about whether this would actually work out because people were uh, questioned whether people would go out there if you knew that your neighbor would actually walk by uh, once in a while. But this was kind of a central point of the renovation because the residents, they have um, private balconies on the Western facade. 
And we wanted to make this a choice where people could actually go out and meet each other. And we didn't think that it would be a problem that people would walk by because if you really wanted to be alone, you could just go out on your other balcony. And, and what this has done to the environment for the people who live in the building is that Whereas before people would just come home and they would, you know, if it was rain, they would run to their apartment and hurry inside because there wasn't really um, an environment for them to, to, to be. Um, but the quality of the space has really um, transformed um, because it's come, become more like a community now where people actually have the, the doors open. Um, a friend of mine lives in the building and his two uh, children, they, they run from his apartment to the neighbor's apartment. And it has more the quality of um, a, a small street in a suburb than of uh, a Copenhagen a residential block. And these are the, the, the naturally irrigated uh, plant beds, uh, excuse me, automatically irrigated. And we discussed the, the plant strategy with the gardener. Um, and a lot of people were concerned whether anything would grow in these uh, raised plant beds. Um, but, but he made a selection of a lot of different plants. Um, and he said that he, he didn't have the right solution, but he would let uh, natural selection decide what would actually be there. So on the outside, um, some of the plants that were put down in the in the beginning they're not there anymore so the people the, the plants that are most uh, suitable for the specific environment are the ones that actually survive um, and it's it's not um, um, it's not a garden that you have to tend to it's something that has its own life and sort of continues you don't have to water it you don't have to change the plants it, it's supposed to look wild and on the inside, um, the gardener did the planting strategy as well, but most of the residents have changed some of the plants. And since the kitchen is on the other side of the of this wall, uh, they use it for for kitchen herbs and stuff like that. Um, what was interesting about this project is that it's <clears throat> we didn't have any uh, public money, we didn't have any funding in any way. This was a uh, a partnership between the residents and the and the supermarket in the ground floor and it was really interesting for us to see something that sort of grew of you know uh, local entrepreneurship and that people they wanted to take the chance on this project even though that they had to put down some money themselves but because they privately owned the apartments they they had a, a hope a dream that the the value of the apartments would actually rise with the when the building became more uh, aesthetically pleasing. Yeah, this is a, an image of uh, the the glass panes. How that during the winter these are mostly closed off by all the residents because they don't want the the noise from the street with the wet asphalt. Uh, and they don't want the heat loss from the, the, the apartments. Uh, and then during the summer, uh, these uh, glass panes, they usually go all the way to open because it's, it's, it's hotter outside. Um, but it's really interesting how this space being halfway between inside and outside has extended the life of this, uh, of these uh, access ways that people actually use them during autumn and, and spring um, and they actually get together on the outside and people, they furnish their own, uh, their own balconies with their own furniture. Um, and it's not something that we've decided or told people what to buy. It's just an extension of their home, um, which means that when you look at the building from the street, you can actually see you know, different families living in, in different apartments, um, which is quite nice. Um, something else that we, that I brushed on was the fact that um, there's a lot of doubt about whether the plants would actually grow in this environment. And we also had, you know, uh, our doubts. Um, but 
in reality, the the level of uh, of greenery on the facade now is really much more than we could have hoped for. This is after just half a year, I think, uh, or this is it might be a year, but it's it's even more now. So it has this really dense green uh, fabric to it. Um, and yeah, of course, this is this is the main uh, uh, this is the last image that I have. Um, this shows the building after the renovation in its context, and you can see the aesthetic quality of the surrounding buildings. And this is something that has been, you know, the debate surrounding this project because a lot of people they were interested in us uh, transforming this project into something like this um, because that's uh, you know the the quality of the neighborhood and we we're like well we can't we can't do that but we're really interested in architectural culture and tradition um, but there are some limits to what you can do so basically we we said that the building behind the the glass that you see in this image we didn't want to touch that 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 remains uh, as it was both to as uh, um, adhere to the budget um, but also because as we add this second skin or this uh, new facade the degradation of the interior facade stops so when they renovate the facade the next time that's how it's going to be for quite a while because um, the alternative to this was to keep repairing the concrete and we're like could we perhaps invest some money now and then protect the facade on the inside. Um, and basically the aesthetic of the end project um, is something that, in our opinion, balances between the indiv individuality of the private homes and then the industrial quality of the original uh, project. And that's something that we didn't want to um, uh, erase completely and that's why it ended up uh, up like this uh, yeah i think that that's uh, that's pretty much what i have to say at this point Thank you, Mr. so your project proves that uh, it, it's not only a transformation of facade but something more transformation of of lives of people as well uh, just uh, one small question. I presume that there are some 50 probably apartments over there and, and maybe 50 different people owning those apartments. As far as I understood, uh, they have a veto right when uh -huh. making decisions. Mm -hmm. How did you convince all of them to invest their own money into this project? I presume that it took a lot of time of explanation and negotiations. I think that from the initial starting point, uh, we didn't think that this project was actually going to be uh, constructed, to be honest, because when, when they approached us, it was just a dream, an idea. And they said, can you make something that's more interesting? paints that I showed first. Mm -hmm. So we did that and we incorporated a lot of the ideas that we have about our future. And I think that we, if we couldn't communicate to people uh, the architectural qualities and the spatial qualities and the certain investment has already proven to be greater than what they put in uh, because people, they didn't want to live in the building before, even though this is a really expensive address because of the aesthetics of the, of the building, people were, you know, scared away. They didn't want to live in that building. And now it is a building that people actually do want to live in that has an interesting architectural concept and where you actually, uh, unlike most Copenhagen, um, multi-story housing you meet your neighbors uh on a daily basis and there's a really you know 
there's a social quality to the new space. Uh, so to answer your question, it wasn't that uh, easy, um, but we really thought that we had a good solution for them. Um, but also we worked with the, I don't know what you would call it, the board uh, of the residential, um, of the people living there, and they did a lot of work as well. Um, and actually they held back their votes the, the four people in the in the board. So when all the residents had said yes, and it was just negotiations between us and the contractor and the supermarket, the four people in the board actually had a veto against the entire project, um, which also resulted in the, in our opinion, the architectural quality uh, that is there today. Because of course, when when they say yes and everything is signed that's when the when the contractor starts to you know manipulate the architecture and try to make it easier to build and all that but but they withheld their own boat so that they could leverage uh, all the good architectural solutions oh, i am really happy for the success of this uh, of this project and i wish that we can see some copies of it somewhere, not only in Copenhagen. Thank you very much, Christopher. And I will go back to the list of uh, our uh, next speakers. And I would like uh, to present an architect uh, from Finland, Mona Shalin, from uh, the office Kati Saunen, Mona Shalin Architects. And she will talk about a very impressive and beautiful project, which is Serpentine House Refurbishment. So Mona, the floor is yours. Thank you. I, I have some small technical problems, but I will try to share my screen and then. So this is the screen and the presentation. Just a moment. I have to find that slideshow site. So can you see the screen? Yes. The slideshow? Yes. Okay, perfect. fine. <laughs> then I'm happy. Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation. And, and um, this has been a very rewarding day. Of course, like I also was, uh, have, we have been shocked about the, the, the war in Ukraine. And, and it was very uh, good that you could invite Olena to, to present things that we are all as architects also thinking about the rebuilding after the great destruction, the rebuilding of buildings and the rebuilding of, rebuilding of sites, even if rebuilding people is something very different. But uh, this, uh, this leads anyway this to, to my topic, which is the refurbishment of the Serpentine House in Helsinki, because also here we are dealing with a direct uh, post-war uh, post topic uh, of the rebuilding or, and, and new housing for families who had, who had uh, come from very poor conditions or also from all the people who had to leave uh, Karelia uh, in, at the end of the Second World War when as Finland, as, as some of you may know, with the, with the peace uh, discussions and the decisions, Finland had to, to part with some, some of its Eastern areas. And, and this, we had to re-house uh, about half a million people after the war. And this is the background uh, also for the building of the Serpentine House, even if it, it was not directly aimed at, at front men and, and, and families who had lost their, their, their father of the family in the war. But anyway, it was in the general situation. After the, I will uh, talk a little about the background before I go into the project of the Serpentine House. And please keep me online with the schedule. Uh, but before that, even something about the assessment of modern architecture and awareness of the values. In Finland, I think because of our, our very young history, uh, 
and our mostly wooden buildings before the, the 19th century, we have very little left of that old architecture. And, and we uh, consider ourselves as a, as a country with, with mostly modern architecture and, and the majority of the buildings, a huge majority is built after the Second World War. So it's, and then we have, of course, one very prominent architect, Alvar Aalto, one of the leading uh, figures in the 19th, 20th century architecture, internationally even, which means also that there has been a special interest. We have an Alvaralto Academy, which is focused on, on, on um, the restoration, conservation, and rehabilitation works of Alvaralto. And it has also reflected uh, reflections in, in, in a general field that the interest for conservation uh, has also given. Uh, produced these uh, MARC courses that we arranged uh, several international postgraduate courses for architects uh, discussing the conservation issues of modern architecture. And also the post-war housing areas have been an interesting topic for us in these courses, the rehabilitation and, and, and transformation. And then, of course, uh, we also have a very active Dokomomo group in Finland, which means that, that the, the listing and assessment of our architecture from those, uh, the, the modern period has been quite, quite actively published. And uh, also the Serpent and House is one of the Dokomomo projects. Oh, yes. And uh, then even uh, because our legal system for town planning is uh, very strictly regulated and building can only be uh, implemented uh, through an uh, approved democratically, so we say approved town plan, then uh, the idea of uh, inventories and surveys of what our architectural heritage, also the modern movement heritage and post-war buildings has been largely carried out in Helsinki. And then, uh, it is a quite a common, uh, common today that uh, the requirement for a building permit of a building that has, is considered to have any kind of architectural values uh, must be preceded by a historic building survey report, which is very often done also produced by architects. And this was also the case in the Serpentine House uh, refurbishment project that very early on the city of Helsinki planning department uh, uh, commissioned a historic building survey of this, this uh, site, which I'm going to tell you about. But uh, municipal social housing has a history from, from uh, about the, the, the end of the First World War, when Finland became independent, and there was quite a large uh, need of, for housing and, and the city of Helsinki initiated social housing projects, uh, which were usually like smaller wooden houses, maybe for two or four families. Uh, and there was also already a development and, uh, and an, uh, what should we say, um, uh, knowledge about these things and an interest among the architects to, to do qualified work, work with housing, which was, of course, something quite new. And of course, there are European, European models also from that time. But then the Second World War, which in Finland, in fact, it consists of three different wars, the Winter War, uh, and then the Continuation War, when Finland was on the side of, of Germany. And then the Lapland War when Finland fought against the Germans who were leaving and, 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 and destroyed the northern parts of Finland, burnt all the houses and so on. And then we talked about this Karelian, uh, this frontman, the frontmen and the families who had to leave Karelia and, and be for rehousing. Most of the housing in the beginning consisted of frontman single dwellings that the families could build themselves, wooden houses that the architects designed models for these houses. So we have a very uh, kind of typology, typological building. Uh, and then there were temporary housing barracks uh, built in Helsinki. Uh, for, for families also, which were considered to last about 10 years or so, but of course they were kept much longer. And, but the last ones have already now disappeared. But then uh, the idea that 
you can't uh, you can't solve the housing problem, but only by building uh, one family, small dwellings. That uh, that uh, blocks of flats will be the solution in an urban area like Helsinki was, of course, emerging. And at the end of the 1940s, especially when the Helsinki uh, Housing Production Committee and Housing Production de Delegation were uh, established, there began a period of, of quite intensive uh, building of housing and on a quite high standards because the leader, the leader or the, the, uh, of this housing committee was an architect, Hilding Ekelund, who had worked um, both with the, the, the architect's paper, the architect's magazine, and he was also teacher teaching uh, housing design and he was uh, a very skilled architect himself so he also chose a group of architects for this uh, housing schemes these new housing projects he divided the tasks between a group of six seven architects who, who designed for different areas new housing usually they were about blocks for with 200 about 200 flats and they were not quite similar, but they worked together and they had discussions. So this is kind of interesting when the college, collegial uh, discussions among, they were not competing with each other. They were trying to develop the, the housing, uh, housing quality. And uh, the city of Helsinki also had uh, a garden designer, Elisabeth Koch, who participated and they also, uh, commissioned an artist, Eino Kauria, to do the color scheme designed for this building. So color was, of course, almost uh, uh, cost very little and you could enhance the quality and the, and the, uh, the, the, the architecture with, with colors, which was, of course, an idea also from the modern movement times when, when the, the idea of how colors impress, how, can have a, how they, can, they can impress people or, or create uh, sentiments. But the, but the typologies and models for the housing blocks had developed quite quickly since the early uh, 20th century. And uh, there was a new professorship for town planning also established after the war. And the idea is how you could open up the blocks. Of course, this is a modern movement idea, but you can see that in the different examples, they were quite uh, variedly applying these principles. But the silent bow idea, which is the number D or D in the middle of the picture, was of course the the modern movement, the one top one typology that that one would want want to break up with more forms and more more um, varied varied uh, in, uh, courtyard ideas. The models for rental housing were still the ones that the modern movement pioneers had introduced, like Mies van der Rohe in the Weissenhof Siedlung apartment block, column and slab construction, and a very slim building block type, which was adapted also in the Helsinki projects. Uh, daylight and, and a possibility to have ventilation through the apartments was considered very important for hygienic reasons still. And, uh, but there also were new point block uh, types that were applied. So there's quite a variety, but the buildings, they look very similar if you, you see, when you see them uh, from the outside, they are also, they are usually plastered buildings, rendered building with a pitched roof. And uh, because of the building techniques, you could only have quite small, uh, quadratic windows and not this, uh, there was not, not this uh, modern movement uh, from the 90, uh, late 1920s with the uh, ribbon windows and so it was not structurally possible, even if the architects had studied and, and were not laterally uh, very impressed by these examples, but the, it was a more traditional technique that was applied because of, of lack of concrete and steel so, in fact, it was quite a handicraft-based uh, building still. Some of the examples of the state loan apartments built in quite from a, a long uh, route out of Helsinki, 
to the left, high rise pitched roof buildings, which were also much criticized at the time from the architect's point of view. But then the usual 19, early 1950s uh, post-war buildings would be something like you see on the right side, a very pleasant uh, housing block uh, project with garden designed by Elisabeth Koch, which is still very well preserved and repaired. And in general, this period, these buildings from the 19, early 1950s have been much appreci appreciated. And, and they are both private owns and muni municipal buildings, like this uh, municipal rental blocks that are situated quite near the Serpentine House, another project that our office has been working on. This is a perspective drawings from the early 1950s by Hilding Ekelund, or maybe by the artist who did all the color schemes, Eino Kauria. This, uh, this site, the Pohjolankatu site, has a very beautiful garden designed by Elisabeth Koch, and in the refurbishment project, this was also this is like very in, very much uh, a part of the of, of the the values of this. Not the buildings are quite modest in their appearance, and and uh, the flats are are quite well planned because Hilding Ekelund was very skilled at putting at this designing in very small areas functional uh, housing. But the importance is also attached to this garden gardens and the, the grown trees and these uh, very few, very little parking areas and instead uh, playgrounds and social uh, for for common common grounds here between the buildings and this is of course one thing that that we appreciate in this uh, in this times when town planning was not based on densification, but left these green areas between the buildings. In Helsinki, many areas also had forest trees left and they were preserved. Firs and, 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 and pines are still growing among the planted trees. This uh, Pohjolakatu uh, apartments have been refurbished on the very same principles as the serpentine buildings. We learned a lot during the serpentine building process and also let's say the city of Helsinki commission, our client, the patron of these rental flats also uh, accepted to have a kind of conservation approach in, in, the, in the refurbishment, improving technical conditions, but not really changing uh, the appearance of the flats and by repairing everything that could be repaired, wooden cabinets, uh, kitchen cabinets and uh, windows, doors, everything that could be preserved uh, was preserved and repaired by carpenters and, and, and uh, which is also of course our <laughs> ecological consideration that and, and natural ventilation was preserved uh, there are not any ventilation, not, not mechanical ventilation, except from the saunas and the laundries. Uh, typical features of the apartment buildings in the post-war decade would be, like I said, the green uh, spaces between the buildings where you dry your laundry outside in the courtyard, and then the playground is there behind. This is even before the refurbishment. And then uh, I try to list something to just to, to point out what would be the typical features from this period. Slabs and point blocks, an open structure on the town plan and modern movement models still remaining. The living environment, uh, focus on space for play and social life and laundry drying, greenery, saving forest trees, modern garden designs. This was rental housing, uh, council housing, and the quality was high. Construction technique, uh, because war reparations, when Finland had to pay to the Soviet Union, huge war reparations, though the industry had the priority for steel and cement, and building had to be mostly carried out with more traditional materials. So the walls would be of masonry walls, Sometimes even 
uh, anyway, modern materials would be applied on the facade uh, under the plastering, gas concrete blocks, better cell, etc. Floor slabs used concrete, uh, they were cast on site, but concrete was scarce. And uh, all kinds of materials you can find when you start renovating these flats that the, the partition walls can be of just any materials. You never really know what you will find. Pitched roofed, uh, cold ventilated attics. Facades, usually rough cast render, painted with lime wash, very traditional materials. Uh, but then the cantilevered balconies, which each flat usually got the, its own balcony. That was something new after the war. And this was also connected, of course, with hygiene, that you put your bed clothes out to, 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 be, to get aired. Uh, then the wooden doors and windows were uh, industrially fabricated by many small wooden industry workshops. And, but the details would be standardized because at, after the war, the Architects League and other organizations started uh, a huge work on standardizing details and, and you could have all the drawings from, from the detail from this uh, published uh, hand, uh, says like manuals for, for how to build. So they were just very much like each other. They, they were painted with linseed oil paint. Then you used bricks, uh, red brick roofs was very usual because steel, sheet, steel sheets were only scarcely available for roofing. In the stairwells, color with linseed oil paint was used to, to create an atmosphere and uh, the terrazzo flooring was what we have everywhere. Uh, family flats with mainly two rooms and a kitchen or kitchenette was the usual uh, solution and a small bathroom with a bathtub for every flat. Then there were common facilities like laundry rooms, sauna, storerooms uh, were built uh, separately from the apartments. And then natural ventilation, of course, cold and hot water pipes, radiators, central heating. Just to point out there are differences in different countries and, and solutions can be different, but this is the background for the Serpentine House, which has many of those facilities, only that the architect, Yuri Lindegren, who was commissioned for this, he was a true modernist and he wanted to have a flat roof, not the pitched roof that you see everywhere else. So he de developed his design uh, with the flat roof idea and balconies uh, on, the, on the rooftop and with pro some, some skylights uh, rising from the building. But uh, the, the main idea that Uri Lindegren, uh, let's go there, uh, had was to, to, instead of using the town plan scheme that was already existing with lamellar blocks, he said he could put the same amount of flats just like making this undulating snake-like, serpentine-like building. And so he, he presented this solution and uh, it was uh, accepted. And uh, a building that, that consists of uh, about eight, 190 flats and then a service building with a swimming pool, sauna, laundry, and a kindergarten and the central heating, uh, uh, central heating. In, in that building. Uh, the site was uh, between a family dwelling area, very green area. Here is the site for the, for the, for the Serpentine House. It's a wooded, uh, hilly, uh, narrow site. And on the other side is a very busy road nowadays, the main road out towards the air, uh, the, towards the airport when you leave Helsinki to the north. So there's a lot of traffic nowadays. And this is where the block of flats was situated and, and as a wall uh, sheltering the courtyards on the western side where the sun, afternoon sun would shine and, and sheltering these uh, courtyards from sound. And, and here on the right is a, a, a present day uh, aerial view where after the refurbishment. So the two flat, uh, two two units of blocks of flats were used to sh to con to create this undulating line, and here we have um, a typical uh, floor plan 
There are three apartments on each stair, uh, for each stairwell on each floor. And one of the apartments has uh, balconies and windows to just to one side, and the others uh, open to in two directions. So this is in fact a very narrow, a slim building in that sense, which uh, allowed the daylight to enter. And on the right side is a list of the different flats. That's 45 square meters was the most usual for the two room flats, or then 49 to 50 square meters for, for the two rooms with kitchens. And they were designed for families, uh, families with many children, in fact, was considered sufficient at the time. The building was appreciated when it uh, was finished very much. It was published in the Architects magazine and it even became a kind of icon of modern architecture after the war. Of course, this undulating line and the structure system that you can see in the facades was all very, very individual. And there is no other building in Finland of the same, uh, with the same solution. But time passed and uh, the city of Helsinki didn't really spend so much <laughs> money on the repairs and, and upkeep. So the building was in a quite bad state of deterioration in 2000, in, in the, well, 2010, when the, the um, first uh, projects were being made for this renovation. It had been renovated in the 1980s, and that was the basis for this new work because the kitchen cabinets had not been torn out, they had been repaired. Many, the windows were original, uh, the balconies had not been repaired for a very long time, and you can see here in what state they were, as a matter of fact, small stones falling out of the, of the concrete, which was from this uh, post-war area when you didn't have so much cement, you put small stones instead into the concrete, so it wasn't really... It wasn't really of a very high quality, which uh, led to the fact that we had to tear out the balconies and rebuild them. Um, according to measure, but they were reconstructed. The plan by really in the green, you can see here, closer, the small bathroom with the bathtub. After 19, the 1970s, bathtubs weren't produced anymore in Finland. And in the 1980s renovation, it was replaced by a shower, which was the usual in. And then the, the kitchens uh, had, uh, well, there was no, no refrigerator, of course, in the time when the, this serpentine house was built, but the kitchens anyway had place for a little table to, for, for dinner for a small family. And this had been renovated in the 1980s and the, uh, some small changes had been made, but still the building had retained its characteristics. And when the renovation project, uh, the refurbishment project started, the city of Helsinki commissioned this inventory and historic building survey. So there was an architect's office, Keo Koskinen's office, who uh, investigated, uh, surveyed all the, all the apartments, photographed, documented them. Here are some pictures from that time. And then also in the plans, they indicated whatever changes had been made from the beginning in the in the interiors, what cupboards, what 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 appliances were were uh, had been retained, and what had been uh, what had been torn out and replaced. So this was the background when we started. We didn't have to start from zero. We had a lot of information, and uh, the team that was collected for this uh, this renovation project, the engineers and the conservators, etc were gradually working themselves towards a common understanding, which I think is one of the main, in, most interesting uh, experiences as an architect was that in, the, in this Serpentine house, there were very, very varied opinions in the beginning how to proceed with the renovation. But in the end, I think we could uh, work very well as a team and also with the construct, with the building contractor, uh, with the young engineers working in the building company with the implementation, the cooperation was very dense and very intensive, very much uh, discussions, models for all the solutions, which made it possible to work with this as a kind of really more in a conservation 
conservation type of, of refurbishment. But uh, before that, of course, tearing down the plaster from the facades, opening up the ventilation ducts, tearing down the bathroom slabs uh, and seeing what the concrete was really like in the 90, early 1950s. It wasn't very much cement. It was everything but cement. And then trying looking at what the walls, the, the walls had, had, how they had been built. We made also changes in the plans during the process. This was also done in two stages so that there was a pilot project with the first building, which is a shorter one. And then uh, uh, some changes were made to, to adapt, be adapted in the, in the bigger building. But of course, this is quite ordinary for all architects when you do a renovation. At first, you, it looks like a ruin, and then you start, and then you rebuild. Because all these technical installations that we uh, have today, they need to be accommodated. Electricity, need electrical cables, and, and, uh, but, but we still could retain the natural ventilation. And uh, into the flats introduced new vents in the exterior walls because they had been left out initially, never built. And we also retained the radiators, renovated them, and the windows, the wooden windows were uh, lifted out of their of the masonry wall, they were sent to Estonia, and an Estonian company renovated the windows and repainted them with linseed oil, etc. So this was also, um, and there were Ukrainian ladies working in that workshop, I remember, because I visited the workshop some years ago when they were working on it. So thinking about those people today. Uh, the balconies were reconstructed, but with extremely detailed uh, measure drawings and, and of, of all the dimensions. And we retained the color scheme, new rough render had to be applied, trying to do all the detailings as much according to the original ones. And working with the models, which means also the door handles and, and trying to find out the reconstructing the colors that the artist had originally. Uh, designed for the staircases with the help of a conservator, reconstructed a skylight, this wonderful staircases in the A unit that have these skylights, both windows protruding from the rooftop, uh, above the rooftop, and even an, an, a surplus skylight, so that people entering their, how they're coming home from work or from school, the children, they would have this kind of, of, of experience of daylight and color, which I think is one of the most charming features of this building also. The tenants that, that tenants from by the city of Helsinki were also, of course, uh, consulted in this project. And there, I, there we, we, we met all the tenants, in fact, because we made a few uh, rounds around the whole building and to measure the windows and, and, and investigate their condition and so on. It was very interesting. It was even one old lady who had been living in, in the building since the early 1950s. And she was, I think she was 90 years old and she, she was living on the top floor without an elevator, which is quite amazing. <laughs> But the, most of the, the tenants wanted to return. They could also choose to have another flat in another part of, of the city of Helsinki, rental flats. But, but I think most of them wanted to return to the Serpentine house. One small detail that we have such a town plan, uh, the protection town plan for the Serpentine house, even these uh, uh, clothes racks from the 1950s, were, uh, were retained and, and repaired because they were protected in the town plan. <laughs> this is how, and, and so on, so that this was uh, considered to be, to be very important, this handicraft uh, traces. So we tried to design also some new cupboards and, and repair all the old kitchen cupboards, which were at their time a new industrial uh, industrial product uh, based very much on the German Frankfurter Küche idea by Schütte-Lihotsky with even the German glass boxes that you 
for, for spices and sugar and salt, etc. So here are some, and this is how the serpentine houses appears today from the air. This uh, has retained the, the eggshell white color and the trees have been preserved and the courtyards have been a bit improved, but, but with much respect to the, the original uh, appearance of, of, of the forest trees remaining and some new colorful uh, flowers, which were also very usual in the 1950s that you had perennial, perennial flowers in the courtyards of these houses and play areas and so on. We also built new saunas in the basement, but I'm not going into that. But this is that what, what when we can say that we have uh, achieved this, uh, kind of rehabilitation of this uh, quite deteriorated uh, serpentine house. And also that both the, the tenants and the general scene, let's say of architects and, 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 and public have appreciated this has got lots of publicity. I never noticed that any kind of this housing uh, renovation project would be so much published and 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 broadcasted in in and interviewed we also got uh, it was awarded the finlandia prize for architecture in 2019 which also shows how much the uh, appraisal of renovation of housing has has come into focus so um, and it was considered as a, a interesting and an important model for sustainable renovation because the natural ventilation has been preserved, which is becoming quite unusual nowadays when you have more and more requirements, but protected buildings, listed buildings can avoid uh, needing to uh, adjust to all the European, <laughs> European uh, directives of, and, and which also means that we didn't have to do a lot of uh, of, of uh, insulation and the added insulation, we only improve the windows uh, performance for 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 heating for for preserving uh, the temperature, but we didn't need to change the external walls. All these things that would have in the end led to a building which would have looked very much different than the than the old serpentine building and. Uh, of course, this cannot be an example or a model for, for the huge mass of buildings, but anyway, it has had a lot of influence in, in raising the awareness of that you could work alongside the building. And I can say that because this was a kind of a interaction project, that's also why it was this, Serpentine House was uh, awarded this Dokomomo award very much due to this kind of, 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 of pro process, which is of course what, what really can't be seen in the result. You only know how much, how many people and how many discussions, how many meetings were involved with authorities, the users, the contractors, the client, and the designers, the engineers. But this is about what I was going to present to you and, and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mona, for presenting such a, a sensitive and meticulous uh, renovation of, uh, I would say, this is architectural heritage. Of course, it is a unique example, but as you said, it could help to educate and raise awareness of what can uh, renovation bring and of course, to present as well the values of modernism architecture. And I will share my just personal uh, personal memory that uh, uh, at the university, my generation and also uh, the generation of uh, maybe some 15 years older people, they were taught by architects who during the Soviet times, they used to go to Finland to see modernism architecture because it was the only country in the West that they could go because of course of the, of the Iron Curtain and uh, the rest of the world was closed. 
So a lot of modernism architecture here in Lithuania is inspired by, by Finnish architecture. So thank you for that. That's why we have uh, our valuable legacy of, of uh, 20th century second half architecture. And I'm very glad that, uh, that you showed this example, which is uh, really inspiring. So I will, I will move to the next uh, presentation coming from Slovakia. Uh, architect Lukas Kortik from the office Good Good will present a project Panelak. So Lukas, go ahead, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I am going to try to share it. My present, so desktop, and then I do. Yes, we can see your desktop right now. Yeah, it's massive, it's like full screen mode. It's... Is it okay? Can you see? Yes, it? that's perfect. Yes, thank you. Okay, so uh, first of all, thank you very much uh, for being part of this nice event. Uh, yeah, let's see many interesting projects and uh, yeah, that's something that's, that enriched me really uh, a lot after I think being closed uh, during the last two years and having really the, the minimum of uh, connection uh, with abroad. Um, I'm, I'm going to talk about the project that we finished quite a long time ago. Um, so it was like 20, 2014, but it started in 2008. Um, it's, it's, it's project called Panelak. Uh, maybe to explain the word Panelak, it's, it's really like a word that we use normally in Slovak. Uh, it comes from the word panel. That means like a prefab unit. So, so usually these kind of prefab housing we we call panelak. So, so it's just maybe to a little little um, uh, little entry for the for Slovak language. Um, my partner and me, we both grew up in uh, uh, such a buildings. And I think I have to say that most of Slovak people uh, grew up in such a housing, and maybe that's a reality of uh, most of people from Eastern Europe, I would say. So we all have uh, kind of experienced uh, living in such a such a such a housing, and we know all the positives and the negatives of 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 of, uh, of these um, these uh, buildings. Uh, I would show. Maybe the picture of um, of Petržalka. That's the place where I grew up. Uh, when I was a child, it looked a little bit a little bit uh, different. It was more gray, so no really color uh, mess, as you can see. But what is the most important? I was already said uh, during these presentations here. Uh, it's that uh, in this picture we cannot see uh, really the invisible uh, interventions that are made individually in many flats, I mean, like uh, changing the plans, uh, new openings, you know, people, they really like were focusing on their own quality and they, they, they really stepped into, into the structures and no one knows uh, uh, how it is uh, in fact. And then we have these kind of visible interventions and that's this kind of color chaos that uh, happened in these areas uh, where each uh, house community when they try to reconstruct or renew uh, their house, they really work with uh, their own uh, ideas, uh, and all of these uh, all of these uh, interventions has really nothing to do, mostly have nothing to do with the quality and kind of conceptual approach. Um, so I have to say we we were always talking like how it would be nice to 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 have an opportunity. To work with uh, such a structure or substance uh, house like this, you know, to to have an opportunity to to reconstruct or to to really work on it in a, in a really complex way, and that's something that happened where uh, like two private investors that is also very unique uh, came to our office and they asked that they are really in the process of buying a. Um, uh, a prefab house in the city of Rimalska Sobota, that is on the southeast of Slovakia, a small city. And they would like uh, to work with us on it and that we would find an, you know, like a complex approach of, of its reconstruction. What is really important to say 
It's that uh, at the very beginning when they came, they thought like, okay, we're gonna we we're gonna buy it, then we 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 do the quick reconstruction and we sell the flats. But uh, then in the process, somehow they realized maybe what would be more interesting is they just to keep the house and and just rent it and maybe to create a kind of a new quality uh, compared to to the other housing uh, that is uh, that is from the same period and to to you know to enlarge the portfolio of possible uh, uh, units for renting so so and that's something maybe that that finishes with uh, or that has an impact on the quality uh, that uh, the investors and us, of course, we 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 focused and um, yeah. So this is the city of Rimouska Sobota. It's a small city uh, where you know, like uh, th there are no big kind of uh, these housing blocks areas. So you have really kind of individual uh, individual housing um, kind of uh, you know spread all over the city. There is the city center. You can see. So we're quite close with the views as they are but however uh, you know it's a nice nice part of slovakia i have to say so what is the most important we had a special opportunity again uh, that was that uh, um, we, we came to a house that were really in its original image uh, as it was built maybe with a you know like a like a small damages but um, it has all its quality and all its uh, layout plans and all its facades and uh, you could read everything you know as it was planned uh, 20 years ago or 30 years ago because it was built in the late 70s so we had something that was almost preserved and we could really study the construction and really to test it and um, so look at it in, in, in this kind of complex way um that what we wanted so we uh what, what really we wanted to do was like testing the limits of the building and to reprogram it uh, so here you can see you know the original elevations where you can see uh, so the grid of the of the of the panels or of the units uh prefabricated units that that the house was composed of and uh you know very rigid facades and uh, you know like a party party walls with no openings because you know it was just the kind of a one type of the of the apartment buildings that was originally meant like to be part of a larger row of houses uh, so uh, and with a plan that was basically had one uh, one simple uh, flat that was just copied all around uh, on 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 uh, in the house so even the the spaces around were really in quite a poor conditions so you can see like how it looked uh, when we came for the first time and uh yeah basically simple uh, so first aim was just to look at the plans and to adjust uh the new internal layout uh, what was the most important here is just to understand the construction uh, of the of the of the building and so what we really uh, tried to do was like to clean the building all the way down and uh, to 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 its panel construction and what was good for us it was just that the construction system of the building works as a you know as a as a box and uh, it was so it was in both directions so that allowed us to uh, to do a kind of big openings uh, in each direction. So we could really play with a new uh, layout of flats and uh, find uh, really uh, different solutions. So this was the original ground floor that was uh, originally filled with storage facilities. Um, what was most important for us, it was just to create this kind of a buffer for the community and to open the building as much as possible to its surroundings. So we said like, okay, we don't need that much of storage. We can just, uh, we can concentrate it and, um, and to open this uh, level of ground floor and to give it uh, as much as possible to new uh, inhabitants. So we created a new layout where you have a coffee a cafe and the entrance and kind of fitness and area with the little sauna and all these uh, with the maximum openings and connection to the to the back garden. Uh, 
there's a new uh, common entry or entrance that's served for all the all the uh, inhabitants. So we just um, scratch two of them and create one one uh, entrance, and then you have a corridor that leads to two um, access staircases. Then the plans with flats. Uh, original floor plan was quite monotonous, so uh, it was composed out of one flat that was that was copied all around the um, access core, and the access core uh, connected also a common uh, um, loggias that were uh, on each floor. Uh, what we really focused on because we could open the structure uh, in a really uh, large way. So we, we tried to uh, focus on finding different, different uh, flats layouts. So we created like a, a 12 uh, two rooms flat and 12 three rooms flat and 12 four rooms flat, I think. And there are, then there are two, uh, two special larger flats on the roof extension. Uh, uh, one of the feature was like that we tried to we tried to uh, locate or position the 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 living area of course on the on the on the west side, but we created few uh, few layouts that had the uh, living area connected with the uh, with the kitchen and the uh, dining, and that went through uh, through the plan from one side to another. Uh, that uh, that allowed us to make big openings on both sides and to give more uh, light into into interior and also in the next step to have the possibility to position the big balconies either on one side or two sides so that was uh, for us very important and the other thing was like that we could find the you know the openings also to on, on the on the side of the party walls the other thing was just the trans transforming of the building envelope uh, so, because we uh, we work with the new plans, and uh, with the new plans, we were thinking about you know like uh, finding a new portfolio of the windows because we wanted the windows really fits with the plan. So we created kind of uh, we 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 were like thinking, okay, what can we do with this kind of uh, very rigid. Uh, great uh, facade so one of the one of the most important uh, thing for us was just okay let's work with kind of a portfolio with a new opening so we had a lower lower kitchen window that served you know in the kitchen that didn't have the access to the balcony but then we have the big opening windows so that leads to to the balconies etc so we worked with that so we enclosed the uh, we enclosed the shed loggias and could play with this kind of new uh, variety of uh, openings. So we uh, we did this, and then we focused on openings on the party wall. So that was something for us that we understood that this house is okay. Originally meant as a house that was uh, that was prefabricated or should be a part of a larger prefabricated row of housing, but this one was standing all alone. So it was like freestanding house. And it didn't have any reason to to keep it, uh, you know, with the party wall with no openings. So we said, like, okay, we let's break this kind of original uh, original way, uh, you know, how it was meant uh, when it was built. So we created these openings, and uh, then the next step was just isolate whole buildings with a thick uh, thick uh, layer of uh, isolation. Uh, here, what was another important uh, point for us? It was just that we wanted to have whole volume as one uh, one uh, one united building. So uh, we even connected the upper roof extension with a lower level uh, volume uh, in one one building. So we didn't want to make the 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 the, ex the roof extension visible and readable from the outside. Uh, and and maybe to say just another thing, it's like that. And this was the this was the step where the where the you know like the, the grid of the panel panels just disappeared. So uh, yeah, and the last 
uh, two steps were like uh, were, were um, upper roof extension and the additional boxes and the the, the layer of uh, 30 new balconies. So as we knew the construction and the possibilities that we could work with, so the upper extension was made as steel light steel construction uh, that was uh, covered and enclosed with uh, like sandwich construction, like wooden sandwich construction. Uh, important for us was uh, just to create kind of a vocabulary how to work with this construction and that because we wanted to have it visible this all these steel uh, frames and beams and uh, you know like to have it uh, a part of, uh, of uh, interior of the flats so we work really in the details like how to connect them how to where, where we want to have them visible if there's a for example kitchen if there is a bathroom so how these details incorporate into into uh, into the final interior that was we have to say at the beginning, uh, quite shock for the investors because they, these, those two flats were for them uh, in the end. But for us, it was kind of a nice uh, contrast with this kind of really flat and uh, uh, easy looking uh, interiors of the, of, the, of the original house. So uh, in the end, uh, it finished like uh, with all these steel construction visible and uh, that's uh, we're really happy that we 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 really uh, like uh, that the investors really understood uh, our 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 aim. Um, we created this model uh, showing the way we wanted to see this house uh, because okay when we came to the house it was empty, but uh, we understand that all the time you know there even. As I as I as I as I um, spoken about the, the the small interventions, so all the people they have their own interventions somehow in these buildings. So we said like, okay, let's do these small interventions for them and give them uh, you know the like like the like the place at these balconies, and also to give each uh, of the flats a piece of exterior uh, exterior that would be private for them but with this kind of visible connection in between. So that's something that was not present in this house before. So, um, so we came with this kind of light steel uh, hanged balcony that, was, that had really uh, nice uh, proportions, like 2.2, I think by 2.2 meters. Uh, so you can really place a table for four people and to have lunch or dinner. Uh, uh, we tested it. Before uh, we know, we, we, we knew that, okay, it, it's working. I think the first a little bit, he, he turned a little bit, so we have to enforce it, but somehow it, it worked. And what happened that these balconies, uh, they became a new layer for the building, uh, something that, uh, that, that, that became really a kind of a, kind of a significant, significant um, or specific uh, image for the new building. So this kind of light steel construction, uh, where the where the floor is made out of wood uh, became uh, kind of a, kind of a you know like a new new T-shirt for the building that is really light that she that, that, that maybe could not be there but without these balconies we, we we think that the house would be not that house so so it, it gives us you know this kind of a hairy feeling we would say uh, and and uh, put the life uh, of the of the people living inside outside so. Here we can see the balcony is also on the party wall. So it gives the house complete different feeling, you know, like that it has these kind of uh, extensions of, of the interior and it becomes really, really something uh, um, not really like a framed. Uh, so this is the comparison of the, of the former and the new, uh, new elevation. So you see that from that kind of uh, very readable panel construction that uh, that uh, that was super logic and came out of the logic of the former plans so we came to something new that uh, and that is that you can read the logic of the building and of the of the new plans that are uh, that we proposed seeing from the interior so this is what happened to the uh, living area so you have your living areas that uh, enlarged uh, there was there was that is enlarged uh, to the outside so you have these kind of different views and when you are outside you can see the you know like the surroundings what is maybe interesting here that 
uh, at the very first, one of the first slides I showed uh, the, the picture of the, of the area and all the buildings were in the original colors. And after when we finished, I think most of the buildings, they are already renovated in, and you can see that the colors are already there. So you have these kind of yellow, light yellow and um, colors that, and, and these kind of mixtures of one facade. And that's why we decided to uh, have this house, house in one color, simply white and uh, like not focusing really on the, you know, like a, a trying to find a, a perfect color combination. Uh, next layer are, are the outside boxes on the ground floor. So the first box is the box for the entrance and the other box is the box uh, with the backyard terrace. The entrance is kind of one box that is half open, half closed with this kind of simple glass uh, enclosure that is, uh, you know, that it's just uh, the space where you have the, uh, where you have the entrance. And then the, the box uh, that is kind of a buffer in between the backyard and the, and the ground floor uh, facilities where all the ground floor facilities have big windows uh, that are connected with this area. Uh, yes, this was right after the, when, when, when the house was uh, finished. So you see a little life. Uh, and when we compare this to building so the first is from 208 and this is the building when it was finished in 2014 so you see the difference where uh, not only on our building but also on the buildings behind so our aim was just to look at the reconstruction in a really complex way so we we work with the plans we work with the construction we try to focus on creating uh, individual exterior uh, extensions, but also on uh, uh, exterior extensions for the community of uh, next in, uh, new inhabitants. So, and maybe a little bit personal thought in the end, it's like that we thought like when we finished this house, we thought like that, okay, this could be a nice example that could be spread all over Slovakia and maybe Czech Republic. And we had a nice, uh, nice uh, reactions and people, they called us, okay, we would like to do something like this. And we have our community, we have our house and let's have a look at this. And uh, yeah, we always tried something to, 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 uh, to start to work uh, on certain projects, but in the end it finished uh, and it just bankrupt on kind of negotiations in between that communities because everybody had a certain point of view on how it could finish. And that's maybe, yeah, on one side, okay, we say like we had this kind of beautiful opportunity that uh, there were like two people that own one flat. I think they will never, never happen again. Um, but it would be really nice that if if uh, if uh, this could happen also in a way of like because all the flats are now uh, privately owned or most of the flats are now privately owned in our country, so you have these kind of communities uh, that owns or owns whole whole buildings and they have to negotiate and find a way how they want to do and that's where it's you know, like where it ends. So I was really uh, shocked when I, I've heard Christopher uh, talking about the project Austin Gardens, where he, uh, that, that, that's something completely on the other side, you know, like, uh, like uh, totally different conditions. So um, yeah, um, I think that's all I wanted to say. So thank you very much again. Uh, Thank you, Lucas. I was going to ask you the question, but you answered that question by yourself. It was about the possibility to repeat that project because I can, I can see that we are in a similar situation when it comes to the common agreement of the inhabitants of the communities, then mostly the project stops because it is very, very hard to find a unanimous decision by the community. And probably we have to find out the way how the architects can implement good ideas 
without jeopardizing them at the primary stage. So uh, I'm not sure, but uh, somehow we there, there's a lot of ground for for work and maybe some education for the architects uh, for the future. That uh, convincing uh, of, of your future clients is the most important thing. So thank you very much, Lucas. Thank you. And um, now we are moving to our next presentation. This presentation should have been presented in the morning session because it's about research and it's about research uh, from Estonia. But as the presenter lives in New York, we had to adjust a little bit our time schedule. And I hope that Lydia is here and I would like to present uh, Lydia Kalipoliti. She's an architect, engineer, and scholar, assistant professor of architecture in the Cooper Union, New York. And she's a head co-curator of Tallinn Architecture Biennale 2022. So I'm really curious to know what they are, they are preparing for, for the autumn because it's the autumn season when the Tallinn Biennale will happen. And I would like to invite Lydia to make her presentation circular block reinventing the micro Ryan. So Lydia, if you are here, the floor and the screen is yours. Thank you, Ruta. Thank you so much for this introduction. Um, and yes, I'm not presenting a particular project, but a competition on uh, the micro rayon. So uh, let me just share my screen. Uh, uh, just give me one second. I'm trying. I have a presenter note, so I have to um, just uh, adjust for give me one second. I will adjust. I think uh, I think we're good now, uh, hopefully. Yes. So um, thank you so much for your invitation to participate in this conference. Um, as uh, Ruta mentioned, I'm an assistant professor at the Cooper Union in New York, and I mostly write books on um, environmental topics. But today I will uh, present to you an international competition that we have organized as part of the upcoming Tallinn Architectural Biennale that I'm co-curating with Areti Markopoulou and it opens in September 2022. So uh, we hope to see many of you or some of you uh, at the opening on September 7. The competition uh, title is Circular Block, uh, Reinventing the Micro Rayon. And uh, it was part of the general theme of the Tallinn Architecture Biennial, which is entitled Edible or the Architecture of Metabolism. And um, it's co-curated by myself and Areti Markopoulou in collaboration with uh, local uh, advisor, Ivan Sergeyev. Um, just to give you a few words on what the Biennale is about and how uh, this idea of the microrayon has entered the main topic of the Biennale, um, it starts from uh, the very big problem of global food production and the industry of big agriculture and uh, the architecture that supports it uh, that offers a spectacular insight into climate change and its entanglement with questions of ecology and justice. Industrial agriculture remains uh, today an exceedingly unsustainable practice from production and transport to, uh, to consumption and waste. The abundance produced by it, the promise of endless food security, comes at a very steep cost to the global climate, ecological cycles, biodiversity, and rural communities. Industrial agriculture uses 75% of farmland, 70% of freshwater use to feed 30% of the world's population. So overall, global food production degrades the natural resources on which it depends and pollutes the air, water, and soil substantially. Um, there are many projections, and I'm, I'm just going to share one today um, in two, uh, uh, 2050, there will be 9.7 billion people on earth. And in order to feed them, the global food system will need to produce 70% more calories than it currently does, and much to do so in a way that is equi equitable, nutritious, ecologically sustainable, and carbon negative. 
Yet agriculture is already responsible for one third of total greenhouse gas emissions. So how would this plan ever work in the first place? By 2050, around 5 million lives a year, twice as many as the current obesity toll could be lost as a result of current food production processes. Among the harmful impacts of such methods are diseases caused by air pollution, water contamination, health consequences of pesticide use, and increased antimicrobial resistance. Some of these principal causes are overuse of fertilizers, excessive reliance on antibiotics and animal, and untreated human waste. So food is the number one resource we need to integrate, and uh, that's one of the premises of the Biennale um, in urban infrastructure, just like we integrate other uh, main infrastructures like roads and automobiles. In order to feed the growing population within the next decades, we need to increase food production in cities by 70%, and the solution is not to change the practices only in the periphery uh, by exacerbating urban sprawl as it is. Um, if we would do that, it would drive the destruction of natural habitats even further, a major cause for disease and infection, which uh, some researchers assume that this is linked to the current pandemic. And it also leads to the loss of biodiversity and deforestation. So the objective in this research is to integrate food production within urban infrastructure systems. Another fact is only 2% of the valuable biological nutrients in food byproducts and organic waste is composted or otherwise upcycled and valorized to create new value. Almost nothing is repurposed to become new nutrients and useful products. So just think of the equivalent of six garbage trucks of edible food is lost or wasted every single second globally. We need to evolve these linear models of production and consumption towards more circular models that reduce impact and generate new value. Architecture, we believe, is the most important platform to enable these paths and directions for circular economies. So overall, um, with the Biennale, we were hoping to develop a proactive stance on architecture's expressive capacity to perform circular operations, to urge new forms of localization and the design of circular economies, to explore architectural strategies of local production and self-sufficiency, and to integrate in the built environment operations that use byproducts of urban life, establishing circular systems that aim to limit material and resource loss. The competition um, as part of that main framework um, starts from a very simple uh, hypothesis, which is a question by philosopher Timothy Morton. When you think of where your waste goes, your world starts to shrink. And in that light, the, the circular block competition explores architecture's expressive capacity to convert waste to energy or matter via circular operations from the micro scale to the macro scale. Through the design of an urban unit that operates as a circular system in its resources and its economy protocols, as well as in the cycling of its materials, the aim of circular block is to define new productive and socially cohesive urban models that question the traditional linear and discrete consumption and production systems in cities. With comparable numbers in the built environment in different geographic regions, Architecture's response to the climate emergency through alternative design, construction, and operational models is critical. The question was, how can microbial fuel units, anaerobic digesters, bacteria tanks, green cultivations, algae units, and other building elements be retrofitted to existing housing units and the building block as a whole, so as not only to function as an engineering infrastructure, but also as inhabitable space. What are the aesthetic questions of infrastructure and how can such questions be instrumentalized to foster a creative design process? So um, we operated in the competition at three different scales um, and we invited participants to consider Talon's Lansnamaya district 
as a territory to investigate design strategies that allow urban blocks to produce food for inhabitants, to generate required energy partially off the grid, and to use waste for generating energy or products, to increase urban density using demolition waste, or implement blockchain technology for locally managing energy or material resources, among other possibilities. So you, you see here the three different scale uh, that the participants could operate upon and on which this the basis, the foundation of this logic was founded, uh, the, apartment, the apartment block, the urban block, and the microrayon. And I'm going to speak quite extensively on the uh, history of the microrayon in Estonia um, just uh, shortly. So um, we, we had this diagram where each one of the scales was paired or correlated with one of the themes that uh, we asked uh, the participants to address, uh, food, energy, waste, and matter. So uh, participants could choose any of the three scales or operate cross-referencing the different scales to address one or more of these topics in retrofitting the urban blocks of Lansnomize microrayons. The circular block asked participants to develop an ideological as well as a materialist position to questions of recycling and to carry this position through the design of their proposals. From the micro scale investigating material conversions to the macro scale investigating the dynamics of urban exchange and environmental flows, participants were encouraged to investigate strategies and models for recirculating matter and energy based on principles of distribution and localization. And um, here I will delve a little bit into the history of uh, microrayons um, in Tallinn as the kind of base research um, on which we founded uh, the kind of competition pre premise. So Lanzanamai is Tallinn's largest housing district and it is home to approximately one quarter of the city's population at large uh, with prefabricated panel housing blocks. A housing suburb to Tallinn, Lansnamai was constructed during the Soviet occupation from 1973 until Estonia regained independence in the 90s with the aim of housing workers community to nearby factories and the city center. It is the largest and newest of the three housing districts of Tallinn. Mustamai was constructed from 1962 to 1973 and Vike Oismai from 1971 to 1975. While its construction spanned many years, Lasnamai remained unfinished. Its captivating hallmark tramway in the Lania Channel extended from Eliel Sarinen's 1913 original city master plan was never built. Other non-residential amenities such as neighborhood and regional centers were never constructed and public spaces and parks faced disinvestment. Today, as the city's largest district and with a steadily increasing population, Lasnamai's capacity for growth is limited by its agent housing stock, lack of amenities associated with a shortage economy during its construction, as well as persisting socioeconomic segregation. Tallinn's population in the last two decades has grown significantly, but with significant socioeconomic asymmetries in different districts of the city. According to geographers Anneli Karik and Tit Tamaru, in the 2000s, economic inequality in the Tallinn Regional District skyrocketed and continues to persist today. The 2010 study, which has since been, been built upon in further research, found that new construction developments outside the city housed more higher income households, while urban housing districts, including Lasnamai, had a wider concentration of lower income people. While developmental pressure has been pushed construction beyond municipal boundaries to meet the demand for single family housing, the need for housing. Uh, 
I, I didn't understand what that was. Is there an issue with the presentation? No, no, that's okay. Continue, please. Oh, okay. I, I thought somebody that couldn't hear or, um, or something. Okay, so I'm continuing. Uh, while developmental pressure has pushed construction beyond municipal boundaries to meet the demand for single family housing, the need for housing in more affordable districts has since become increasingly urgent. Beyond economic segregation, divisions have also occurred on the basis of language and ethnicity. Lasnamai is home to a large number of ethnic Russians and other ethnicities, as well as an increasingly aging population. Despite some efforts to alleviate these asymmetries, socioeconomic segregation continues, thus amplifying the need to address the problems of a decaying housing stock, mobility, and access to amenities and resources. For the purposes of the single uh, of this of the circular block vision competition, participants were asked to focus directly on the Lania microrayon. The microrayon, um, and you see um, 11 microrayons as part of the Lazanomai district here from the archives of Tallinn City Planning uh, Development as they were originally conceived, um, is a semi-self-sufficient agglomeration of housing and amenities meant to serve approximately 6,000 to 10,000 residents. Lanya was one of the first of 11 microrayons that was constructed as part of the Lasnamai master plan, making it one of the oldest areas constructed with the most commonly used planning and architectural strategies of the 1960s. Today, Lanya houses 25,000 people and faces many of the concerns commonly affecting Soviet era developments listed, including poor housing stock and accessibility. There has been considerable work done by local organizations to build community and alleviate these issues, though these needs continue to become more pressing as buildings deteriorate and developmental pressures become stronger, particularly as the area is subject to stigmatization. For example, in the distant future, Lanya is adjacent to proposed developments, including a hospital to the north and a transit hub to the south, making the need for thoughtful, sensitive, and sustainable changes to the built environment even more pressing. Um, here you see um, some of the kind of original proposals. Uh, this is uh, the planning of the second and third districts of Lansnamai um, in Tallinn by a proposal in 1974 by architects Mark Port, Irina Raud, and Oleg uh, Semchugov uh, and Tina Nigul. Um, and uh, as part of that proposal, um, you see here um, uh, one of the iconic um, drawings of that era uh, that established as a post-war strategy to address the housing crisis and to provide a master planned and self-sufficient neighborhood unit creating high quality of life. And this was the intention in this co competition. But going a little bit further into how uh, we have constructed the organization of this competition today, um, we were interested in uh, developing a program and we were developing this program during the COVID-19 pandemic and became increasingly interested to the notion of the microrayon, the residential microdistrict of the former Soviet Union, particularly related to new forms of localization within a confined domestic radius. And this has happened uh, during lockdowns um, in Europe. And uh, one of the ideas that uh, we uh, kind of conceptually related the microrayon with is the 15 minute city, um, which was popularized by uh, the, the mayor of Paris, uh, Anne Hidalgo, and it became part of her re-election campaign, resonating with several other urban environments. Well, at the same time, um, this kind of idea of the 15-minute uh, walkable city uh, reflected in many ways the fragility of our production processes, the hubris of ceaseless growth and endless mobility, and finally, our accountability for how we occupy the planet. The 15-minute city, uh, which was again popularized by Anne Hidalgo, 
was inspired by French Colombian scientist Carlos Moreno. And um, in this light, um, it, uh, it proposes a city where um, of five minute neighborhoods, also known as complete communities or walkable neighborhoods, denoting a return to a local way of life. So uh, we correlated this idea, which became very resonant during the pandemic, with uh, the kind of former Soviet microrayon that included all, not only housing, but also different amenities and programs like school, housing, commerce, and social space to create a self-sufficient community that could be um, complete in, um, in its uh, livelihood. The precedents, the precedents for the urban model of the microrayon are many, and here you see only a few on the screen. The structure as a large housing block providing basic amenities closely resembles Clarence Perry's neighborhood planning unit from 1929. Designed by Perry to act as a framework for urban planners to design self-contained neighborhoods in industrializing cities, the neighborhood unit continues to be utilized and is linked with a contentious movement of new urbanism. Other precedents include some Siam modernist models like Ernst May and Mark Stump's work or proposals in the USSR in the 1930s, which were in fact experiments in microrayon developments with replicable block structures. Despite this being a Soviet type of development, it bears many similarities to form of modernist planning across the globe. The original aim of the microrayon was to advance the quality of urban life and to make it available to all. It must be noted, however, that microrayon housing regions often housed in Estonia, Russian speaking and highly educated people under the Soviet regime as a means to establish a larger Russian population. The remnants of this still exist today. A large part of the Russian speaking population resides in the microrayon districts of Estonia. It should also be noted that the housing was more directly uh, towards the upper middle, directed towards the upper middle classes to attract highly skilled workers to cities and not necessarily to house Estonians or lower classes. In Estonia, some of the most wealthy communities outside of the city were collective farms that accrued wealth in various forms under the Soviet regime. The quality of the microrayon housing, however, was quite poor across the USSR. People were highly critical of the poor quality and there are, for example, popular Estonian songs from the 70s that poke all the walls being very thin and other such details. Yeah, here you see another example from um, the Tallinn Architecture Biennale in 2013 with uh, the theme recycling socialism which examined the area of Vaik Oismai, a sub-district um, in Tallinn that was taken as the site for the vision competition. And the participants were asked to redesign the center of the microrayon to provide more public amenities or housing um, uh, for uh, communities. And um, these are some recent projects before I get into the results of the competition uh, by um, researchers at the Estonian Academy of Arts in 2016, specifically Andrea Tam and Anne Press. It was a master thesis called Urban Barley Field, which imagined new forms of agriculture that could benefit from abandoned and vacant spaces. The corridor and empty spaces have been a seminal space for artists and architects to explore and speculate upon even though generally modernist buildings are associated with negative images of the former Soviet Union and the occupation, but also economic and social issues of contemporary and neoliberal Estonia. And here you see other images from this um, kind of attempt to populate these corridors with urban agriculture and um, a kind of event in 2016 um, celebrating the idea that the project introduced the ecological concerns and interspecies relationships as a new dimension based on which to reimagine the future of the microrayons. There are several projects also across Estonia that attempt to reimagine different kinds of more ecological infrastructures 
in formerly industrial spaces or sites of, a so of Soviet extraction, including a water sports park in a quarry, a ski hill and an ash landfill and a sort of ecological connector park in Tallinn. The legacy of the microrayon was, uh, was, was really the important basis for this competition uh, to reimagine the infrastructure uh, with all its abandonment as well as the lack of social and economic protocols to foster community initiatives. With the circular block competition, the aim was to consider both the history of the microrayon as well as its contemporary issues and pressures to support imagined futures and spaces premised around circular systems in their resources and economy protocol, as well as the cycling of materials. Um, we received several submissions from the micro to the macro scale, um, and participants were generally encouraged to investigate strategies and models of matter recirculation, um, energy generation, uh, partially off the grid, based on principles of localization and distribution. Um, and um, basically we saw uh, as a kind of uh, general theme, the microrayon as an organizational vessel that enabled the flow of materials, ideas, and people. Yet we were also intrigued in how technical solutions may have political ramifications and provide vital spaces for urban communities. So um, this was the jury of the competition. Uh, we had uh, Vinny Mas, uh, which uh, is very well known. He's a principal of MVRDV in Rotterdam. Uh, Kaidi Poldoa, who's the head of the Spatial Planning and Competence Center at the City of Tallinn. Benedetta Taliabue, who is the director of Mirayas Taliabue Architects in Barcelona. Tumas Thomas, who is a professor at the Estonian Academy of Arts and Veronica Balciska, the advisor of Estonian Ministry of Culture. And here you see, uh, unfortunately, I, I can't disclose the names of the winners um, as I was told by the organizers of the Talent Biennale, but you see the projects here. And uh, this is the first prize, Dynamic Equilibrium City, which was a very interesting proposal of uh, gradually replacing the microrayon with a kind of new structure of uh, wood houses coming from the forest. And um, gradually as these, these, this new uh, neighborhood would grow, um, the kind of debris of the microrayons would be integrated in the new development. So uh, it proposed basically an urban system that can be circulated with local resources by combining three scales of circulation, the suburban forests of Tallinn, Lana, and urban building resources. Specifically, it contained two different proposals. The first one was to con a construction process in which the entire Lana is built gradually over a period of 40 years in accordance with the growth cycle of the adjacent forest, and then repeatedly decomposed and renewed as it becomes old. The second proposal was to design a method that allows for easy decomposing and rebuilding. While reconstructing the network of various actors in Tallinn, the materials that exist in Tallinn uh, would be incorporated into the circulation. The architecture itself will continue to transform and respond to the challenges of the time through repeated decomposition, movement, and combination. The second prize called Super Naval proposed an urban game um, where um, participants could um, trade the, their sources and help create an environmental shift on a personal level shared in social media by circulating their ideas of um, regeneration and housing in a scoring system in social media. This in turn would start a form an efficient and green urban block. So um, you see here a, a kind of instance of um, how this game would be played. Different infrastructures would be added um, and uh, these kinds of gradual additions would result in I kind of recon the reconfiguration of the entire area. Uh, the third prize, bioedible talent, 
um, propose infrastructures uh, to become ecological corridors where bees and mushrooms continuously exchange information along the street and entire edible neighborhoods um, contribute to soil permeability and healthy air. So it was really a project of interspecies development and um, interspecies equity. Um, along these lines, vertical farms and gardens are placed on the blind facades of the buildings as containers of primary goods, but also as creative design and exchange of know-how, culture, and innovation. On the ground floor, there's a proposed market. On the upper floors, the edible cultivation and knowledge dialogue with each other um, since the waste products become raw material to create new products through innovative processes. On the side, there are biogas digesters um, and the organic waste of the building goes up to the last floor for energy cogeneration and storage after being treated in tanks with fungi that are placed underground. And I'm gonna briefly also show some of the honorable mentions of the competition. Uh, this is one called Choreography of Porosities and it proposes a web of creeks um, uh, that become nutrient lines and revive the former main streets into ecological pulsations. Nutrient catchers collect the flows of interwoven quartz uh, with new metabolic qualities. The Lansnamai Canal with the bays and the cable car system transforms the highway to an ecological spine towards the old city fed by cloud bursts, ocean runoff, and gray water influx. A porous Lansnamai, a circular territory, demonstrates how a city can feed and sustain itself, celebrating its coexistence with different life forms. Another honorable mention proposes uh, to reconsider the notion of the urban void to become a productive space that generates community resilience and fosters circular economies. By eliminating massive parking lots, the proposal brings the module filled with productive functions generated by the community and for the community itself. The concept consists of uh, generative productive modules ranging from environmental equilibrium, uh, sustainable energy and community well-being. The configuration of the productive functions is determined by solar radiation, the ages and types of the population, and the physical layout of the block. This is a strategy to create not only the community scale, self-sufficient resilience, but also a larger mutualism between the different blocks. This is a very interesting project that also received uh, an honorable mention that proposes a remanufactory, uh, like a living, hub of fabrication that, that is composed of repurposed industrial buildings where materials are removed from existing buildings and biomatter from the landscape and are processed and stored. Adjacent, there's an urban farm and a food market, market that grows and distributes food and provides a strong social focus for the district. At the roadside and adjacent to new transit, a multi-purpose <coughs> multi facility assembled from a lightweight frame and redundant building components begins life as a gathering of small, highly visible interventions, a micro-civic Belvedere, a super graphic treatment of the bridges, events, and community projects in the wasted space of the cutting, but grows to contain administrative functions associated with the circular project. And uh, very briefly, um, there are two more honorable mentions. This was about um, education, education. So it proposed a kind of new infrastructure network called the Educational Social Network as part of the Lanya Mikorayon. Um, and it was based on uh, different residential districts providing a convenient non-motorized systems. And uh, finally, this honorable mention was called Next Door and suggested a vision of the blocks that understood as a set of vibrant urban elements that are attached to the facade, uh, prefabricated with prefabricated structures and create, uh, extend uh, the housing to the outdoors and create uh, different uh, frames for novel hybrid forms of cohabitation 
uh, community uh, and community sharing. So to conclude here, um, I, I want to say that um, we, we were very interested in how um, these ideas of uh, edibility, um, food generation, self-sufficiency, but also new different models of kinship, interspecies alliances and cohabitation would present themselves in housing developments, particularly in uh, deteriorated um, housing developments um, in the city of Tallinn. And um, in many ways in the last decade, the mainstream idea of what we call a smart city has elevated notions of optimization through technologies, while somehow it has under-prioritized essential issues of urban ecology, architectural metabolism, and social inclusion. During the pandemic, we observed the rise of projects and initiatives that have contributed to a significant shift towards systems of care, as well as decentralized systems of production and consumption in cities. So the goal with this work was to um, create different kind of a pool of proposals that address this mind, mindset shift. Initially conceived for the Soviet micro districts of Lanznamaya in Tallinn, the competition's novel and scalable proposals stand at the core of reinventing urban centers as productive and socially cohesive metabolic systems. And um, I wanna thank you so much for listening and for the invitation. Thank you, Lydia, very much. These are really challenging proposals, and I'm really eager to, to hear what uh, kind of discussions maybe there were some discussions in the wild public, how those projects were perceived, because I think that for many, they are uh, shocking ideas, and for many, they would seem really utopian. And I think that this is also one of the aims of uh, Sechi Lenses, uh, Biennales, and other festivals, just to raise awareness and invite people to think. However, uh, was there any feedback from the, so that we call normal people that are not architects? <laughs> we, um, we are not there yet to receive feedback, uh, just because uh, we have basically a symposium at the Tallinn Biennale uh, where we're going to invite uh, the district uh, to display these ideas and have a roundtable discussion at this point. We just, um, I'm sharing the results of the competition, which uh, whose authors have not even been announced yet. So I think this is a discussion that we're really looking forward to, how the kind of local community will uh, react to these proposals. Um, I think the jury did an extraordinary job and uh, it was fascinating to witness the process. Uh, we were interested in ideas that actually could potentially be realized at one point or another. Um, um, it, and uh, a lot of these ideas seem, uh, seem utopian, but I think that a lot of the projects that I also saw before, um, before my presentation uh, manifest a lot of these ideas. Um, the, the project in Copenhagen, for example, with these gardens. So a lot of the ideas that were uh, proposed for the competition um, kind of have a range between uh, utopian um, to, uh, uh, to reality. So I hope to continue the conversation um, with the community in September in Tallinn. Yes, and we, we will follow the results of the Biennale and the best of luck with the- Please, uh, please with come. The yes, we will please come, please we will come. be there. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Lydia, Hello. for- Thank you for so much. For, for this conference. And I will move to the next presentation coming from Greece. Uh, it will be done by architect Olga Venezianu. She's an architect PhD and she's working at, uh, at YAP Architects and she's also an adjunct professor at University of West Attica in Greece. And Olga will make a presentation about green, green urban quarter pilot project in Athens, Greece. So dear Olga, the floor is yours. Hello, hi, nice to see you. Uh, you can hear me well, I, I suppose. Yes. Right, share. Okay, so let me hide these. All right, so you can see the screen well, I guess. Yes, everything works fine. 
Okay, great. So I'm going to be presenting this uh, green urban quarter pilot project that was um, uh, developed in various phases. I will explain all about that. Um, we were sort of uh, one of the four uh, architectural practices that were uh, invited to uh, make a proposal uh, at an initial stage, along with uh, Katerina uh, Zvez Piropoulou, uh, Mr. Kostikas, and Tobias's architects. So um, the, the idea was that um, we should be making an energy saving renovation of a large scale apartment, which was a council flat in the West Athens area. And the idea was to also involve the inhabitants. So um, these are uh, council flats that were made in Athens that uh, they basically had no insulation whatsoever uh, in the walls or the roof. Um, so the, also due to the low income of the tenants, uh, it's actually quite, um, quite difficult to maintain and to, to deal with, uh, you know, monthly expenses. So let me tell you a bit about the, you know, the location of the project. Um, the area is called the Yevarvara. It's in West Athens, which is basically, West Athens is the industrial area of, of Athens. Uh, if you look at the map, this is the center. And this is the area of Ayavarara, it's around here. And here is the actual block, the, the you know, the actual square. Um, to have a better idea for those who have actually visited Athens, here is the port of Piraeus where all the, you know, the ships leave to various islands and other destinations. So this is the west area of the city, which is basically the main industrial area, you know. So, um, the idea was that there were uh, four building blocks, as I said before. Uh, the idea was that we would uh, make a proposal for the one, this one here. And um, according to our findings and results, the, the, um, the municipality would proceed to the other three. So this is, uh, these were four, four story buildings with uh, sort of mirror type um, plans, house plans. Uh, they had sort of, um, 72 apartments in total, and an external space in the middle. So the project stakeholders were the Ministry of the Environment. Uh, the funding came from uh, Greek and uh, EU uh, sources. And uh, a, a key point uh, in the whole uh, project was the Center of Renewable Air Energy Resources and Saving, uh, which is an, a center of um, uh, accreditations and uh, processes and uh, various other um, sort of um, information or organization body re regarding renewable energy sources and, and consultation. And uh, this is a sort of government, sort of uh, in the wider government sector. Um, and the implementation and operation of the whole project was uh, coordinated by the local municipality of Aya Varvara. So basically the idea was the project was that uh, in the first phase, we were going to insulate the building envelope. Like I said before, there was no insulation at all in these buildings. Um, and uh, tr trying to uh, reduce the energy needs of the building. And so we would uh, make a thermal insulation in the walls and the roof, and we will replace the, the windows and we will uh, add external shading. In the second phase of the project, these reduced energy needs will be covered by renew renewable energy sources like uh, geothermal heat pumps, uh, uh, photovoltaic systems, solar panels for uh, warm water. Uh, there was going to be, it's, it's being installed now, a smart metering system that is not, uh, doesn't have anything to do with the, the bills or the electricity bills. It's, it's going to be installed just to monitor the energy performance and the energy needs of the building. And of course, there's gonna be a landscaping in the interior space of the block, so as to improve the local, uh, you know, the microclimate. So in parts of the, uh, you know, the body of the renewable energy sources, they were going to use certain energy performance uh, guidelines. And uh, the goal was to actually 
reduce the primary energy consumption about 60 percent and um, also they wanted to uh, sort of communicate this whole project to the supply chain and the various industries that um, produce um, you know installation materials and other related materials so they could be uh, sponsors of the project there was going to be an extensive quality uh, control of the products and of the implementation and of course uh, as i said before uh, an active involvement by the by the inhabitants so initially there was an energy audit in the in the building which uh, as expected was you know very bad it was like almost the lowest possible and um, then there was a call for tenders and selection of sponsor companies. So I have to stress here that um, the first phase of the, of the project, um, it was basically based on sponsorship. I mean, um, we as an office, along with the other three offices, uh, we, we didn't receive any uh, sort of fee for this uh, proposal. And also the materials were, um, were sponsored by the companies. You know, they were basically given without any charge. And also the, um, the actual building process, you know, the work hours, they were also covered by the respective companies. So basically the whole first part of the project was done without any fee. Um, so uh, our design was um, based on this uh, very limited uh, sort of uh, uh, situation and we try to make uh, the simplest and the most effective possible uh, proposal so we basically played with uh, you know this uh, flat surface and the colors of the various um, windows and uh, also we had uh, added this uh, shading system uh, i have to stress here that um, in greece because of the quality of the light um, the the actual form of the buildings is very clear you know um the sh the shadows are very strong so this is an um a shadow the shadow is also an, an extra building material in in this part of the world so this also added to the very uh, clean and minimal aesthetic of the design so uh you can see a before and after picture of the building block and here is the um, the elevation, the south elevation. Um, and here is this shading system. So another, another photo. And here are the sponsors of the project. We had some, you know, um, mineral wool insulation for the wall and. Um, uh, and also quite uh, interesting material was a, a self-cleaning silicone based uh, external render that uh, uh, sort of uh, reacts with the sun, uh, the solar um, uh, rays and sort of uh, produces a type of, um, uh, it, well, it, a type of uh, a drop you know, like a um, like water or something like that, so that actually is uh, cleaning the external rendering surface. So um, this is the inverted roof that was also sponsored. And here are some uh, images from, from the final project. So um, after, um, after this the first phase, which was done in 2010, I mean, we started working on this project on 2010, and uh, I believe it was uh, almost finished in 2012. The idea was that there was going to be some um, technical um, guidelines for um, the other three buildings and uh, for many other buildings of a similar situation in the area. Um, so uh, after your um, your proposal for us, your invitation to for us to participate in this uh, conference. I sort of went over there to see what's going on, and I I saw that they were also continuing with the other three buildings. And I have to say here that we were never informed about this. We just discovered, you know, after your invitation, we just went to see their, you know, the situation, what's going on. 
And also, um, we discovered that an, another group of engineers is going to, to do the other three buildings, and uh, they're going to change also the um, external shading system with this um, uh, movable panel system, with, uh, perforated sl sliding panels, but I don't have any more um, details on that. So um, basically, after the um, after the completion of the, the first building, there were a lot of dissemination activities um, on the on the press, on TV, on you know various YouTube videos. Um, I have to say, by talking to the mayor and uh, the various engineers that were um, working for the local municipality, and uh, the biggest um, uh, challenge of this uh, building was basically uh, to make the renovation while uh, people were still living in the buildings. Uh, this uh, took a lot of negotiations and um, also there was a lot of, um, uh, you know, um, the, the local residents were not particularly, uh, they were quite cautious in the beginning because they were afraid they were, um, you know, the project was going to be left uh, unfinished and they would be left without windows and things like that. So uh, this took a lot of um, uh, discussions and uh, a lot of effort from the part of the local engineers to convince them to cooperate. Um, also, after the, there was some questionnaires before the renovation, you know, monitoring the, you know, uh, income status and social uh, and income status of the um, of the residents, and of course the uh, energy characteristics and um, of the of each apartment and the type of appliances they use and all of that. I have to stress here that before the the actual action, this um, uh, project, uh, many of the uh, of the apartments didn't have any type of heating. There was central heating in only in. Uh, two of the four building blocks, and it wasn't always working. And some of the apartments didn't even have uh, hot water. So this whole um, project was something very important. But like I said, although it was really important and, and it was going to help, you know, improve significantly, you know, significantly the, um, the, the life of the inhabitants, they were extremely cautious in the beginning, and that was something that uh, is worth noting. Um, so, uh, in the outputs, we uh, we had this. Uh, uh, the Energy Sources uh, Institute had um, a, a very good um, database of um, standards and best practices, which they have issued in uh, guidelines right now. Um, there was a lot of use of local human resources for uh, for the actual uh, construction stages. The, you know, many people who lived in the buildings were employed you know, during the construction process for for the actual construction process. Um, there was a, lot, a very interesting collaboration between uh, us designers and the energy experts, which was uh, very uh, informing and educational for us. Um, the whole process um, created these protocols and the methods of collaboration that are very useful. Um, and the other uh, thing that is worth noting, but uh, I'm not sure what we can do about that, is that uh, there was a lot of legal procedures and problems with the funding. Uh, as uh, I said before, this project started in 2010, and it's right now it's in you know it's in the construction stage still because there was a lot of uh, there was a period in between that uh, you know there was no funding, so it was sort of left. Uh, it was left halfway. So that's it for me. Thank you, Olga, very much. I think that uh, uh, your presentation discloses the very different context and uh, conditions where the architects that are dealing with innovation have to work, and as we have seen yes. from different presentations. You, you have uh, different starting positions when you are entering these kind of projects regarding the financing, regarding the power of an architect, also regarding the attitude of the inhabitants. And yes. every time you have to deal with uh, some different context. So it is good to know that the solutions that we are talking now in this conference, they cannot be just to copy paste because every time you have to deal with some different conditions. So thank you very much. 
Yes, it was extremely educational for us, the whole process um, from every aspect. And, um, you know, thanks again for the invitation and, uh, for you, this. Uh, thank, thank, thank you, Olga. And, and, I, and I hope that these projects don't stop because of the, you know, lack of money and you can continue. And now let me let me uh, present the last presentation of today's conference, the presentation from France. And I would invite architect Marine de la Garand, a founder of Think Tank Architecture from Paris to present a project of Blueberry Hill rehabilitation and extension of Les Mirties condominium in Annecy. So Marine, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Up. Is this okay this way? Could you see my screen? Yes, it works perfectly. Okay, so hello everybody. It's a great pleasure and honor to share the floor with uh, such talented colleagues who are committed to the profession and the influence of architecture all over Europe. Being an architect is, an eminently, is eminently political. The present times shows us the, the social responsibility of the architect is really needed for the men and women whose li living environment we designed, for our planet whose resources are not unlimited, and for our children to whom we owe to live a better world. This is far being one. However, each of our work piece is an opportunity to stand for what's important. After such a dense and interesting day, I will try to keep it exciting with a quite modest project. So let's go to Blueberry Hills, which is located in the French Alp foothills. This project can be seen as a manifesto of our office approach because we are working by making places as spaces to live with an attention to the comfort for, for all. Our projects are mainly designed from the point of view of the inhabitants, and we try to be generous. We work doing with, because for an equivalent financial scope, our choice is always the lowest carbon cost, taking into consideration the life cycle of the building, capital capitalizing with the carbon of the past, and preserving the legacy of an recognize patrimoine. We also use to say that we are doing better with less and giving a really, really important place to the living in the heart of the project. It means the humans, but also the fauna and the floor. And we have strong ambitions in terms of sustainable environment. And finally, we are working doing things together because alone architects, we are nothing. We need partners, clients, and the inhabitants. So let me introduce you the context. The, the city we are looking for, we are looking at, sorry, is Annecy, a city under London pressure. This is up the site project which is located in Mete area. Mete was a smaller city um, in the neighborhood of Annecy, and they have merged in 2017. The municipality is 126 inhabitants, and it always increased because mainly of the closeness to Switzerland and Geneva. And it's really less expensive to live in France than in Switzerland. The particularity of this site, it's an entrance point to the city and it's located near a motorway. You have also the train line on the south and the site is designed by the Fier, which is a small river. And there is a corridor with important slope. So it's like a green corridor. And the building we are talking about which name is Les Myrtilles, so Blueberry. Blueberry is the name of the building. It's this building. You can see that in, the con in the, this contest, there is the natural corridor, a residential tissue, 
with a lot of uh, small houses and less collective housing. And here you can find an industrial area. This, the, this competition was launch, launched by um, a local uh, cultural institution, uh, which is the Council for Architecture, Urbanism and uh, Environment, in part partnership of Habit with Habitat Mont Blanc, which is a social housing operator, which is the main shareholder of this uh, co-ownership. So you, you, you see actual uh, pictures of this building, which uh, was built in the 70s, beginning of the 70s. So it's a rectangular with a 36 uh, housing facing the south, and then there is a slope. Here it was a sunny day, so you can uh, see uh, to the Alps. And there is a very beautiful, um, beautiful uh, view, like you, if you were in the countryside. In, inside, views from inside of the, of the flats, because th this building, which is not very uh, appreciated by the neighborhood because of its design, has a lot of qualities for the inhabitants. All the flats are uh, be oriented to the to the streets and also to the south. Um, th th there is beautiful views, balconies, natural environment, but the, the four floors building has no lift. The, it lacks of uh, thermal insulation and a lot of. Uh, uh, comfort comparing to the, the actual standard. So the, the, the main uh, residence request was to bring it up to current standard, but of course, like a Christmas wish list with the least amount of money to invest. So uh, we were three, three teams invited to, to, to compete. And uh, in fine, we, we were asked to find a solution how to, to make this project possible uh, and how to find an economical balance. Here you, 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 you can see that the, the, this building is, is really, really thin. Uh, there, is, there is an access for the vehicles uh, going down the slope and distributing all the garages which are in the, ba the basement of this, um, of, the, of this building. All this uh, actual uh, garden is not really used by the inhabitants. Uh, it's only for the, the, the pleasure of the, of the view. But he, the, the plot is a, is a co-ownership property. So that, that is the luck for this project. And you can also see that in the neighborhood, the, the other collective housing uh, are quite low buildings uh, with uh, balconies, a pitch roof. Um, they are designed like houses. So the, the question of, uh, Surelevating this building was quite a difficult option to, to, to reach and to, to defend in this context. So our, our proposal was to, to work on, with, with the landscape and uh, develop the, the project living in the slope. In fact, the, the street entrance which is the uh, level uh, zero, distribute four levels of uh, flats, but is superposed to two levels of parking. And then you have the, the green, uh, green garden, uh, which was a, re a real potential for us to develop a new extension. Mm. And 
by, by creating this extension, we wanted to also to uh, work with uh, uh, a distance, I mean, an in-between, because the, the, the actual inhabitants of the first floor were really frightened that they, after having lived maybe for 30 years with no one in front of them, they, they would have no views, no sun, and uh, so, so it, it was really important to, uh, to separate uh, a possible extension from the existing building. Our intervention uh, develops in three ways. First, inside the buildings, I will develop it uh, later, in addition to the existing building and also in juxtaposition to this building. So for example, you have some little scheme of this uh, street floor. In red, there are, these are the parts where we uh, wanted to uh, demolish or restructure the spaces. And on the right, you have the, the proposal. For example, we are, we are near the French Alps, the climate is quite cold. Uh, you were entering in very narrow, small holes with no sas, nearly no, no view. And after, after the sas, there was some cellars, but which were not um, used because each flat had also an additional parking, uh, parking box, which, is, uh, which was closed. Uh, the, 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 the stairs, the staircase were quite narrow and uh, not, not well ventilated. And next to this uh, staircase and cellars and halls, you had some um, storage for the bikes, which were totally empty because all the bikes <coughs> were stored in the garage. So we thought that there was a, a potential and this, um, this pattern uh, is repeated four times uh, on, the, on the ground floor uh, with a, a, a game of uh, symmetry. So our first intervention was to redesign the street floor, creating some large and uh, lightly and uh, transparent uh, hall with a real, uh, a real SAS, redesign the access and the organization of the staircase, make it a through, uh, through hole in order to uh, reach uh, uh, and distribute the, the, the new building in the south, and also uh, to gain some spaces with um, the bike storage. So, if we zoom on it, you can clearly see here the larger entrance, the new staircase, and the ancient uh, bike storage, which can be um, uh, renovated in uh, studios, but um, uh, which respond to uh, uh, disabled people uh, standard. Then on the south side, we we had we worked on extra space. Indeed, uh, all the, 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 the flats had some balconies, but which were so narrow that finally you 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 couldn't do anything on it. Just maybe to stand and enjoy the view, but you could you couldn't put a table and two seats just to, to have breakfast, which was quite a pity. The particularity of these uh, flats also was to have a small dryer room with a na natural uh, ventilation accessible from the kitchen. But this space was also blocking the staircase uh, uh, space from the facade. So there was a lack of, of ventilation in the stairs. So we propose to uh, redesign everything, have a new stair uh, next to a, a lift, and by a, by a, 
a small extension of this facade by thickening it uh, of 60 centimeters, which is quite small. We can enlarge the balconies in order to have a real space to, um, to, to, to put a table. And we, we, we recreate some dryer and scullery uh, accessible fr from the kitchen. We, we had uh, also a, a problem of uh, image uh, on, of this, uh, this building because uh, it has been partly renovating, but not with a global, uh, global intervention. Some, um, some uh, resident has changed the, the windows. So everything was not, uh, not the same. Uh, and it also has a, a, a very 70 uh, image. And because of the lack of uh, uh, insulation, uh, of course, uh, there was a, a waste of uh, energy. Uh, so we, we we worked on the global envelope putting a new insulation, changing all the joinery, uh, also uh, responding to new uh, uh, safety fire security rules. Uh, and we uh, offered to redesign and change the whole um, image of this uh, building in order to, to offer a modernized image, if we can uh, use this expression. Uh, because it, it's funny when we when we uh, spoke with the, the residents, they were quite attached to their their flats, their living spaces, uh, their environment, but they were they all agreed that they didn't like at all the the, the image of their buildings. They, they felt it was old and uh, from bad quality, and it it was not. Um, yeah. Uh, it was not uh, uh, agreeable for them to, to, to give their address and to invite people for the first time at this place. So they really, they were really uh, um, uh, keen to, to change the, the, the image of their, um, their building. The, this is the different stages of the refurbishment. So first, we intervene on the staircase and the, um, the dryers in order to build new staircase and a lift. Then we remove the, 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 the protection from the balcony and add the new steel structure in order to extend the, the, the southern facade and also the structure with, which will support the bridges over the small vehicle access road in order to reach the new building. We enlarge the balconies and change, remove the, the old joinery. Then we put new joineries, windows, things like that. And for the balconies, we also offered to the, the residents to have two options, depending uh, the, the, the way they wanted to, to leave the space. Two options for the uh, dryer and the uh, scullery. If it was a more technical space or more uh, a living space, uh, so different uh, design for the windows. And also for the balcony, if it was an open balcony, like a terrace, like before, or, or if they wanted to make it like more like a winter garden. And th this kind of options, uh, was important for, for us in order to, to give uh, people a way to appropriate the project, to, to make their own choices, and also to, um, in order to, to have a, a, a facade which is not monotonous, which is more rhythmic and animated. And on this, uh, on this, um, this image, uh, you, you can see that uh, the, the, the south facade of the building has already uh, changed a lot, and uh, you can also uh, see the variety uh, of the uh, windows pattern. 
Then the extension, I, I, I've explained that to, in, in order to finance the, the global refurbishment of the existing building, uh, we offered to uh, build an extension in the, splot, in the slope. So uh, this extension was uh, placed lower uh, in the garden in order not to, um, to be uh, 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 something negative concerning the view, the sun, the, the wind of the existing building. And with a roof terrace and uh, uh, something that may make the project quite disappear in the landscape for the actual inhabitants. This extension to the south uh, is made of uh, nine flats in this uh, proposal, uh, which are, um, uh, you can see them in the, on this image, and they are totally invisible from the streets. So uh, it was also uh, important to, um, to, to, to make uh, people and the neighborhood understand that we, we can densify the site but not uh, giving them this um, impression of density, making the, this density disappear. Uh, this is a principle of extension. It's simple and efficient uh, construction method, uh, mainly prefabricated uh, with a, a, a steel structure which adapts to the slope and uh, then a prefabricated wooden box uh, with a small uh, parking, uh, parking lot. And the, uh, each flat is like a, is a duplex and it's like an inverted duplex. So you, you arrived uh, by the upper floor and then you, 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 you go down uh, from the living space to the, uh, to the night spaces. You can see here the, the, the plan of uh, this, uh, this flat story. <laughs> and the achieved goal, goals of this um, uh, global project finally uh, was improvement of the thermal and the acoustic comfort because we have treated the four facades of the building existent. We have created four new staircase with four lifts. So 100% of the existing flat uh, became uh, accessible. Be because of a, a, a small uh, uh, game of uh, treacherous, uh, uh, all the cellars and spaces we have uh, lose uh, in the phase uh, one uh, were rebuilt uh, uh, after. Uh, we have uh, gained uh, spaces with the extension of balconies and drying rooms. We have uh, calculated an improvement of energy consumption, uh, gaining approximately uh, 50% uh, on heating and uh, domestic hot water. There was also uh, safety, uh, safety improve improvements with the firewalls, smoke extractions, and a lot of small things like that, which are not uh, uh, to the, the actual standard. Uh, uh, we have created 13 new flats, so nine in the extension and four in the existing building. The project was uh, uh, sought to be phased, so uh, because of course we, we couldn't ask to the inhabitants to move during the, the work. Um, and uh, we always had uh, an economical approach uh, really uh, uh, serious in order to, to, to control uh, the, economy, uh, the economical balance. But this economical balance with only nine new flats in the extension, it was not uh, uh, sufficient. So uh, in, a, in a second phase, we were asked to, uh, to work on a further densification to, to reach an economic balance. So, 
also in this uh, this image is the declination of the declination of uh, the, the the first pattern, the first approach. But instead of nine new flats, we reach uh, seventeen new flats, and um, we can also develop more diversity in the typology of flats. It's really a variation on the same pattern because um, developing the, the extension uh, more on the eastern part of the, the land plot, where the slope is more important. In fact, in, in, instead of having two levels of uh, uh, building in the slope, you can reach three levels. So th this is the way we, uh, we reach uh, the the, the, the amount of, uh, of flats. We, we also, uh, um, we have calculated the pre-balance sheet operation because uh, of course you have 36 co-owners, one is a social uh, housing operator and 35 are private co-owners. So uh, you have to be very careful. Uh, they, they have not the same agenda. They are not uh, eligible to the same uh, subsides. Uh, so we had to do the demonstration of expenses, revenues, and how they can finance uh, this operation. The expenses, on one hand, they are mainly the cost of work for energy renovation, accessibility, extensions of balconies, transformation of entrance hall, uh, refurbishment of the new studios, construction of 17 flats, and the, all the outdoor facilities and adaptations. Revenues mainly come from the selling of the new flats, so 17 new flats, and uh, public subsides in order to improve accessibility and thermic insulation. The, for example, these two lines, Habite Mieux Cro Pro, which is a co-ownership uh, better living, <laughs> if you want a, a, a translation, and, uh, and also this one, these are public subsides uh, for um, uh, private um, co-ownership condominium. And uh, so when you, you calculate total cost of expenses and total revenues, there is a remain to be financed by the co-ownership uh, trustee of half a million euros, VAT excluded, of course. So we, uh, we, we tried to demonstrate them that in fact, it was not uh, very heavy. Indeed, half a million, it makes an average share of 14,500 uh, 14, 14, per dwelling. So it represents an investment of less than 1,000 per year on a 15 year basis, 15 year basis, which is the usual uh, normal time to make it profitable. And the main part of this, uh, this amount of money to, uh, to be financed is covered by the energy cost saving because uh, of uh, the better insulation and uh, the changement of uh, domestic hot water production. So finally, it represents an investment of 733 euros per dwelling per year on a 15 year basis. Um, so uh, after we, 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 uh, we had to, to be very, um, I mean, uh, pedagogical, uh, in order to explain to each private owner uh, what were the other financial leverages they were eligible, they could be eligible to. Because in France, we, we had a lot of uh, 
uh, different ways to, to, to help people, but uh, it needs a little bit of uh, knowledge and uh, to navigate between the different, uh, different uh, institutions. For example, you, you can have a zero interest loan uh, between 10,000 and 30,000 uh, euros. Uh, that you have to uh, to pay back uh, in uh, 15 years maximum. So th th this uh, kind of zero interest loan is uh, dedicated to this kind of uh, operation. Uh, there are also a lot of uh, tax credits for housing improvement, also energy supplier subsides, uh, exemptions sometimes from property tax, uh, and also some specific grants for, for, from local authorities. Last but not least, uh, there is a reduced uh, VAT uh, on the most of the re renovation cost of work, which is 5.5% instead of 20%. And of course, this uh, pre-balance sheet operation cannot calculate the property gain on resale, resale because when you, you improve your building, your apartment, your accessibility, your comfort, and also your energy uh, consumption, of course, you improve your, um, your patrimoine. And uh, if you have to sell it, you sell it uh, uh, more expensive. So I, I will thank you for your attention. Uh, this this uh, small project is not another example of 100% publicly financed, and uh, it's not a really important budget, but and whatever is the, the example, it's not a standard, but a pilot and affordable project, because we really think that each operation is unique. To, to conclude and being honest, the main difficulty on this, uh, this project remains in the fact that um, the, between social housing operator and private co-owners, they have different agendas and different concerns. And also among the co-owners, for example, uh, families or older people, so resident owners or le lease holders, they have not the same priorities. So for the moment, it's uh, quite stuck. Uh, but the, the main interest in this, uh, this project is uh, about the approach and uh, its replicability. Uh, I really think that uh, uh, this kind of events with all the examples uh, presented uh, today is the best way to convince reluctant clients uh, demonstrating by examples. It's really very inspiring. And I, I really thank you for having invited us. Thank you very much, Maureen, especially for the last part of your presentation talking about those boring things like, you know, budget lines that are really very important for these kinds of projects. And the architects are usually, you know, not having energy for that. And this is really very important. And uh, as you said that uh, these projects are challenging because of many reasons, not only because of the budget, but mainly it's about finding some consensus. I think that this is the most challenging part of this. It's not about ideas and creativity of architects because I am sure and what I've saw from, uh, from today's presentations, architects have all the creativity in the world and they can come up with some brilliant ideas. Uh, the hardest part is just to convince people to want what is best for them. And of course, by commenting and trying to convince what is best for people, architects have also to listen to the people and let them talk about what is best for them and then somehow to find a consensus and, and some kind of compromise that would also bring some quality architecture. So I'm not going deeper into conclusions for this today's conference because I'm overwhelmed of the ideas and the information but you will see uh, those conclusions in uh, Madrid Forum 2022. So uh, once again, let me thank you for your intervention at today's conference. 
you will find the record of the conference at the Facebook page of Architects Association of Lithuania. So feel free to watch it again or to send the link to whoever you feel important. Also, I will remind to those who are listening to us that uh, the projects that were presented today, they will present it as well at the exhibition. And the opening of the exhibition will happen on 16th of May during the Madrid Forum. So if you are there, please come and see the exhibition. And later, we, of course, we will share this exhibition with the institutions in Europe, for example, if they, they are interested. So it could be a traveling exhibition. Feel free to contact us. And the third part of this event, it will be a book comprising of the examples that were shown today and also articles by researchers and uh, probably some more information that was not presented today because of the well, we have a limit of time and the limit of capacity of our brain to embrace information. So uh, thank you once again for your input and um, let's keep in touch and uh, hopefully I see you in Madrid and if not, then probably we see each other in Tallinn Biennale, <laughs> probably this, this September. And if not, let's continue with this initiative and, and these projects. And uh, let's try to make this uh, sector of housing, which is very important for, for especially for the vulnerable social group uh, going with the quality architecture. So thank you once again and um, have a very nice week. And bye bye for now. <laughs>